In the event of the fire alarm sounding, there are two exits from the room. One to the front of the room on your left, which exits into Molesworth Lane, and the other is back through the library the way that you came in. Academy staff will advise on the route to take. Please turn off mobile phones. Um, we'd also be grateful if you noted that there isn't a Q&A section after each of the speakers today. Each of the speakers will be available in the members room to answer any questions that you have. And I'm now going to invite the president of the Academy, Mary Canning, to take the mic. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's just lovely to see you all here. Uh, this is our first research day, and we haven't been able to do it because of the pandemic. So this was planned two years ago, and here we all are, and it's just wonderful to be in the newly restored OPW enhanced meeting room of the Academy. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Senator Malcolm Byrne, who's going to say a few words to you. Uh, Senator Byrne was appointed to the Senate in April 2020, and he serves as Fianna Fáil's spokesperson on further higher education research, innovation, and science. Malcolm is from Gorey in County Wexford. He's a graduate in law, arbitration, and governance, and he previously worked for 12 years as the head of communications with the Higher Education Authority. Malcolm was a councillor from 1999 to 2019, served as chair of the Wexford County Council, former vice president of the National Youth Council of Ireland, Union of Students of Ireland, executive member of European Students' Union. So uh, if anyone knows the higher education landscape, uh, you do know that, Senator Byrne. You are a member of the Eructus Committee for Tourism, Sport, Arts, Media and Culture, and a member of the Shannon Committee on Brexit. It is my pleasure to hand over to you uh, for a few words on the Academy, which is today showcasing its, uh, its activities in research. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much um, for inviting me here today, and uh, thank you, Mary, um, for uh, your welcome. And uh, it's often sort of, you know, I, I, when people from the academy, and I mean that in the broader sense, meet with politicians, uh, you know, there's often, I, I won't say a tension in the air, but it's, it's always a kind of sense, why don't politicians understand uh, what we do? Why isn't there a greater understanding of our research? Uh, and so on. So I'm going to set three challenges uh, today. Um, I think uh, one of the things that, um, uh, of which I think is a very positive step by the government was the creation of the Department of Further and Higher Education Research, Innovation and Science. And the reason why that department was created was not just to separate it from the Department of Teachers and Schools uh, which is the main focus of the Department of Education. It wasn't just to be an administrative department. Uh, it was to be a forward-looking department to look at the challenges and opportunities uh, for Ireland in a wide range uh, of, of, of spheres. So the three challenges that I'm going to set out um, on, this, uh, on this research day here in the Academy, the first I'm going to set is to the Academy itself. Uh, I think uh, the RIA has had a very important role in Irish society uh, showcasing research like this, engaging in critical debate. But the challenge I set to the Academy is to become even more of a platform uh, for public debate. In an era of disinformation and misinformation and fake news, uh, there is an increasingly important role for a trusted neutral body like the Academy uh, to inform public debate. Uh, and I would certainly hope that in, in all that the Academy does, that it gets uh, those messages out there about the importance of facts, about the importance uh, of evidence-based uh, policy making. The second uh, challenge I said is to the research community. And uh, one of the things that I found, and as Mary mentioned, when I worked in the HEA and others, there's incredible research uh, that's going on in all areas in Irish society, uh, in the sciences, in the humanities. Um, but often one of the challenges is researchers talk to each other. Um, they don't tend to communicate it to a wider audience. Uh, 
and that, that continues to be a challenge. I think there is a real importance for researchers to engage in public debate. If you have knowledge from your research that you believe can inform, whether it's public health, uh, whether it's economic strategy, uh, whether it's simply uh, how we can improve our communities, there is an obligation, I believe, on researchers uh, to get that message out beyond uh, the campuses of our higher education institutions and universities, but to engage the wider public uh, with that research. I think during the course of COVID, uh, we saw that very effectively done um, by those who are involved in research in the public health space. I think the challenge is to all researchers to ensure that the research goes beyond even what's happening in here in the RIA today. And what I would say is that those of us over in Leinster House or those of us you know, out on the street are aware uh, of the wonderful research that's going on. And the third challenge, and I don't believe that you should set challenges for others without setting them uh, for yourself, I believe is to us as legislators. Uh, next year, as you might be aware, the government is going to, for the first time, uh, set out a national research strategy. Uh, I think it's important within that that we are ambitious, uh, that it talks about the importance of research to Irish society and uh, to the economy. In many ways, Ireland's success over recent decades, it, it could be said that it's based on two things, tax and talent. Ireland is no longer competing in the tax space, not alone in terms of, on, on, you know, because of the international agreements, uh, but also because the world has moved on. Where Ireland is going to uh, be able to compete is in uh, the area of talent. And that's why it's important that for us as legislators, we get the research strategy right, uh, that we're ambitious in it, that we recognize the research contribution uh, to Irish society, um, but also uh, that we understand and reward and recognize good research and researchers. Uh, so that is, is also our challenge. So with those three challenges set out, uh, it's a, a great honor and privilege for me uh, to declare this first RA Research Day officially open. Gormag with. So it's, uh, my name is Jane Conroy. I'm Vice President for Research in the Academy. And it, it's my pleasure to thank you, Senator, for a very inspiring short speech, but uh, it addresses, in fact, many of the challenges that the Academy is meditating on and active around. Um, and particularly, of course, today is about the researchers and the researchers, as you say, putting the message out uh, and communicating what they're doing. Um, this has this open day was something we thought of two years ago and then COVID intervened. And since it's very much about people coming in and about the sort of hands-on demonstrations and so on that are going on all through the day, it was important to wait until it could be done in person and until people could come in through the doors and until the researchers could interact with them and so on. So this is what we hope will, will happen today. There are the formal presentations and then the opportunities for everybody to, to quiz the researchers about what they do. I think there's a great emphasis indeed on, on digital humanities in today's uh, proceedings and therefore you know, that is another way in which we can, can reach out. But I'd like to thank you very much for um, coming to us today. Thank you. So before we go inside and start talking to each other and w walking around and looking at everything and interacting, as Jane has said, um, I would just like to say a few further words. Um, Senator Byrne has given us a challenge, well, three challenges, actually. Um, and I think it's worthwhile reflecting um, on the last one, on the creation of policy at the moment. So the Academy has just put up on its website this, the end of last week, this week, uh, beginning of this week, the, our views on um, how science advice should be provided uh, in Ireland. Uh, and this was in response to a consultation from the Department of Further Education, so uh, in higher education, research and innovation. So we have responded to that, um, setting out also the strengths of the academy, which clearly are across a whole number of disciplines. And again, the interdisciplinarity 
of science and of research and of the role of the humanities, uh, we can do that here because we, are, unlike in England, we are not like the Royal Society and the British Academy where arts and humanities and sciences are separated. Uh, this is a convening space, north and south, and this is a convening space where we, through our work here, through our multidisciplinary committees and through our projects, which you're about to see today and we're all about to look at, uh, we can contribute hugely and we can be that forum. So I just wanted to say to Senator Byrne uh, that this is a message which uh, we would love to be communicated further among your colleagues in, um, in Leinster House. Uh, secondly, the creation of a new body for um, uh, science and research. We will be actively involved in making submissions to that too. And again, building on our experience and also um, responding to, as we have over the last couple of years very strongly, to the Taoiseach's uh, Shared Island Initiative. Because we are North and South, because we can uh, cover uh, interests in research right across the whole island, uh, this again gives us a unique strength here. And um, I know that my colleagues, the officers, the council, and also the executive under our new executive director, Dr. O'Sullivan, are all very well aware of that. So I just want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, we have a lot of challenges to rise to but, and a lot of difficulties, but there is a huge amount of expertise in here to help policymakers. And as I did say to Minister Harris some time ago, he should regard us as a free consultancy service. So thank you all very much and enjoy the day. Thank you. Good morning. You can all hear me, I presume. I hope you're all having good mornings. And um, I'm going to assume that some of you good people here today may have gone into an exhibition that was on display uh, in Dublin Castle from December until March last year. Uh, an exhibition on the centenary of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Now, my name is John Gibney, and I'm the assistant editor of one of the Academy's research projects, Document in Irish Foreign Policy. And I want to talk to you about that exhibition, and hopefully I'll jolt you, wake you up with a good dose of history this morning, because history is what this particular project deals in. What we do is we produce the archival records of Irish foreign policy since 1919. But in line with what, with what Senator Byrne said, we do place a great emphasis on outreach. Not only do we produce our scholarly editions, but you have to reach out to you know, engage with an audience, to explain material to them, to present it to them. And every now and again, alongside the core task that we do, which is producing um, the handsome green volumes, you'll, some of which you'll see outside, and which would make a perfect Christmas present should, the, should the, uh, the opportunity present itself, we also engage in activities intended to explain that material to a wider public. And, when, and given that the very first volume in that series dealt with the period from 1919 to 1922, and dealt very strongly with the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And given that the particular project I work on, Documents in Irish Foreign Policy, is a partnership between the Academy here, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and the National Archives, where we are physically based, it made sense that we were going to, um, that we should become involved in the centenary exhibition that the archives um, developed to mark the centenary of the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And I'm talking to you today because me and my colleagues helped to curate that exhibition. And for those of you who didn't see it, you admit that may look familiar from seeing it in and around Dublin Castle last December. But we produced that we published documentary material um, very often in, in its typed form, the contents of which can be fascinating, you know, and we'll go into it, I'll explain a bit more about the project itself later this afternoon, should any of you be here. But how do you present this material to a wider public? In the way in in terms of how that was done with this particular exhibition, I want to give you a very brief whistle stop. I suppose, illustration of some of the things that were included in the exhibition and give you a sense of how you might take archival documents, which are often kind of humble typescripts, perhaps not, um, not immediately arresting or striking, 
but how you might frame them in a way that would engage people and make them interesting and explain them. And the way in which it was done with this particular exhibition was not just to, I suppose, put the documents on display, and though they were on display and they formed the core of this exhibition, and the treaty itself formed a centerpiece and, I suppose, conclusion of the exhibition. But the exhibition was also intended to evoke the world in which these documents were generated. And we kind of forget that when we think of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, signed as it was in December in, on the 6th of December 1921, there can be a tendency to dwell upon one or two aspects of its creation, a tendency to, un, an understandable tendency, to dwell upon the, um, the, the, the divisions that flowed from it. But we made a conscious decision with this exhibition that, well, enough people know about the treaty split. Um, and other people were going to argue the toss and explicate that and explain that to a wider public. So we made a very conscious decision that this exhibition was going to stop with the signing of the treaty and we were going to go back. We were going to look at its origins and explain how this uniquely important document came into being. And we did it through, I suppose, a combination. Of, as, did anyone go to the exhibition? That's the spirit. I like it. Um, just to give you some numbers, about 16,000 people went to see it in Dublin Castle, so some of you can count yourselves among that lucky, that lucky number. Another 7,000 went to see it on its regional tour. Um, about 1,000 people saw it in its preview that was hosted by the British Academy in London this time last year. I don't know how many people got to see it at its last hurrah at the National Ploughing Championships the other week, but you know, I'm guessing, you know, a few, I'm guessing there was a bit of footfall at that. What we tried to do was kind of put the documents on display. Some of them are in, some of them are particularly are more striking than others. But we also tried to evoke the world in which those documents were created. Um, what kind of sounds did people hear in, say, the Dublin or London of late 1921? What sights did they see? Um, what, what did they recall? You know, we had a mixture of, say, audio-visual, and we were involved at curating and developing this exhibition at every level. It's the material on display, the text that we wrote, um, also the audio and visual components, you know, dramatizations of people's recollections of being in London, photographs of their journey there, and what you're looking at behind us is a photograph from the National Library of Ireland that shows the mailboat Kirkmore leaving what was then Dunleary, well, actually, it was Dunleary, still is Dunleary, I always get that little the Kingstown Dunleary thing mixed up, I forget the date, though we should remember it, but leaving Dunleary Harbour, carrying the delegation that went over to sign the treaty. Now, as in terms of the delegation, there is a tendency to dwell upon the five men who negotiated it, and two men in particular. What we forget, though, is that the delegation was much, much wider than that. And we wanted to kind of bring some hidden lives out into the, uh, out into the open as well. As part of the decade of centenaries, there's been a huge contribution, a huge emphasis on the contribution of women to the independence struggle. Well, the point was made early on that without the role of women, so as support staff and uh, the secretariat that kind of operated with the delegation in London, none of the material in that exhibition would exist because they were the ones that typed it. Michael Collins did not sit down at a typewriter, you know. You know, Arthur Griffith did not sit down at a, sit down at a typewriter. But people like Kathleen Napoli McKenna, you know, Lily O'Brennan, you know, pictured here with Arthur Griffith, they sat down and they would have dealt it, and these were trusted, reliable people. Napoli McKenna, in particular, left a fascinating account of life in London, and she had played an integral role in the propaganda machine of Sinn Féin in Dublin as a person who edited and very often wrote up the Dolls, you know, pr propaganda bulletin, the Irish bulletin, in 1919, 20, and 21. In terms of, say, the wider world in which they operated, these, and these material, this is material from the National Archives, we wouldn't normally publish this stuff, but it's perfect to put on display because of how visually striking it is. On the right, you see a copy of the aforementioned Irish bulletin in German, published in Germany, dated the 12th of October, and talking about the arrival of the Irish delegation to negotiate the treaty in London, which and the treaty negotiations began the previous day. On the right, a letter dated the same date from the, from the Irish Self-Determination League of Great Britain, the main Irish kind of separatist organization in Great Britain at that time, and apparently the largest Irish organization ever created in Britain. Um, now, in terms of that state illustrate, I suppose the photo shows a bit of the journey. The two documents prior to that show a bit of the reaction to that journey. These show some of the nuts and bolts. Over here, you know, we, 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 we love this invoice. You get some great letterheads on these old documents. You know, they're, they're great to see. You know, it's great artistry goes into these things. So you have basically, it's, um, it's an invoice for basically doing up the offices that they were going to use in, in London. They had to rent two townhouses, you know, to base themselves in. And this was a delegation of a, at least over 30 people. People came and went. But as I said, far more than just the five people who were sitting in the negotiating room with the British negotiators. This is always a good one because it's an invoice for the rental of Rolls-Royce cars. We kind of forget that, um, 
you know, the Dáil viewed itself as a government in waiting. You know, that was their position on the matter, that, you know, they were a republic, they were an elected government with a mandate. And if you're a government, you want to rock up in style to number 10 Downing Street. You're not going to get a taxi, you're not going to go up in foot. You were going to want to turn up in a Rolls Royce and present yourself to the world as best you could. And people are kind of, people got that one. In fact, the and the dates here show, um, it actually comes down to the 10th, the 9th, the 7th, 8th, 9th. These are being rented all throughout, the, throughout the, the course of negotiations in October and November. And those little human details, if you match that with a photograph of the same car, and you can identify the same car via the registration plates, you know, you evoke that sense of the world. You had a great photograph, you know, of the car, one of the cars coming out of Downing Street, past crowds of well-wishers, and match it up to that document, you know. It kind of, it, it conjures up something, something. That's the wider delegation. Um, missing a couple of its key figures, but it indicates you don't see, you see Arthur Griffith there, you don't see Collins there, you see many other familiar faces there, and many unfamiliar faces there as well, you know, some of whom went on to have rather curious careers. I mean, the guy over here on the very far, on the far left, sitting down, Joseph McGrath, is probably best known to Irish history as the man who created the Irish Hospital sweepstakes, but that lay in the future. Um, but the point is that far more people were involved in, you know, navigating those discussions and creating that treaty than just the people whose names appear on it. It's a point I'm laboring, but it's a point we really wanted to get across as we kind of brought this, this exhibition into, into, uh, into, into being. Picture of Michael Collins, and that's a picture I took in London last year. Collins is standing on that balcony, okay? That's 22 Hands Place, one of the two townhouses in Kensington and Chelsea, because remember, you wanted to do this in style, so you'd weren't, you were gonna rent a house in somewhere plush. These were used as the delegation headquarters, you know, they're de facto offices, because bear in mind, the British had the advantage of these negotiations taking place on their own territory, on their own, with the, with the benefit and support of their own bureaucracy, but that's one of the townhouses that, um, that they would have stayed in, you know. And there's some fascinating descriptions of life in that townhouse that we used. There's a great story that Kathleen Napoli McKenna relates of how uh, they decided to have a party one time to blow off steam. They were under pressure, you know, so a bit of recreation was allowed. And it culminated in Collins and other members of the IRB and the IRA having a food fight and throwing lumps of coal at one another, you know. Um, these things happen, I suppose. Collins again outside one of the other offices. 15 Cadogan Gardens, now a school not too far from Hans Place. You know, and it's fascinating to walk those streets last year and kind of track down those buildings. You know, the same stonework being visible, the same structures that survive today as existed 100 years ago and as reflected in photographs from that time. Collins and Griffith leaving number 10 Downing Street. Um, on the far left, Emmett Dalton, in later life one of the founders of Ardmore Studios, present at the deaths of both Michael Collins and Thomas Kettle at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. And again, another little story that lurked behind us, the, the reality of the treaty negotiations. And one role that Dalton had in the course of those negotiations was buying a plane using the IRA's money to ensure a swift getaway from London should negotiations collapse. And the plane was never used for the purpose, but later became the first aircraft used by the nascent Irish Air Corps in 1923, nicknamed the big fella after Collins, who was originally meant to transport. You can't really have one side without the other, okay? At least two of those British negotiators are clearly identifiable, most obviously probably to an Irish audience, Winston Churchill, David Lloyd George, the incumbent Liberal Prime Minister, um, and in the background, F.E. Smith, Lord Birkenhead, Lord Chancellor. So probably the three key figures on the British side. And it was a great document that's, um, that to me showed the history in the making, which is a draft of the treaty where um, in Birkenhead's writing, he had crossed something out. I mean, throughout, the British wanted a settlement. They wanted an agreement. And they, while they had certain red lines to use parlance of our times, they were clear that they were willing to soften some of the language they could use. So in the discussion of the oath that was to be sworn by parliamentarians in the Irish Free State, the original draft said the British Empire. Now, the Irish delegation objected to this, and in Birkenhead's handwriting, you can see how empire has been crossed out and British Commonwealth of Nations has been placed in. That's significant because the first legal and official use of the term British Commonwealth is in Article 4 of the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. So you can quite literally imagine a room in which history was being made in a way that would have profound implications for the British Empire over the course of its remaining existence. Now, back to the paperwork. Over here, minutes of the first meeting, the official minutes of the first meeting between the two delegations in Number 10 Downing Street. There was a conundrum at the start of the talks because for many of the British negotiators, they were dealing with people they viewed as murderers. So the idea of shaking hands at Michael Collins was a bit of a problem. They got around it by basically assembling on either side of the cabinet table in the cabinet room of Downing Street. Lloyd George came around and shook the hands of the Irish negotiators, thereby sparing his colleagues what they may have viewed as an uncomfortable indignity. Handshakes all around would have to wait until the treaty was actually signed. Over here, Eamon de, a letter from Arthur Griffith, handwritten to Eamon de Valera, because Eamon de Valera 
famously or infamously was not part of that delegation. But you realise that there's a whole um, there's a lot of meetings that weren't recorded on the British side that were recorded on the on the Irish side because you had to keep De Valera informed. So people were writing back to Dublin with reports of those meetings. And even in this letter, Griffith is pointing out that the, you know the two big issues and identifying the two big issues that would loom large in the, in the negotiation of the treaty: partition and Ireland's relationship to the, Briti to the British Empire. There's no photograph of the negotiations of progress, but in the papers of Robert Barton, and Barton is down here in the far right corner, that's from the Illustrated London News, lovingly conserved by the conservation staff at the National Archives, and I will always make the point that whenever you see historians talk about the past, there is an army of archivists and conservators that, lay beh that lie behind them to make sure that material exists and is presentable. That's from the Illustrated London News, a stylized depiction of the talks in progress as they wound towards their end and throughout November 1921. I mentioned the Irish Self-Determination League of Great Britain. Well, they organised a concert, you know, for the delegation in the Albert Hall on, um, in October 19, 1921. You know, a big, you know, celebration of Irish life in London with over about, about 5,000 people in attendance. And there's a little coda about that that I'll come to in a moment. Other ephemera. A sketch by Robert Barton that was almost certainly done for um, Frank Pakenham, later Lord Longford, as he wrote an account of the treaty negotiations in the early 1930s, the cabinet table for some of the negotiations. Partition. Partition was of fundamental importance to those negotiations. Just because partition didn't loom large in the treaty split that came later, you shouldn't underestimate the extent to which partition and the prospect of Irish unity or lack thereof played the role that played within the treaty negotiations itself. Last but not least, the documents. Now, there are two copies of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. There's the Irish one which held in, national, in the National Archives. There's the British one that's held in the, in the National Archives in Kew. Well, when I say National Archives, I mean the ones up in Bishop Street, not the ones in Kew, but there's two copies. And there's a little distinction that brings us back to one of the documents I showed up before, the, the ticket to the event in the Royal Albert Hall, because the signatures are different. On the Irish copy, you have the Irish signatures on the, on the left, British on the right. It's reversed on the British copy. But there was a problem, because when, they were, when the treaty was famously signed, and admittedly signed under duress in the early hours of the 6th of December 1921, it was only signed by three people on both sides, because only three people on either side were at the actual final meeting. So you had to get the rest of the signatures. Kathleen Napoli McKenna recalled how um, Eamon Duggan later signed a document in 22 Hands Place with a cigarette in his mouth, you know, as he signed it. You know, you know we're lucky there's not a cigarette born in the thing. Um, and Duggan, that morning, I mean, I presume he put out a cigarette, went to bed, because he had to be up bright and early, because he had the job of bringing that document to Dublin to present it to Eamon de Valera for his consideration. Now, the catch was, when the British began looking for the signatures for their copy, they sent an emissary round to the Irish delegation's offices the next afternoon to be confronted with the fact that Eamon Duggan was no longer there. So it was suggested that somebody could sign in his stead, but then somebody realised that at that event in the Albert Hall, that one right there, the treaty delegates had signed loads of copies of programs. You know, they had autographed these things, and there were a few of them knocking around, and someone realized that we actually have Duggan's signature here. We just have to cut it out and paste it onto the original, onto the British copy. And you can see how, in the British copy, second name down on the right-hand column, you can see the outline of how it was pasted on, and that was the copy issued to the press. That is the copy that you will see in contemporary newspapers, which were reproduced in that exhibition. That's the one that actually was of significant, was seen as significant enough to push a message from the, from the then US President Warren Harding off the front page of the New York Times, you know, and then we stopped their exhibition and others could argue the point about the split. Why am I telling you all this? Well, there's two reasons. If you wanted to um, find out more about the intricacies of the treaty negotiations, they're replicated in Documents in Irish Foreign Policy, Volume 1, and you can peruse a few copies of that outside. But it's also an indication of outreach it's a reflection of the partnership that you know, our particular project has with a, nat with a national cultural institution and what one can do to reach an audience when the resources are there and the willingness to do it is there. Because while there is a place for specialised scholarship, undoubtedly, there is also a place for communicating that scholarship to the widest possible audience. And we view ourselves as public servants and that is part of our brief. Now, for many of you, I think people will encounter um, the work of the Royal Irish Academy through the outputs of its research projects, its publications, its library, which we would have passed through to come into this newly renovated and beautifully renovated meeting room here today. What I've given you is one sense, I suppose, I'll try to give you one indication of one activity that one project in this institution took part in, um, an indication of how you might approach it, how you might reach an audience, and also 
to reiterate the fact that this reached an audience, that there is an audience out there who were interested in the past, the culturally curious, as Board Falch might necessarily say, um, and this is one way in which we saw we kind of were involved in getting their attention and explaining the past to them um, over the course of the past year. Now, in terms of what the project actually does, I have another slot later on this afternoon. If you are still here, we can get into the nuts and bolts of actually producing those nice, green, handsome volumes. But in the meantime, I'm going to stop there. I would thank you for your time. Enjoy your morning. And we are here to answer your questions on anything relating to the projects operated through the Academy in the rooms outside. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Barbara McCormack, and I'm the librarian here in the Royal Irish Academy. And today I'm going to discuss the library's involvement in a digital humanities research project, which aims to uncover, preserve, and widen access to heritage collections through interdisciplinary and collaborative partnerships. So I hope to illustrate the importance of collaboration between research organizations and the cultural heritage sector by introducing the OS200 project, which aims to reevaluate the impacts and legacies of the Ordnance Survey on the island of Ireland through a UK-Ireland collaboration in the digital humanities. And Ireland has particular importance in the global history of maps and map making. Two centuries ago, it became the first country to be mapped entirely at the large scale of six inches to one mile which was a remarkable achievement at the time. And not only did the map makers survey and record features on the ground, they captured an impressive range of local details, including folklore, place names, antiquities, religion, and topography. And all of this work was undertaken by the Ordnance Survey during the period from the 1820s until the 1840s. And the records of this are now preserved here in the Ordnance Survey archive at the Royal Irish Academy Library. So OS 200, or Digitally Remapping Ireland's Ordnance Survey Heritage, is a three-year project which is jointly funded by the Irish Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, as part of a collaboration to bring together world-leading expertise in the digital humanities across the UK and Ireland. In 2021, the project was one of 11 projects to successfully receive grant funding designed to support large collaborative projects achieve a transformational impact on the digital humanities through innovative multidisciplinary research and partnership around defined thematic areas. And OS200, it sought to address the theme of digital humanities and cultural heritage by uncovering, preserving, and widening access to hidden collections through interdisciplinary and collaborative partnerships, discovering innovative ways in which the digital humanities can enhance access to an engagement with the cultural heritage sector, and also exploring new or hidden narratives. OS200 is composed of a diverse team, including geographers, linguists, historians, archeologists, and computer scientists. The two lead research organisations are Queen's University Belfast and the University of Limerick, with Professor Keith Lilly and Dr Catherine Porter acting as project investigators, a further four co-investigators and three researchers completing the project team. 
It has engaged new and inclusive partnerships between researchers and stakeholders, such as the Royal Irish Academy, specifically the Academy's library and its Irish Historic Towns Atlas, but also the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland and the Digital Repository of Ireland. It also hopes to collaborate with other major humanities research projects, such as the Place Names Database of Ireland and the Northern Ireland Place Names Project. So OS 200 aims then to gather historic ordnance survey maps and texts to form a freely accessible online resource for academic and public use, which will reconnect the original six inch maps with related materials, such as the ordnance survey memoirs, letters and name books, to uncover and explore otherwise hidden and forgotten aspects of the life and work of those employed by the ordnance survey as they mapped and recorded landscapes and localities. It will enable the reconstruction of an ethnography of the Ordnance Survey in Ireland, looking at the movement of the field workers and their relationships with informants and other Ordnance Survey personnel during the late 1820s and into the 1830s, and will advance our understanding of how Ireland was mapped two centuries ago, also marking the bicentenary of the Ordnance Survey in Ireland. The digital outcomes of the project will open up new legacies and impacts of the Ordnance Survey to new audiences, creating insights into Ireland's cultures, landscapes and people, past and present. I'll just explain a little bit about the Ordnance Survey. Um, so the, um, the Ordnance Survey was established in 1824 and it operated as an agency of the British Military of Defence for the next 100 years. Under the direction of Major General Thomas Colby, the mapping project aimed to undertake a townland survey of Ireland, mapping the entire country at a scale of six inches to one mile, for the purpose of updating land valuations. The, cart the cartographic element of the OS project, or the Great National Work, started in 1825, and it was completed in 1842, producing a full set of maps for each Irish county. These maps, along with letters and other documents produced by surveyors, are important resources in terms of the legacy of the Ordnance Survey. However, what was once a connected corpus of material has become fragmented and scattered across both collections and institutions. Many of these records are actually held here in the Academy Library, with the exception of the name books which were used by surveyors to record the authoritative forms of place names by conducting research in the field. These are held by the National Archives, along with other archival material generated through the mapping process. OS 200 will use new and innovative digital methods, tools and practices to connect and enrich these materials, recreating connections between memoirs, sketches, letters, name books and maps, re-examining not only how the Ordnance Survey mapped Ireland, but also the process by which they transformed it. So a range of important primary sources pertaining to the Ordnance Survey are held by the Royal Irish Academy, which include the original set of six inch maps for the country. It also includes 137 volumes of letters, extracts and inquisitions, together with antiquarian drawings, which were transferred to the Royal Irish Academy in the period 1857 to 60, and a further 52 boxes comprising the Ordnance Survey memoirs transferred in 1890. I'm just going to now present a brief overview of each of these collections. So the original set of maps were published between 1833 and 1846, and these are held in the library reading room. And we have two examples on display today. We have the map of Dublin and two volumes at the map of Mayo. The bound volumes contain an index map to each county and describe the landscape of pre-famine Ireland from coast to coast, providing a complete record of cities, towns and villages, along with hills, fields, rivers, lakes, greens, farmhouses and smaller dwellings. And the example on the screen today uh, is of the village of, or the town of Clondalkin, recording details such as the Round Tower, Mill Pond, the Glebe House, the Corn Mill, the Orchard House, and the School House, 
but also the fever hospital, the dispensary and the lying in hospital. The Academy holds a large collection of manuscript Ordnance Survey letters, comprising correspondence between John O'Donovan, as you can see here on the screen, and other researchers employed by the Ordnance Survey. And this is correspondence back to their headquarters in Dublin as they travelled around the country. O'Donovan was appointed to the Ordnance Survey in 1830, and he would have worked very closely with Thomas Larkham and George Petrie, researching Irish place names particularly and establishing the authoritative forms of these names to be used in the maps. Letters exist for each county in Ireland with the exceptions of counties Cork, Antrim and Tyrone, and they are arranged by county and by parish, often recording details of meetings and discussions between the surveyors and local people about topographical information. Full transcripts of the letters were, were edited by the Reverend Michael O'Flanagan from 1927 to 30, and a typescript set of these, uh, this edition is held by the library. The manuscripts themselves were disbound, conserved, microfilmed, and digitised as part of the International Access to Academy Library Holdings Project, which was generously supported by Atlantic Philanthropies and completed in 2012. Digital versions of these letters are available on the Ask About Ireland website, where they complement other resources such as Griffith's Valuation and also the name books. But as part of the Ordnance Survey 200 project, the library contributed digital scans of the microfilmed letters, along with detailed associated metadata. The Ordnance Survey memoirs were compiled in the 1830s, and these comprised descriptions of topographical details and antiquities that could not easily be surmised in cartographic form on the accompanying maps. Arranged by county and parish in 52 boxes, they contain information on landscape, topography, population, economy and society, as well as recording features of antiquarian interest. Now, memoirs exist for the counties of Antrim, Donegal, Down, Fermanagh, Londonderry and Tyrone, together with a small amount of material relating to the parishes in the counties of Cavan, Monaghan, Leitrim, Louth and Sligo. And unfortunately, government funding for the scheme was withdrawn in 1839-40, before any memoirs were completed for the remainder of the country. The memoirs have been published in a set of 40 volumes, plus an index volume, under the editorship of Angelique Day and Patrick McWilliams in the 1980s. The memoirs also include over 1,600 pen and ink drawings, which record details of archaeological and antiquarian features completed by surveyors working in the field. The drawings, like this one, were catalogued with funding from the Esme Mitchell Trust and Atlantic Philanthropies, but they were digitised as part of the Ordnance Survey 200 project. The sketches were not published with the text of the memoirs in the 1980s, but a small subset of these drawings was published in Angelique Day's book, uh, Glimpses of Ireland's Past, the Ordnance Survey Memoir Drawings, in 2014. So the vast majority of these drawings have not been reproduced and will be reproduced for the first time as part of the Ordnance Survey 200 project, where they will be digitally reunited with the text of the memoirs. In addition to the drawings that were conducted or compiled by surveyors in the field, um, there is another set of professional drawings and sketches in the collection, and these were prepared by artists that were employed by the Ordnance Survey, people such as George Petrie, George Victor de Noyer, and William Frederick Wakeman. And the originals of these drawings, consisting of over 1,000 sketches in numerous Irish counties, uh, dating back from the 1830s, are held in the Academy Library. And they cover antiquarian sites in numerous counties, but particularly in County Tipperary. Uh, and you can see here, this is an east window of Cahar Abbey in County Tipperary, drawn by de Noyer in September 1840. The sketches were conserved with funding from the Heritage Council and are now stored unbound in archival boxes. The library received funding to catalogue uh, the drawings from the Sailors and Soldiers Trust Fund and to photograph the collection for preservation purposes from Atlantic Philanthropies. 
Uh, so finally, along with the letters, memoirs, drawings and sketches, the Academy Library holds a collection known as the OS Extracts and Inquisitions. And these contain transcripts or copies of documents relevant to the work of the surveyor's topographical department. The documents are mostly in Irish and Latin, although there are some in English, relating to antiquities in various counties. The extracts are arranged, arranged in bound volumes by county and include some material that was lost in 1922 during the fire in the Public Records Office of Ireland. And much of this material is now available on the Virtual Record Treasury of Ireland, which was developed by the Beyond 2022 project led by Trinity College in Dublin. To date, the library has contributed 23 volumes of extracts produced during the period 1810 until 1820, which cover material from the 16th to the 18th centuries. The example we see on the slide is the will of Donal O'Gallagher, aged 41 years, concerning all the old customs of O'Donnell's in the territory of Tyrconnell in the year 1626. So today I have outlined how the Ordnance Survey 200 Digital Humanities Project aims to collate maps and other primary sources into a single freely accessible resource which will enable both researchers and the general public to explore hidden and disparate legacies of the Ordnance Survey in Ireland. The records of the survey, such as those preserved in the Academy Library, offer an important insight into the mapping of Ireland under British rule and are particularly important since the records in Britain were largely destroyed during the Second World War. To conclude, partnerships between cultural institutions like the Academy Library and research projects like Ordnance Survey 200 enable us to enrich community discoverability and engagement with our heritage collections and provide a transformational impact in the field of digital humanities. I would like to thank you for your time today and your interest in the library's contribution to the Ordnance Survey 200 project. I'd also like to invite you at some stage this morning uh, to view original material that's on display in the reading room pertaining to the Ordnance Survey, including each of the collections that I've mentioned in this talk. Thank you very much.
Hi everybody, um, my name is Sarah Geerty. I'm the Cartographic and Managing Editor with the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, or the IHTA, which is one of the research projects here in the Academy. And I'd just like to welcome you all here today. It's great to see so many people in and out of the Academy. And it's an exciting day for us, I think, here, here as well, uh, to see each other's work and talk to you about it. We had Culture Night a uh, couple of weeks ago, and that was another opportunity. It's great to see things opening up again and generally be able to talk about the work. Um, and thanks, Jane, for coordinating this day uh, very much, Jane Conroy. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about maps, uh, a bit about my own background, uh, a bit about the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, and also particularly on our cities and how they have been both a challenge and offer us also lots of possibilities uh, from the map maker's perspective, that is. So as I said, I'm Sarah Geerty. I am part of a wider team and network involved in carrying out and supporting the work of the IHTA. And my colleagues, Jennifer Moore and Frank Cullen, are here today as well, and they'll be presenting later, so make sure to catch them either in this room or in the demo room. Our editorial board are listed here in the slide, and they and our authors are all from various disciplines, history, geography, and archaeology mainly, and they carry out their work for the project in a voluntary capacity. Also invaluable are our institutional partners, Ordnance Survey Ireland and local authorities, and in particular at the moment, Dublin City Council and Cork City Council. Now, like all historical atlases, the IHTA offers a way of presenting and understanding the past, and it is the urban landscape that is our consideration. The map on the right shows the 28 Irish towns and cities that have been covered to date. And if you don't see your place there, rest assured that there are another 15 towns and cities on our current agenda. The Irish Atlas is part of a wider European scheme. We produce a whole range of ancillary publications and run various events, lectures and exhibitions, all related to the work we do in the main Atlas series. Itself, that the Atlas series is a platform for further research across a range of disciplines and a range of users. Fine, you can check our website, and as I said, we'll be out at the table in the, in the council room and happy to tell you more about all of that. Now, my role in the Atlas is as cartographic and managing editor, and it is the cartographic bit that we will be dwelling on today. I became interested in maps when studying archaeology and geography in UCD, having come from Granard, County Longford, a small but monumental place whose moat had, as the poet Noel Monaghan said, wrapped its earthly chill of history around us. Seeing the moat of Granard expressed on the first edition six inch Ordnance Survey town plan of 1837, um, there on the left, and which Barbara introduced us to, had a captivating effect, a sense of place through maps, particularly historic maps, which offer so many avenues to wonder and investigate what remains, what was once there, what is no longer there, and of, what, of course, what may have been there, but leaves no trace in reality or on the map. Now, as Barbara mentioned, the Ordnance Survey of Ireland was set up in 1824 to carry out a townland survey for valuation and townland purposes. The result was much more far-reaching, and the first edition six-inch maps Later editions and associated records have become an integral and sometimes contested part of our cultural history and identity. For the researcher, it is universal in its representation. Everywhere on the island was surveyed systematically, without exception. Physical features such as roads, buildings and rivers measured and plotted. With less tangible topographical elements such as place names, boundaries and antiquity also recorded decided upon and added to the map as per the accompanying character sheet or key, which is there on the slide as well. The considerable OS archive that Barbara has introduced us to, the memoirs, letters, extracts, sketches, tell us more about the process that led to what is ultimately presented on the page or the map. 
and are a constant reminder of the incredible depth of this as a mapping enterprise. One of the great wonders of these maps is the scale itself. And as a cart cartographer, I'm obviously obsessed with scale. And the scale of these is six inches to the mile, which is approximately one to 10,000. And how it manages to relate town and country. Allowing an overview of the rural landscape with its network of townlands while, on the other hand, retaining the detail of our cityscape with its dense network of streets, lanes, buildings and blocks. And you see, well, Dawson Street is somewhere in there on the bottom, uh, bottom right. My interest in historic maps began in the archaeological landscape of County Longford, but brought me to the heart of the urban realm and to Dawson Street in the late 1990s where another considerable mapping project was underway in the form of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, where I became a mapmaker myself, hooked on that slightly angst-ridden experience of symbolising and generalising aspects of reality, and worse, imposing a bias consciously or unconsciously that cartographers are sometimes accused of. And so to the IHTA. By definition, an atlas is not all about maps but it is in fact a fine balance and interaction of maps and texts, governed by a consistency of style, scale and language. In using the IHTA, there is a presumption, an expectation that a map contained within will not be used in isolation, but as part of a wider picture or story, to be studied in conjunction with other maps of the same place or another place, or with a piece of accompanying text. Similarly, in the research phase, of compiling the IHTA, the process is one of combining cartographic and documentary sources to be deconstructed and reconstructed and reborn in new forms of maps and texts in print and online. And as I said, we've lots of stuff to show you out there. So if you want to see more of, of, of that, do come and, and talk to us or come to our demos. There are various types of maps in each IHTA, from reproduction of historical maps or historic maps or facsimiles, to thematic distribution or growth maps. Today we will look briefly at some examples, each quite specific in how they relate the historic townscape or cityscape and the potential they hold for further research. So the first are our historical compilation maps. I, I'm not sure you can see the detail there, but that's okay. These essentially depict several centuries on a modern base map. These were an innovation mainly for our city atlases as a way of distilling and displaying some of the multitude of historic layers across the larger urban areas. We produce these maps at the end of the research phase when we have the fullest possible list of urban sites at our disposal in the form of a draft topographical information. And I don't know, Jennifer is going to introduce us to that later. I won't focus on this now, but it's a big list of sites. And from there, working with the author, we select a list of what is usually about 200 known sites. These are symbolized and indexed thematically. Here in the slide, we are in Galway. On the left, our author, in this case, Paul Walsh, his draft, and on the right, the final version. It is the Wood Key Francis Street area, now very much part of the city, but called in the past the northern suburbs. The red-green symbols are religious, the medieval Franciscan friary, alongside a later convent and friary. The orange are administrative, so town hall, courthouses, schools. The purple are manufacturing sites, distilleries and mills. While the black peeping in represents the line of the medieval town walls. Many of these sites are long gone, may not have been contemporary with one another, and we don't necessarily know their full extent or plan. But the symbols allow for certain patterns to emerge and hopefully inspire. One of the most dramatic and affecting parts of creating these maps is plotting the conjectural line of early shorelines and revealing past waterways overlaid on the modern Ordnance Survey town plan. So they're just some examples as well of the other ones we've done, we can show you later. The second type of map that we're going to look at closely is what we commonly know as map two. 
Uh, map 2 is really the principal map of the IHTA and one of the four core maps that are common to all our atlases and that they allow comparison. Contrary to the historical compilation maps that we've just discussed, what we are looking at now is the town or city in plan at a particular time, the mid-19th century, and at a particular scale, 1 to 1,500. Map 2 is basically a redrawing of the Ordnance Survey town plans that were produced alongside the six-inch survey that we spoke about and Barbara introduced us to earlier. So the town plans, restyled and rescaled to allow the eye to take in the town on one page. At 1 to 1,500, a small Irish town such as Kells County Meath on the right fits neatly onto a standard IHTA page, which is approximately A3. The bigger the urban extent or built up area in the mid 19th century, the bigger the page required. A double page for Sligo, so Sligo was approximately A2, and double again for Kilkenny, which was approximately A1. And just one indication that cities have demanded much more cartographically from a series that was devised in its early stages as a town atlas. Much editorial effort has gone into retaining a consistency of content throughout the IHTA, and Map 2 is a case in point. It looks the same now as it always did, and offers the researcher the opportunity to analyse the morphology of the town, the pattern of plots, houses in pink and gardens in green, the interaction with public buildings, which are depicted in red, water in blue, and the relationship of features to their containing street pattern, and names, the high streets and market streets of Kilkenny, Sligo and Kells, illustrate common threads in what is ultimately a more complex comparative story. Despite the consistent look behind Map 2, production methods have changed considerably. When I first started with the IHTA, I drew the draft for that map we saw of Kilkenny on permatrace at a drawing table, overlaying extracts from the contemporary valuation town plans to supplement the Ordnance Survey. These days, my colleague Frank Cullen does the digitising in ArcGIS, and you see here our current work on Cork, struggling to contain itself on one sheet at 1,500. And Cork will be displayed on a page six times uh, the standard size. The Ordnance Survey Town Plan for Cork, which we are digitising from, dates to 1842 and required 33 individual sheets. The Ordnance Survey chose the scale of five foot to the mile, which is approximately one to a thousand, mostly, for mapping towns. And in a way, in seeking consistency in the IHTA, we are retracing their footsteps and efforts to standardise, represent, and bring two-dimensional order to these tremendously dense urban areas. Though the original Ordnance Survey town plans, which survived, by the way, in manuscript in the National uh, Archives of Ireland, uh, OS 140, they do follow a general template. There are variations. And these Cork plans are, in fact, amongst the most detailed. For example, the house numbers included in this extract from the heart of what was the medieval walled city are not usual for other places. And the Gothic script you see, I hope, ish, uh, like the site of kings and queens castle in the Gothic script is the or Ordnance Service's own attempt at representing the past on what was in 1842 a very modern town plan. Uh, Frank is going to can tell you more about the process involved in creating this map at his demonstration later. To zoom out for a minute and just to point out that Map 2 is in fact the main connect connecting link to the wider European Historic Towns Atlas. So to be part of the scheme, you are expected, or countries are expected to produce a map at 1 2500 for the pre-industrial 19th, 19th century city or towns. So giving a strong basis for comparative study across the continent. And there's more details there in that link, or we can talk to you more about that aspect. Uh, there's just, so you can see the common kind of style, that's Dortmund in the German series. 
The mapping of cities has provided the IHTA with plenty of challenges and possibilities because of their size, their historical complexity. They have required particular treatment. In the creation of the IHDA, cartographic char characteristics evident in historic maps from the past become familiar in new historical maps about the past. In the IHDA, we have dealt with Dublin City so far in three parts, divided chronologically by cartographic milestones, John Speed's map or view or perspective or bird's eye of the city in 1610, John Roke's map of 1756, and the Ordnance Survey first published city plan of 1847. The extent of the city was an issue by the time we got to Dublin part three, and a new map reduced in scale to one to 5,000 was necessary to depict the full city, the full area, which was simply put, the city between the canals. But the city of course is even bigger than that, and the suburbs have an important story of their own to tell. In the IHTA, we have dealt with this by giving the Dublin suburbs a sub-series or a whole series of their own. Places such as Tantarf, today a fully urban district, began as rural villages and have a spatial character very different to that of the urban core, presenting their own particular range of decisions in terms of scale and extent for the atlas maker. When we look to the source material, we see the suburbs dealt with in various ways in the past too. John Roke included the word suburb in the title of his hugely ambitious exact survey of the city. But his elaborate cartouche scales and titles take up much of what could be considered the suburban space on the map. Thankfully, Roke's four sheet map of the environs covers more ground and his actual survey of the county of Dublin more still, accommodated by reduced scales. Roke's cartographic influence is vast, and we see the contribution of his maps in archaeological reports, history books, and even the walls of local cafes. In the IHTA, in the spirit of remapping the mapped, Roke has offered us an insight into the cultural landscape of the second half of the 18th century as well as a stepping stone for working out how things were before and how they were after. Here in Rathmines, when mapping the villas and terraces of the mid 19th century, it was Roke we turned to to indicate where the former path or Rathmines path lay adjacent to the current line of Rathmines Road today. I'm not sure you can see that, but you can come and look at it in the atlas later. When mapping Cork, Roke did so in less detail than Dublin City, but still managed to name the dozen laneways of the old city, in addition to the names of the marshes, which are so crucial to our work in reconstructing the early city. And that is perhaps an appropriate place uh, to end for today. Cork is the first place we will have covered in the IHTA that has already had a dedicated historical atlas, and that's the Cork University Press's Atlas of Cork City from 2005. So again, we're remapping more, and in which we have, we've benefited from that hugely. Here on the left is work in progress by myself and author Howard Clark on what, is the, what will be the thematic map for medieval Cork in circa 1300. And we look forward to publishing Cork as number 31 in the IHDA series in association with Cork City Council in 20 next year, 2023. Thank you very much.
Good morning, everybody. Hi. Uh, my name is Claire O'Connell, and I am a scientist, science writer, science journalist, science communicator. I wear lots of different hats. Um, this particular hat this morning is a project that uh, I'm working on with the Royal Irish Academy, and it's about distilling wisdom from masterclasses. So don't worry, I will explain what a masterclass is in a moment. Um, but it really gets to that core of, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where maybe you hear an expert talking on stage at a conference, or they're being interviewed on the radio or the TV, and you just go, oh, I'd love to know more about their story, and what kind of wisdom got them to where they are, and maybe what new wisdom have they crystallised from their experience. Um, so really this project is, is about capturing that kind of wisdom from experts and bringing it to a wider audience. So it's called the Masterclass Book Project, or at least that's what I call it in my head. <laughs> and it's a kind of a different kind of project for the Royal Irish Academy. Um, and it's, it's based on the fact that for about the last 10 years, masterclasses have been taking place here at the Academy or online, where you had experts speaking with small groups of people. And we wondered how you could capture the kind of wisdom that these experts imparted, because people would come out of these masterclasses buzzing, having spent time with somebody that they really admired, they got a lot of information from them, and a lot of it was two-way conversations as well around the room. And, and we thought, how, how can we sort of capture, you know, it's like catch that butterfly and share it, share it with, with the wider world? And the answer was, a book. So it's not the first time that I've worked on a book um, with the Royal Irish Academy. Um, a couple of years ago, I worked with um, Professor William C. Campbell on this book, which is uh, the story of his life. For anybody who doesn't know who Bill Campbell is, he is a Donegal man from Romelton in County Donegal. And I know we're sort of hearing a lot about the Nobel Prize this week in the news because people are getting their phone calls from Stockholm to say they won. Well, in 2015, Bill got that phone call to say he won. He won um, a, prize, a Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine for his work on parasitic worms. Um, and he was particularly involved in the development of a drug called ivermectin, which was a huge agricultural drug, and it's also been used in humans um, to, uh, to alleviate river blindness, and that drug was made available to people who needed it. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big success story, and Bill was part of that, and he'll say himself, there were a lot of people involved, um, but he was the one that Stockholm rang, so he got, got the Nobel Prize. So I went over and spent time with Bill in North Andover in his house. And uh, we, we wrote this book together, and then on his 90th birthday in June 2020, uh, there you can see myself and Luke O'Neill giving it a good launch, despite the fact that Bill couldn't come over uh, because of COVID, but uh, we gave it a good launch anyway. So um, I had been working with publications and uh, you know I really I really liked the people there and we seemed to get on well um, you know Ruth and Helena and uh, Valeria and, and Fidelma everybody really and um, so uh, I was qu quite happy when the opportunity came up to write another book with them so just to explain to you what the the basis of this book you know the well the wellspring of this book I suppose the master classes and um, the Royal Irish Academy developed a masterclass format, which was the, the brainchild of Porik Dempsey. Some of you in the room may know Porik. He was, he was with the Academy for a long time. Um, and basically, a visiting expert sits with a small group, maybe 10 or 15 people, uh, students, professionals, around a table, as you can see in the picture here, and uh, speaks about their career. And then the participants get to ask the person questions. And um, we have discussions guided by a moderator. Sometimes that moderator has been me, sometimes it has been other people. So the masterclasses have been running in that format, either in Academy House or online, since 2012. And they featured Nobel laureates and other global leaders in their fields. Then in 2018, Accenture teamed up with the Royal Irish Academy to run the Women in Leadership Masterclasses. So the plan was to do about four to six masterclasses um, per year, uh, either in Academy House or when COVID hit, we moved online. Um, and so they've been running very successfully. And I moderated most of them, not all of them. Some people from Accenture moderated them as well, people like Michelle Cullen, Alistair Blair. Um, and I wrote summaries of the discussions after each masterclass. And just to make the point that uh, no more than writing a book or winning a Nobel Prize, it takes a lot of people to bring these masterclasses together. So thank you to, to people like Karen Muldowney in the, in the Academy and to, to people in Accenture as well who worked very hard on that. As we went through the masterclasses, a lot of topics came up. You can see there's, there's one with Mary Harney. Um, 
and for some of them centred, some of them sort of clustered around work. For instance, people wanted to know, how do you get the most out of meetings? Meetings are such an important currency in work and in organisations. And how do you prepare for those? How do you get people on side? How do you sort of get your innovative ideas heard? How do you get your voice heard, maybe, if people aren't really listening? Um, we also talked a lot about finding and being a mentor. So, you know... Can you find a mentor who is totally outside your field or maybe in a completely different age group, older or younger indeed? Um, and how do you become a good mentor as well to other people? Sometimes people might be in relatively early stages of their career, but they can still be helpful mentors to others. We talked a lot about navigating hierarchy. That was something that people wanted to know about too. Uh, society and a lot of work organisations are really hierarchical and um, learning how to navigate those sort of uh, barriers and hurdles along the way, finding out who you need to be talking to about a particular idea is very important. Um, and dealing with sexism in the workplace came up as well. Most of the masterclasses were um, with experts who were women and the participants were women, so um, there was a bit of discussion about that. Um, and really, it, it's, a, it's a difficult subject, but... Uh, what came out of it, some suggestions were, if it's appropriate, try and defuse the situation with humour or in incredulity. Say, oh, I can't believe you just said that, that kind of thing. So they were kind of helpful, helpful tips. <laughs> um, other topics of interest that people gravitated towards centred more around life. So how do you balance time and energy for work and home life? Um, and that balance is going to sort of shift and change over time as your family goes through different stages and as your career goes through different stages. And as well, how do you get perspective on purpose and career? How does one feed the other in that so that you're not sort of working on something that you're not really interested in? Um, or, you know, how do you sort of weave the purpose into your career? Um, very importantly, we spoke a lot about building a support network and looking after your mental health as well. That, that was a big, a big topic of discussion. So we did these masterclasses and, as I say, I wrote the, the discussions of them um, and we would share those discussions with the participants. It was kind of an aid memoir of the topics that we discussed. Uh, maybe if somebody had mentioned a book or a resource that they found helpful, these would be in the summaries. But how could we actually get those to a wider audience? And this was where the idea of a book was born with the working title, Work Life Lessons from Leaders. And we wanted it to be a really short, digestible book of key insights and tips from leaders in their field. So this would not be a weighty tome. That would sort of, you know, you'd have to do a weightlifting class to lift up. This would be a very small book that you could dip in and out of. You could read in a whole sitting if you wanted. The material was there from the masterclasses. That's uh, Mary Kelly doing hers. Um, we just needed to extract the gold. So I went back to the summaries, uh, went back to all the notes, um, and we identified key messages from different speakers um, and they sort of naturally fell around themes and then uh, the process of, of, of writing began. So the book is now in the editing phase um, and it is due to be published in early 2023 to tie in with Law Ale of Rida, uh, which probably seems a fitting, a fitting kind of time to, to launch such a thing, uh, particularly because so many women were involved um, <clears throat> in the in the master classes and uh, we'd like to also sort of build up a, a wider network of the women who are involved as well. So I just wanted, before I finish up, um, I just wanted to give you an example of some of the, the tips that came through. I'm stressing that this is still a work in progress, so it's still all a bit fluid. We're still in, in the process of editing, but you can see here um, Fidelma Slattery has, has uh, developed beautiful artwork around, around the messages, which I think uh, are very visually attractive and I think will make the book um, even more special. Um, so one of the tips was to make, exercise, make time for exercise at the start of the day and, uh, you know, some Something that simple, something like just you know setting your alarm and making it non-negotiable that you're going to get up and you're going to do a little workout at home or you're going to bring the dog out for a walk first thing in the morning, that can set you up physiologically, mentally really well for the day ahead. Uh, so if you, can, if you can make that part of your routine, that's great. Um, another one uh, that's very important for leadership is uh, valuing people and nurturing talent. So I suppose remembering that the people that you work with and who are in your organisation if you're a leader um, are people and people like to be recognised for what they do. So if somebody does a great job on something, drop them a note. If somebody has a success, congratulate them or maybe you know uh, recognise it throughout the organisation. Um, and to nurture talent as well. We had examples of 
really high-flying people saying that they could track back their ambition and their confidence to a comment that somebody made quite early in their career saying, oh, you'd make a good whatever it was, a CEO or a university president or, or whatever it was. Um, so sometimes those little comments um, and just spotting someone with talent in the organisation can be very important. I like this one as well, suppress the need to be perfect when balancing your professional and personal life. So I think we can get caught up in today's world, particularly I think now that we're a little more isolated with COVID and we're, we're looking at things online and you know a lot of people will put their best foot forward online and everything looks perfect in their world so we're striving to be perfect in all aspects of ours as well. But sometimes you just have to give yourself a break and accept that sometimes good is good enough and getting to perfection may burn you out, uh, which, is, which is a long-term outcome that you don't want. I like this one too, stop saying you are just lucky, start saying you are good. Interestingly, this per the person who said this uh, did not grow up in Ireland. I think sometimes in Ireland we have this thing of like, if somebody gives us a compliment, says, oh, you did really well there, we're like, oh, it wasn't really me, it was the whole team, or oh, just right place, right time. Um, you know, and, and instead of, of, of thinking that yourself, you should start thinking, actually, I did do a good job there, or I got that job because people think I'm able to do it, or you know, I, just building up your confidence about what you can do. Um, be pragmatic about reaching goals, forge ahead, say no wisely, that's a good one, and let others in. So sometimes when you, when you want to reach a goal, you have to be focused on it, and that sometimes means you need to say no to things that might deflect you from that goal or take up your, the, the finite resource that is the time in your day. Um, and to let others in as well. Uh, one, of the, one of the leaders um, spoke about how when she got to a certain certain level in her career, she couldn't be the expert on everything. So she had to bring in uh, people who knew about kind of subfields in her organisation and, and, and across her, her world um, and bring in really good people whom she could trust to advise her on those things. So letting others in is important and it empowers people in an organisation as well. When the door open, goes in, does what it says in the tin, opportunity knocks and off you go. Um, I thought this one was really interesting. You may be part of the problem, be open to that. So there's a degree of vulnerability in there, but it's one that's very honest. And I think sometimes we can find it hard to see if we are doing something that's causing a problem in an organization or for a project. And, uh, and having the sort of the, the, the open conversations, the difficult conversations sometimes with people um, to find out, well, where does, where does the source of the problem lie? And realizing that you may need to change something you're doing as well. When faced with a new situation, challenge or opportunity, look for the familiar and hold on to that as you learn. So um, yes, the person who said this had been thrown into some very interesting situations around the world. And uh, she always said that no matter where she, where she landed, where her feet landed on the planet, you know, she could just find something, something that looked a bit familiar. And, and she would hold on to that sliver of familiarity and, and use it as kind of an anchor or a basis as she got to know the rest of the environment. And, and she found that very helpful. So what I learned from the project so far is that experience is a great teacher and that it is important to share and pass on what you've learned um, because that's a, a, a generous thing to do for other people and it may make all the difference to someone, that one sentence you, you say to someone. I learned that insights and advice don't need to be complicated and often, often the simplest tip or analogy is actually the most useful. You know, um, some of the, the people who were giving the masterclasses told great stories about what they were, what they were doing in their, in, in their career and, and how they overcame hurdles, and that really resonated with people, but, and they were very simple. Um, also, for me, I found if you create a comfortable environment, everyone can learn. Because when people were coming in to Academy House, you know, it's, it's an absolutely beautiful setting, but it's also, it's very august. There are a lot of, you know, kind of severe looking books up there and you might feel a little intimidated if you weren't used to it. Um, and maybe you are sitting around the table with somebody you've admired for years. Maybe you've, you've wanted to meet them for years. Um, so as a moderator, I really tried to break the ice and make it a structured but informal environment and tried to make sure that everybody could have a speak, you know, even if they were a little shy in doing so. And the same thing when we went online, just making sure that everybody could, uh, could, could talk either on camera or if they wanted to put questions into the chat function. I also learned that people appreciate humility and honesty, and I think um, that is something that we're seeing increasingly in leadership now in, in the world, um, well, some parts of leadership in the world, um, but uh, I think it, it helps to make much more open uh, work environments and um, where everybody, everybody can hopefully advance fairly. So thank you very much for listening, and um, I will finish up there. Thank you.
handwritten, beautiful handwritten notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, thank you very much for coming. I feel like Norma Desmond with these lights. It's <laughs> I'm ready for my close-up. Um, so I'm Liz Evers, um, and this is my colleague, Dr. Neve. Uh, just Dr. Neve, just Dr. Dr. Neve Gallagher. Yeah. And uh, we're from the Dictionary of Irish Biography. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the characters um, from our recent uh, book, um, Irish Lives in America, under the theme of uh, storytelling through biography. Um, so I suppose, we want to just illustrate how some of the, the people that we chose help to tell the story of the Irish immigrant experience in America and also uh, the contribution for good and sometimes for bad of, uh, of the Irish in America. So first I'd just like to give a little bit of context about the dictionary. Now some of you may have already been out and spoken to some of my colleagues in the council room at the front of the building, um, but just in case you didn't. Uh, so. The Dictionary of Irish Biography is Ireland's national biographical dictionary and it has currently nearly 11,000 entries in it and they're produced by over 700 contributors um, and it ranges from the earliest times right up to contemporary figures, 21st century figures and it's all freely available um, online since last year when Micheál Martin launched it in March 2021 um, and 11 uh, volumes have been also published. Um, so if anyone has any questions about the dictionary or wants to peruse it, um, we can visit us out in the council room uh, at any stage during the day. So I'm going to hand over to Neve now, who's going to introduce the book and one of the first characters in it. Thanks, Liz, and good morning, everyone. So as Liz has told you, the Dictionary of Irish Biography tells the story of our island through the biographies of prominent Irish men and women. Of the almost 11,000 lives featured in the dictionary, more than 400 uh, were individuals who died in America, most of whom were born in Ireland. When we were putting together our book, Irish Lives in America, um, we wanted to bring together a selection of biographies that gave a sense of the significant impact of the Irish in America. In the field of politics and administration, for example, Irish immigrants were governors and military leaders. They were signatories to the Declaration of Independence. They were framers of the Constitution and even presidents. 23 of America's 46 presidents claim Irish ancestry. And in the War for America's Independence, 11 of the 56 delegates of the First Continental Congress were born in Ireland, and nine of the signatories to the Declaration of Independence were of Irish birth or ancestry. Our book spans 300 years. The earliest life featured is that of James Logan, a public servant and scientist who was born in 1674. And the latest biography we included is actress Maureen O'Hara, who only died in 2015. And with more than 400 lives to choose from, we had to apply a strict sense of criteria as to who we uh, included in the book. So our biographies, their lives, they had to be born in Ireland. They had to contribute significantly, not just to Ireland, but to American history. And of course, they had to be interesting. Across nine themed chapters, the book features individuals from a broad field of endeavor from political figures to artists and, and entertainers, and from soldiers and scientists to slaveholders and abolitionists. We wanted to include individuals who shaped American history in many ways. The architect who designed the White House, the scientist who invented the submarine, the bookseller who founded the oldest publishing house in America, or the computer programmer who helped invent coding, to name but a few. We also wanted to have a strong female representation and the 18 women we included hopefully captured the diversity uh, of experience of immigration from the perspective of both men and women. In politics, some, such as William Johnson, born in Meath in 1715, walked a fine line between colonial administration and respect for indigenous tribes. Others, such as John Morrissey, became almost legendary figures. Morrissey, nicknamed Old Smoke because of an injury he sustained, was a prize fighter who fought street battles against Bill the Butcher of gangs of New York fame. He entered politics and founded America's oldest major sports venue, the racetrack at Saratoga. 
The Irish also played a significant part in the War of Independence. The first two recorded con combat deaths in the Civil War were Irish men, and in total more than 150,000 Irish fought on the Union side. And, although fewer fought on the Confederate side, there were at least six Confederate generals uh, of Irish birth, and units such as the Charleston Irish Volunteers uh, were famed. Regrettably, many Irish supported the institution of slavery from the start, and one such figure was Pierce Butler. And I wrote Pierce, and normally you become very fond of the people you're writing about. In this instance, I loathed him, and I couldn't wait to get him finished. Pierce was born in Ballon Temple House, County Carlow, in 1744. He was the third son of Sir Richard Butler, and therefore not likely to inherit any lands or titles. In time-honoured fashion as a younger son, then, he entered the army, to our modern perspective at the shockingly young age of 11, and by the age of 14 was a full lieutenant commanding troops at the siege of Louisbourg in French Canada. When he married a wealthy South Carolina heiress, he inherited vast tracts of lands and slaves and switched sides to fighting the British. As one of the delegates to the Philadelphia Con uh, Convention in 1787, Butler looked after his own wealth and interests by insisting on the inclusion of a runaway slave clause, which declared that all runaway slaves had to be returned, even if they crossed state lines into a free state. Having served three terms in the Senate, sadly, he died one of the wealthiest men in America. Thanks, Steve. And uh, staying on the theme of wealthy men in America, um, we have Alexander Brown, and he was one of America's first millionaires. And I suppose we've chosen him today just to kind of, it's, it's a common misconception, certainly one that I held um, of Irish emigrants, that they were homogeneously poor and um, that they had to, you know, pull themselves up by their bootstraps to achieve the, this mythological American dream. But same as Pierce Butler, um, Alexander Brown was actually, you know, quite well off when he emigrated to America in the first place. He was already a well-established um, linen dealer. And he went over and set up, um, he had a fleet, a merchant fleet. He set up a very um, successful import-export business. He was importing Irish linens, he was exporting tobacco and cotton, and read into that what you will as to how they were uh, acquired in the first place and then sold into the, the British market. Um, and he also established the country's very first private bank, which is still in existence today and also a merchant bank. So he was massively successful. He also established one of the earliest railroads. And so I suppose it's that thing of trying to, in the book we were trying to dispel the myth somewhat that there weren't, there was a lot of very well-heeled Irish people um, in America. Now certainly amongst the earlier wave of migrants. And so we have a, a section there which kind of is focused on um, people who were particularly successful in business. And so joining the likes of Alexander Brown, we also have another Alexander, uh, Alexander Turney Stewart, who was a pioneer of the department store. And he opened what was called his Marble Palace in New York in 1862, um, which was the largest purpose-built uh, department store in the world at the time. And again, he had a, a fairly good start um, already in terms of establishing his empire. He didn't pull himself up by his bootstraps by any means. Um, another interesting uh, person that we have who, again, was very successful and, and another Irish millionaire um, in America was uh, Richard Kyle Fox, who was a pioneer of tabloid journalism. And we have him to thank, really, for a lot of tabloid journalism that evolved from his National Police Gazette. Um, that was a 19th century publication, started in the mid-19th century. Well, he took over. Um, and it was known as the Bible of the Barber Shop. And he also, um, it had, you know, it was quite racy. And uh, lots of gory stories and uh, pictures of girls. And uh, he also contributed massively to the popularization of boxing. And so when he died in 1922, he was also fabulously wealthy. Um, but of course, this is just a sample of some of the diverse cast of Irish emigrants in America that are featured in this book and also in the, in the broader Dictionary of Irish Biography. Um, as Neve said, we had a lot to choose from. Um, but I'll hand over now to Neve, who's going to talk about a very different type of Irish emigrant. Um, I'll let you do that. So 
one of the most fun sections I found actually was the frontier section because I grew up watching westerns with my parents and I loved the Clint Eastwood. So I always had a vision of, you know, the, the poncho and the cheroot and the drawl. And in actual fact, um, what we discovered was there was an awful lot of Dundalk accents out in the West. Um, so American frontier history and legend has long been dominated by this lone, grizzled man leaving behind home and family to brave the undiscovered wilderness. And the real frontiers people were far more diverse. They were European and Native American, of African and Spanish descent, individuals and, of course, families. And our frontiers people reflect that wide diversity. We included Elizabeth Jackson, the mother of Andrew Jackson, who ventured behind enemy lines to rescue her sons. We had Mary Jemison, who lived among the Iroquois tribe and who documented her life there. Um, and we had John Wallace Crawford, who travelled with Wild Bill Hickok and gave us the Wild West show. But one of my favourite ones was a Wild West stereotype who actually existed. And he was Thomas uh, Brokenhand Fitzpatrick. He hailed from Cavan and is regarded as, regarded as one of the greatest mountain men who ever existed. And he was everything you might expect from the movies without the accent. He started as a fur trapper and then guided wagon trains that headed west. He was with Jebediah Smith when they opened up the overland route through the Rockies and he guided the first two wagons uh, to, the Pacific, to Pacific coast. Known as Broken Hand because, by the Native Americans because of a rifle accident that mangled his hand, he convened the largest ever Native American council and insisted on just and honest relations with them when he negotiated their treaty. So a really, really interesting man. Loved him. <laughs> um, and another very interesting man is John Philip Holland, which I'm uh, a name that a lot of you will be familiar with, and uh, a man from Clare who was the inventor of the submarine. Um, and we have him here to illustrate the contribution of Irish immigrants to the areas of um, science, technology, and medicine, which was um, considerable. Um, so he was born in Clare in 1841, and he became a maths teacher in Ireland, and he actually emigrated when he was in his 30s, um, and he settled in New Jersey. And he'd long been tinkering with the idea of creating this vessel that could be submerged. And he actually initially offered the patent for it to the US Navy in um, 1875. And they said, no, they actually declined it rather rudely. Um, so he ended up developing the vessel himself with funding from Clan the Gale. And the initial idea was that this would give the Irish revolutionaries the edge over the British Navy because they didn't really have many advantages. So at least this was one thing they might have. Um, so this helped him develop his early prototype and uh, it took many years and many prototypes before he was able to create a vessel that could stay submerged for any length of time. And then the US Navy caught wind of this and were very much on board around 1900 and uh, they commissioned a fleet. And then ironically that ended up, the plans were then sold to the British Navy. So they did end up with a submarine and Clan the Gale and the Irish revolutionaries did not. Um, I don't really, I'm not 100% sure how Holland felt about that. I'm sure he was glad to have just been able to do his work. Um, so other figures who are in the book who demonstrate that, you know, extensive contribution of Irish emigrants to uh, the fields of science, technology and medicine. Uh, Kay McNulty, who you alluded to, um, she was a computer programmer. She worked as a human computer during the Second World War, calculating um, ballistic missile trajectories. And then she was amongst the very first programmers of the ENIAC machine, which was the world's first digital um, general purpose electronic computer. And it was the size of, of a room, a huge room, massive thing. But obviously it was absolutely groundbreaking work. And that's why my laptop that I'm using here <laughs> exists. Um, so we also have Dr. John Crawford, who's in the book, and he's a much earlier figure. He was born in uh, 1746, but actually when you read about the work that he did, it seems now that like, it's kind of hard to believe that this work was happening at that time in the 18th and then into the early 19th century. So he was a pioneer of insect-borne um, disease, the theory of insect-borne disease, back when everyone believed that miasma was responsible for everything. Um, so he was quite a radical figure in that regard, and he was ridiculed as a consequence of suggesting that yellow fever was transmitted by insect bite and not swirling clouds in the air. 
Um, and he was also one of the first doctors to introduce the smallpox vaccine to America, which was, I think that was 1813. So it just seems crazy that vaccinations were happening like 200 years ago. Um, and he was very much a pioneer in that area as well. So I'll hand over to Neve again, who's going to talk about <laughs> Albert Cat. So obviously, by its very nature, the people that we include in the Dictionary of Irish Biography live extraordinary lives. They've done impressive and important things. So when we were writing the book, we wanted to include people who were chosen not because they were extraordinary, rather it was their very ordinariness, but the circumstances that surrounded them that made them that kind of extraordinary person. Margaret Hottery, for example, was orphaned, widowed, illiterate, and destitute. So certainly not an auspicious beginning, very different to the men that uh, Liz was talking about and yet she want, went on to become one of America's greatest philanthropists and had the first publicly erected statue to a woman erected to her in New Orleans. Uh, Cork woman and widow Mother Jones would be known to anybody who knows their union history. Uh, again a widow and founder of one of the greatest uh, union movements in America. Domestic servant Margaret Marr represents all the women who left Ireland to enter domestic service, uh, but her great contribution is the role she played in preserving the poetry of Emily Dickinson. A beloved uh, family domestic servant, she kept Emily's poetry, uh, went against her wishes um, and didn't have it destroyed, and that's why we enjoy her poetry today. While, of course, Annie Moore has been immortalised in a statue welcoming all immigrants that land at Ellis Island. One particular life that typifies this ordinary experience is Albert Cashier, who fought on the Union side in the Civil War and was commended for bravery under fire. Albert remained illiterate and poor throughout his life, but wore his uniform with pride on Veterans Day and was buried with military honours. What makes Albert unusual is that he was born Jenny Hodgers in Clotherhead, County Louth in 1843, but he lived his entire life in America as a man. When his secret was eventually discovered, many of his old army comrades rallied round to insist that Albert was entitled to a military pension. And when he was buried, he was buried in his full uniform and insisted that the name Albert was on the headstone. So that was Albert Cashier. Okay, so just going to conclude now with the glamorous portion um, of the people in the book. Um, so we have Carmel Snow here, who is, well, she's representing a few different things. I suppose the contribution of Irish immigrants in America and to the publishing industry in particular. So she um, was the editor of both Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. So she joined uh, Vogue as the editor in 1929 and then took over at Harper's in 1935. And among her credits are introducing uh, fashion designers Christian Dior and uh, Christabel Balenciaga to the American market, as well as the Irish designer uh, Sybil Connolly. And um, she also gave some, many young writers their first big breaks, including the likes of Truman Capote. Um, and she also fostered the work of other um, writers like uh, Frank O'Connor and Evelyn Waugh, amongst many, many others. Um, so she's kind of representative of this much broader cohort of uh, pioneers in publishing and literature. Um, another figure that comes to mind is Peter Fenlon Collier, who um, made a huge contribution quite a, in a, quite a subtle way. So he established this kind of very um, mass, pro mass production of books, basically. He produced 60 million books um, over a three decade period. And he invented the kind of buying books by installment plan, which meant that it opened up a market for, the, for classic literature to ordinary Americans for the first time. So people were able to have access to the kind of books that were very exclusive um, up until that period of time in the 18th and into the 19th century. So we have, we're very tight on time, and I think I've got a, a minute left, so last but not least, obviously, is Maureen O'Hara, who is the sort of, the, <laughs> the newest entry in the book. She died in 2015, but obviously she was born in, in 1920, and she's sort of emblematic 
of um, of all of the different Irish people who went over as entertainers and went over to Hollywood and elsewhere with obviously with mixed fortunes um, and other people who feature in the book are um, theatre actors and producers. Uh, we have Geraldine Fitzgerald, we have Mary Manning, we have the film director Rex Ingram who would be uh, famous for the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Um, we have sinner, uh, the singer, even, maybe the sinner, um, John McCormack, who is arguably the world's first pop star. Um, but O'Hara, obviously, is this iconic person who very much retained her Irish roots, um, perhaps to an exaggerated degree, um, and played into the fantasy of this Irish Catholic Colleen um, in her, in her best-known role, obviously, as Mary Kate Danaher in The Quiet Man. So we hope with this whistle stop uh, tour that we've gone a little way to showing how the, through the curation of biographies from the Dictionary of Irish Biography you can tell a broader story um, and in this case it's the story of Irish emigrants and all their diversity to America. So thank you very much. far to the front as you can because some of the slides have fairly small um, print on them and the better you can see them the better. Well, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. My name is Anthony Harvey. I'm the editor of the Dictionary of Medieval Latin from Celtic Sources, or DMLCS. And my colleague Joseph Flahev is the other member of our team and he's manning our stall out in the, the main library there. So during the rest of the day, you can talk to one or other of us there if you would like further elaboration on some of this material. So to give a bit of background, um, the DMLCS is conducted under the auspices of this academy and takes its place as one of a family of medieval Latin dictionary enterprises being conducted across Europe under a plan originally mooted by the International Union of Academies, or UAI. Each of these Latin enterprises has as its mission the detailed scientific analysis and interpretation of the Latin texts written within a particular geographical area. And in the case of our DMLCS, the relevant area consists of the territories that were Celtic speaking in the early Middle Ages. That is Ireland, the former Roman Britain, Brittany, Scotland, and the Isle of Man, as well as the monasteries that had been founded by Irish pilgrims as they traveled across most of the continent. The other projects in the Latin scheme are likewise mostly conducted under the auspices of national or quasi-national academies. And this photograph shows a volume from each of the participating projects, including ours, which is the, uh, the, the terracotta colored one there, um, as these were displayed in the Bavarian Academy of Sciences in Munich in 2012. And this map shows how in a mosaic-like way our projects between them cover nearly all the territory in which Latin was used in the Middle Ages, thus providing a key to understanding the thousand years of Western European history locked up in the documents that were penned in those times. Now, it's around now that one often encounters the question, why do we need all these different Latin dictionaries? Surely Latin, of all languages, has been sufficiently studied and codified over the centuries, and everyone is aware of large standard dictionaries of it that have been around for generations. 
Well, the answer is that the big Latin dictionaries that everyone knows about are at least mainly lexicons of the classical language, that of the Roman Empire. And not everyone realizes that when the formal structures of that empire fell apart in the early fifth century, its official language, Latin, continued with undiminished vitality as the everyday spoken tongue of the people across most of its territory. Far from going into a decline, Latin went on developing uh, naturally and in different ways in different places, eventually becoming the separate languages that we know as Spanish, French, Italian, and so on. But people didn't stop reading and writing during the millennium and a half that that transition took, and indeed the written Latin output of the period completely dwarfs the amount of material that had been composed during imperial times. Yet, standard Latin dictionaries deal only with the earlier classical period, while standard dictionaries of Spanish, French, etc. deal only with the modern tongues. Only in recent decades has an attempt been made to reckon systematically with the huge amount of documentation from the medieval period that lies between, namely by means of the European scheme that I'm talking about. And its mosaic-like makeup reflects the geographical diversification of the language itself. As the map shows, there are about 16 projects involved. Years or even decades of work have already gone into most of them, and a few are now complete. Some, like those being compiled in Spain, track the seamless development of their local vernaculars from something very like classical Latin down to something approaching the modern Romance tongues of their various areas, Castilian, Catalan, whatever. Others, like our own DMLCS project here, deal with a Latin that may never have been the everyday tongue of the regions they cover, but which nevertheless was a key medium by which the local medieval civilization enshrined itself for written transmission to posterity. And in respect of the territory covered by DMLCF specifically, our non-classical lexicon of Celtic Latinity has so far been published for letters A to H, and drafts have been completed, or nearly so, for all the remaining letters except the small letter O and the huge letter S. We have said that we'll finish it by 2025, which will place us in about the middle of the pack in terms of progress made by the various ventures in the European scheme. In the meantime, every few years, the editorial teams of the scheme meet for a colloquium, and this usually proves useful because we have so much in common. Indeed, we have a lot in common with dictionary projects generally, even when their subject matter isn't Latin at all, but a different language entirely. And that's because of the similarities methodologically. In particular, it's helpful to be able to compare notes with one another when something new comes up in terms of technique so as to avoid inefficiently reinventing the wheel. And if you're wondering in what context such new things can come up after all these years, the answer these days is digitization. All of the medieval Latin projects, as well as others, are now engaged in various forms of digitization, though we actually were the first to do so, so that's something we're rather proud of. The point is that issuing a dictionary, any dictionary, in digital form, potentially makes it enormously much more informative to the user than is the very same dictionary containing the same information when presented on paper. And in our own project, we're doing both, by the way. I don't think book versions will ever go out of use, but digitization can supplement them wonderfully. And here's how. Let us take a more or less randomly selected set of consecutive entries from the DMLCS dictionary. As with all dictionaries, the reason these particular entries are consecutive is, of course, the fact that they are alphabetically arranged. But if that is the reason for their sequencing, it follows that their definitions will come from all over the semantic range. As one can see, even just this set of a few consecutive Latin words, beginning with the letter A, manages to embody meanings as diverse as a joining together, combining or integrating, or to hook or catch, and words for the tide, for intercession, and for supportive. Now, let's say we're interested in a particular one of these, namely tide. If we want to find out what other Latin words mean a tide, a hard copy version of the dictionary won't help us. The words will be scattered around the alphabet, and we'd have to leaf through the whole dictionary to find them. 
But with the digital version, we can search on the definitions just as readily as on the Latin headwords. And searching on the English word tide in our dictionary duly produces this result. As one can see, the Latin headwords now begin with various letters of the alphabet because the organizing principle of the set has switched to the uh, definition and not the alphabetical sequence. And we've actually published this particular result on tides as a separate interpretative article, the information having originally been requested of us by a retired sea captain, not a Latinist at all. And this shows how digitally searching on definitions can be useful for people interested in a particular topic concept or entity. Now, something else that one can see varying between the entries that are united by referring to tides is, of course, the different sources from which the examples are drawn. In our usage, three-letter abbreviations refer to classes of texts where these are anonymous, so SCH means scholastic and THL means theological, and four-letter ones name identifiable authors. So we can see that writers in our corpus who refer to tides include the geographer Digwill, that's D-I-C-L, the Breton monk Billy, and others, including, perhaps most interestingly, the 7th century, the mysterious 7th century Irishman Virgilius Maro Grammaticus. As one can see, he coined the Latin word deundare to refer to the ebb of the tide. But what other words did he generate? Again, it would take us ages trawling through the paper dictionary to find out. But with a digital version, we can search on Virgilius's reference code, which as you see is VGLG, and here is part of the result. As can be seen, the headwords are spread widely through the alphabet, and the definitions range equally widely in semantic terms. This author made up a great many words, so this is just a selection. From, even from this one screenful, he can be seen to have coined an adjective meaning concise and an adverb for long ago, together with new nouns for things as disparate as famous people, an exposition, a meal, and the making of riddles or puzzles, as well as generating a verb meaning to arm with a spear and Virgilius's tide word is merely one of these. By searching on the VGLG code in this way and, and using all the data from the result, our project has in fact been able to publish a fairly thorough scholarly spin-off article on precisely the word coinings of Virgilius Maro Grammaticus, as well as various separate analyses of the usages of other named authors by means of searching on the specific codes that we had allocated to them. And this shows how digitally searching on authors can be useful for people interested in literary history. Let's go back to another set of consecutive words from the DMLCS dictionary. As before, these are consecutive because of being arranged according to how they're spelt, and they mean all sorts of different things. But this time, let's concentrate on something else that varies about them, namely the geographical areas from which the examples in the texts are derived. This information is embodied in the codes we use to key the references. And you can see here A, that refers to the former Roman Britain, C, to works by Irish monks on the continent, E, to Scotland, and D, to Brittany. And here we see a new word for a sister being used by a Breton monk. But how many other coinings in Celtic Latinity were generated by, specifically, Bretons. Again, having a digital version of the dictionary means we can search on geographical codes, and so here is part of what we get if we use the D code to look for Brittany specifically. Again, the Latin headwords, though of course still in alphabetical order, are no longer sequential. And again, the meanings are of all different kinds. By using a similar search to identify words coined in Wales and to compare them with Latin words invented by the Irish, I have in fact been able to publish an assessment of the nature of the language in the two countries in the early Middle Ages. 
It was striking how different it appears to have been, and this prompted a surprising, but I hope convincingly documented, conclusion about the longevity of Latin in Celtic Britain after the Roman withdrawal. It may have lasted up to Norman times, a point of great interest to national and social historians of Wales. And this shows how digitally searching on geographical provenance can be useful for people interested in comparative philology. But back to Brittany. You'll see that one of the Latin words coined there means white-fronted geese. The context shows that the term is being used precisely here in what we can classify as a specifically zoological sense. Well, you can guess where we're going next. A lot of revealing light can be cast upon the particular interests or concerns of any society by looking to see what technical terms it has felt necessary to coin. Embedded in the entries of our dictionary are 14 distinct labels to flag such specialist vocabulary. The zoological label that you see here is just one of them, the others including botanical, musical, medical, philosophical, and so on and the results of this are potentially of great value to scholars of any of the disciplines concerned. And this shows how digitally searching on technical labels can be useful for people interested in particular areas of specialization, the very theme that informed the Munich Colloquium of Editors at which that display of dictionaries was, was put forward. As an example, taking the zoological label specifically and searching for that across all areas of our dictionary gives this result. Again, the entries come from across the alphabet as far as we have compiled it. And as far as the meanings are concerned, they range across the whole bird and animal kingdom, from slow worms to sparrowhawks and from periwinkles to stoats. The search even reveals a contrastive cross-reference between different kinds of geese. So natural historians, please take note. Now, as I said before, the searching opportunities I've shown are in principle applicable to any systematic dictionary of any language, because hardworking lexicographers will already have packed all the information into the entries in much the same way that we have. The value that systematic digitization has added to our own dictionary and can do to others is the ability to retrieve it all again for any number of purposes in a systematic, comprehensive, and coherent way. So, thank you very much. And just to say, a published uh, version of, of what you have just heard, and uh, at greater length as well, is, is available free from our store out there. It's the dark blue book clip. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's Mr. Charles, no Charlie Dillon, and Tanya Matarum, Agus Tame Agarhor, Er and Tunskadal Shaw, Estiagin, Folklore Staru Nagaliga, or FNG, as it has become known in shorthand over the years. Um, and I'd like to use the time that I have today, uh, first of all, to thank the organisers, uh, especially Jane and the other um, organizing team for today. It's a great to have the opportunity to speak about what we do on a daily basis and, um, and share some of our excitement about it, I hope, and perhaps infect you all with some of the, the same excitement. Um, Folklore Staru Nagailiga is only the current iteration of a research project which I think can claim to be the longest continuous 
research activity in the Academy, which is the pursuit of an authoritative, comprehensive uh, dictionary for the Irish language. Uh, it has been going on in some form since around 1880, and the first person to, uh, appointed to, to work on that um, was Atkinson in 1880, and there have been numerous iterations, efforts, redoubling of efforts in the interim period until the current period when uh, six of us are in involved in the FNG team. Um, our goal remains the same, a dictionary, but what we are particularly working on is one which deals with the period between 1600 and the present day. But today, I had chosen to use the time uh, to focus on what is the latest, the most recent um, output that we have from the Folklore Staril Nagailiga research effort, and that is our work, our recent work, published last year on the author Martin O'Kine. Um, so he's quite an enigmatic figure, and uh, it was great to have the opportunity to work on some of his original texts and manuscripts for the first time, and, uh, and publish a lot of unpublished material uh, from this, as I say, quite enigmatic and elusive figure. Um, so what I'm going to, to do is, I suppose, talk about the resource, talk about the preparation of the resource, the use and function of the new resource that we've made, and then allow you to go off and explore it for yourselves, along with the other resources that we have and which are being demonstrated and talked about uh, outside, as is in keeping with the approach of the other projects. So the, the basics around Martin O'Kine are that he was uh, a Gaeltacht writer, died in 1970, so we recently s s commemorated the 50th anniversary of his death. He was a writer of essays, of novels, and of short stories. He was a pioneering teacher, largely of Irish, and he ended his career as professor of Irish in Trinity College, Dublin. He was a proponent of social justice and of uh, a campaigner for civil rights, particularly rights for the people of his native Gaeltacht area. But it is for his preeminence as a writer of prose in Irish that he is perhaps most widely renowned, and his 1948 novel, Crane Kille, has been translated into 12 languages, um, and two English, you might be aware of, two English translations which, which came in the last 10 years, uh, commissioned separately, um, and uh, one of which I should mention especially was um, translated by Alan Titley, member of the Royal Irish Academy. Um, and these have given, I think, O'Kine renewed, I suppose, renewed his reputation, especially among a non-Irish speaking readership. Um, but unfortunately, inaccessibility is a tag and a term which has attached itself to O'Kine over the years. Um, many readers who are comfortable with other contemporary Gaeltacht authors reading their Irish, they have admitted to struggles in their reading of O'Kine. This is due, I suppose, to the unapologetically high register of O'Kine's prose, which sets him apart from most of his contemporaries. He was a writer with a breathtaking vocabulary, comfortably drawing on the language of folklore, song, and also more modern utilitarian terminology as well, but all the time rooted firmly in the Gaeltacht speech of the people where he himself grew up in Galway, just slightly west of Spidale, Spiddle. And I believe that, uh, uh, again, in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of his death, a statue has been unveiled there on the right-hand side of the road. So if you're going past, you should be able to locate his birthplace very readily. Returning to his vocabulary, much of it and much of the idiom and phraseology that he uses is peculiar, very peculiar to that dialect and, and indeed that sub-dialect of Galway Irish and is no longer, in this first half of the 21st century, commonly taught in schools nor in universities, nor is it to be heard indeed except among a particular generation and class of speaker within um, the, the, the particular area itself. In addition, the life depicted by O'Kine's language has in many respects disappeared due to the sweeping, well-documented socioeconomic changes which have swept across rural Ireland in the latter half of the 20th century. But 
Helpfully, access to Okine has been aided by new and different media in recent years. Notwithstanding the translations to English of his, of his novel, Crane Kille, um, there are ideas around translation which, and all translators will fundamentally point to the fact that they are an adaptation or an imitation of the original. But what we have tried to do in the preparation of our resource, Folklore Hein, we have tried to give people who have a standard of Irish which allows them to read Irish comfortably, access to this more, I suppose, rarefied register of Irish which we find in O'Kine. And I think that is perhaps the, 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 the most valuable educational function of our Folklore O'Kine that we've put out. We, we wish to give readers a key to unlock the idiom. We wished to give them a way to facilitate their study of O'Kine's manipulation of language. We also endeavour to give ling linguistic researchers, dialect researchers, access to this vast resource unpublished hitherto on the Galway dialect of Irish. So if we can have a look first at O'Kine's manuscript. Um, this is what, this is what uh, basically the source material, the raw source material which we, we, we dealt with. Um, and that is representative of over 1.1 million such words of handwritten text which O'Kine wrote uh, during a nine or 10 year period between the mid 30s and the mid 1940s. In this text, we find O'Kine ruminating at leisure on meanings and nuances of words and phrases in his dialect. We find paragraph long examples of usage alongside others which are short, pithy sentences, but all of which were crafted by O'Kine to exemplify the dialect and linguistic tradition in which he was steeped since birth and he put to such brilliant use in his works of prose literature. The original work itself, exemplified here, was intended for use in the comp compilation of a national Irish-English dictionary and it was drawn on heavily, in fact, for that purpose. So having compiled it, it was in a large, it was in a great sense commissioned um, by Angoum, who were, who were putting together the Irish English Dictionary. And as he sent in his manuscript, it was drawn upon and um, used heavily for the production of FGB, which is Folklore Gaelic of Berlin, 1977, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, so the manuscript itself found itself in the archives of Angoum, with other significant portions also in the National Archives and in Trinity College, Dublin. O'Kine worked on the text produced here. He worked on the text while he was a, a, an internee in the Curra and a prisoner in Arbor Hill, having been um, detained there for his membership of the IRA. And when we got hold of these papers, they were very much in a rather disordered format. They had, been, they had been left neglected for quite a period of time. So they were analyzed and edited by our team here in the Academy. And we made the decision to publish the dictionary in a digital format, a customized digital format, which would allow us to, um, to showcase the material and allow the, the best access to it. Um, for a lot of the reasons that Anthony has just outlined, that the, the ability to leverage the material in, in, in ways which would allow searchers to access it rather than just a, a, an alphabetical list of headwords. So this appeared last year and is available at the URL Folklore Hein, or O'Kine's Dictionary, uh, on, on the Academy website. And what we edited was just over half of the extant manuscript material, or 550,000 words. And we did this concentrating on the extremely uh, large letter D, which is what we, we based our, our last year's edition on. Um, so half of what O'Kine produced in his dictionary was 
descriptions of words beginning with the letter D. So we seized upon that, and in order to commemorate and tie in with the commemorations of the 50th anniversary of his death, we released um, just over half of what will be a full edition, which will, which will um, appear hopefully next year. Um, so we have 750 headwords or lexemes, which he defined beginning with the letter D, and within those, letter, within those words are 1,078 1, sense units, but the real figure is, is down below, because in defining 750 words, he gives us over 16,000 examples. And as I mentioned, some of those are quite short sentences, some are paragraphs, some are akin to short stories in themselves, some are hundreds of words long. So that, in, in, in that body of material is the real wealth of what this resource gives us access to. Um, a further advantage of the digital format, which Anthony didn't go into in the last talk, was the fact that you can, uh, as we were able to do, we were able to present this um, in multiple versions. So, first of all, the default edition, when you arrive into the website, which I think I can show you here, is that is the representation of the, the paper that we just saw. The head word is domni, to damn or condemn, and that is how it's laid out on the website itself. So first of all, readers can stick with the edition disp displayed here in default, which has been reordered by us with the language standardized, rendered into more um, uniform forms, um, more easily legible for those non-expert readers of Irish. Uh, we, with the, the click of a button or a mouse, you can switch to a, an edition in exactly the same format, which is fully aligned with the spelling of O'Kine's manuscript itself, if that's what you wish to see. And for those who wish to access the dictionary text exactly faithful, both linguistically and structurally to O'Kine's version, an original of his entire PDF, uh, in PDF format, is, uh, is available to read and analyse. So you can see, I think, from that, the outline of that layout that we've, we've reordered and changed the manuscript structure in order to, to be something more akin to what readers might expect from a modern dictionary. The headword, some linguistic information, other forms, the present tense, the verbal noun, and then in, in, in the larger blue font there, his definition. But as I say, under A, then we see the beginning of a long, long list of examples of how these words, how this word was used. And all created and crafted by O'Kine himself. Although in the fourth example there, you can see that he has taken an, an example of Domni, the verb, from uh, a folklore text, the colloquy of Oshin and Padraig, or I suppose, um, Fianaíocht poetry, Féche gur Domniú, Lénaf na Chúig Mlian, etc. So this customised platform, we think, is the perfect vehicle for the publication of O'Kine's huge and unwieldy work. The potential of a digital edition, referenced by Anthony, um, to cross-reference and allow searches of the entire text, as well as searches based on alphabetically ordered headwords, is fully harnessed. An alphabetic list of headwords on the right, you can see on the screen, allows the browser to also um, be aided in his navigation of the dictionary. And that's another ambition we had, was to allow someone who's searching for a word and someone who's merely browsing the entire text in a readership sense, that they would feel equally at home on this platform. So, readers of O'Kine have been provided with what is an invaluable resource for gaining an understanding into his manipulation of his language. He has long, he has been given the epithet Ri and Ockel, or the word king, and in this dictionary we find, we find the king in his kingdom, engaging in deep dives into semantics and context, extrapolating and exemplifying abundantly, as, as can be seen, we are given insights into his creativity, uh, 
In crafting these usage examples, we find characters, scenes, speeches, and settings, which can be found again in his short stories and in his novels. And bearing in mind that Crane which appeared two years after the completion of this, the narrative of the novel Crane is driven almost entirely by speech rather than a, a traditional narrative style. So the potential of a dictionary of that self-same speech to give us new insights into the crafting and the design of the novel is, I think, more than apparent. Some time ago, as we embraced lockdown back in March 2020, I wrote a blog post on the nature of hermits and hermitage going back into the Irish tradition, right back to the, I suppose, the coining of the word he who, ha he who had taken himself away from the people, and which gives us the modern Irish, of course, Ji Hravach, hermit. And I looked at O'Kain's um, definition of the word Ji Hravach, and in it, you find a superb example, not only of O'Kain's style of lexicography, but also how words gather, dispense with, and develop different meanings over the period of generations. So if we look at his treatment of the word goror, or the word jihravach, um, we see that goror is almost a, a thesaurus style here, where he begins to um, list, I suppose, euphemisms for jihravach, which allow us to gain an insight into what jihravach meant to him. And uh, I translated it back then for the purposes of the blog post, and I thought I'd just reproduce it here. Um, so jihravach, formerly hermit, of course, but in O'Kain's dialect, someone who can only sit by the fire, a pitiful type, a puny, unfortunate person, a little article, someone wasted away, a tiny creature, a person or animal stricken by ill fortune, by cold, by illness or other, a person, animal or thing without substance, a shrunken thing, an orphan, or a person in a bad way. So much removed, in fact, from the original idea of the religious jihravach and uh, taking on the the sense of something diminished or diminutive or, or, as I say, in a bad way. And you get the sense, of, I say, of his breathtaking vocabulary in just the list of alternatives that he provides, thesaurus, thesaurus style for Jihravach. Goror, Jil Thrua, Dora Don Donna, Fri Jorin, Fehitech, Sheikla, Dinya no Behiach at the Antoka and Nua Segavga, Rik Fuacht, Ik Chinyas Noele, Dinya Behiach no Rodgan in Tiger, Kropach, Dilachta, no Dinya Velfaka, Ravarier Geir. So, I suppose you can get a sense there of the time, effort, and I suppose joy and enthusiasm that O'Kine brought to the task of creating this dictionary. So we very much hope that the provision of this resource proves to be of use in propelling forward the study of O'Kine into the future. Um, the publication of the resource goes to the heart of the mission of FNG, of Folklore Styro na Gaelica, which is to provide access to an authoritative account of the meaning and the usage of Irish words right throughout the modern period. Where this goal is in harmony with the provision of infrastructure, digital infrastructure, which allows scholars to gain new insights into the works of a Gaeltacht author such as Martin O'Kine, we are indeed doubly proud. So, Folklore Echine takes its place alongside the other research tools in, uh, in what is becoming a, a suite of research tools that we have created in the last, I think, nine years. Um, the corpus of historical Irish containing over access, searchable access to over 3,000 texts, which was, is being demoed at various intervals during the day outside in the library. Our searchable database of the Gaelic Journal, published between 1882 and 1909, and our dictionary of what we become known as hidden words based on the dialect collection in, um, which was funded by the IRC and completed by uh, colleagues here in 2014. Um, so in a sense to tie things up, the words that we see around, Tishach and Gaal, Uyir and the other beautifully displayed words from the, the History of Ireland and Hidden Words Project, right up to um, Corpus 
Fuckler Hine, Corpus, Nagailiga, Irish Law, Nagailiga, and these innovative, I suppose, cutting edge digital formats which are being brought to Irish lexicography here in the Academy. Um, I think they're tremendous bookends for what has happened here in the past almost 150 years, where an intergenerational engagement with Irish lexicography has led to, you know, lasting monuments to, to academy research and something that the academy has been and I, I hope will be continue, continue to, be, to be known for and renowned for. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Claire Lanigan and I am a digital archivist at the Digital Repository of Ireland and I'm also the archivist and coordinator for a project called Archiving Reproductive Health at uh, DRI. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about both DRI and this project for the next little while. So for anyone who's not familiar, uh, the Digital Repository of Ireland is a national digital repository for Ireland's humanities, social sciences and cultural heritage data. Uh, this means that material is, can be looked at online through our website, dri.ie, but it's also preserved long-term using a system of um, federated storage servers and bespoke software. So this means that this digital material, some of it is digitized, so it's material that was obviously some kind of archival object uh, that has been made into a digital version, like a scan or an image or sometimes it's material that was created digitally um, in you know, more recent times. And in all those categories, the material is preserved in the DRI in um, open source and accessible formats. And it's available in the long term through the website and also in uh, backup storage. And we also make this stuff uh, available on open licenses to enable open research and open science, which is a big part of DRI's mission. So it's publicly funded and we have um, accreditation called Core Trust Seal, which is uh, accreditation that's given to repositories that have this capacity for long-term digital preservation. And I was saying it's open, committed to open access and fair data, fair meaning uh, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, which is a key premise for open science. Uh, as I was saying, anyone can have a look at most of the collections on the repository. Some uh, of them, the access is restricted to researchers and educators only, but the vast majority are available for anyone to look at, and all data sets are issued with data site digital object identifiers, or DOIs. So they can all be cited, and there's actually a cite button that you can use if you want to just copy a cite, a citation. And all, um, as many objects in the repository as possible are issued with Creative Commons attribution licenses, which means that they can be reused freely, but uh, as long as the creator is attributed. And on that note, I should mention that the uh, owner of the material, so the organization that deposits it in DRI, be it so, like the National Museum, Royal Irish Academy, uh, local authorities, project-based uh, material, they all retain their ownership of the material. It's uh, stewarded and looked after by DRI, but we don't actually own it. So if someone deposits their material in DRI, it doesn't mean that they're giving it up to anything. It's just preserving it for the long term. And they can still use it for other purposes on their own institutional platforms if they want. And the metadata, the, the, the information that's used to describe each digital object, is always available on a Creative Commons license and most of the, of the collections in the repository are available under the same terms. So Archiving Reproductive Health is a project funded by Wellcome, the same entity as the Wellcome Trust, uh, and it is working to provide long-term preservation and ac access uh, to many at-risk digital archives generated by grassroots women's reproductive health movements uh, during and before the campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment in Ireland. This, was, this funding area is part of uh, Wellcome's remit under health archiving, which they provide uh, 
grants to, to different bodies for working in this area. So it's about um, activist groups, but also it's about work done by medics and um, other kinds of campaigners. Um, so the, um, the aim of the project, as I was saying, is to provide long-term preservation and access to uh, these at-risk digital archives. The preservation and publication of these collections adds significantly to our understanding of these movements and access to reproductive health care in Ireland in the later half of the 20th century and 21st century. So the project allows for preservation of fragile digital content, but it makes way for further research developments in the field. I'm sure most people are aware of the context, but just briefly, um, in 2019, the, uh, in 2018, sorry, the Irish public voted in a referendum to repeal the Eighth Amendment from the Irish Constitution. This meant that the Irish government was able to pass legislation enabling elective abortion care in Ireland for the first time in the nation's history. So uh, in archiving reproductive health, we work with uh, stakeholder organizations uh, that we, so at the start of the project, we reached out to a, a wide range of organizations and uh, some of them were keen to work with us and so we, we set up a kind of a partnership. So basically, we, uh, they have been donating their digital records, they, which they have, to uh, DRI to preserve in the repository as part of this project. So some of these um, organizations you can see there, it's Together for Yes, there's the, which was the main campaign for a yes vote. There's um, Terminations for Medical Reasons Ireland, Coalition to Repeal the Eighth, the Abortion Rights Campaign, and also In Her Shoes, which was a popular Facebook page on which people shared stories of their experiences of medical care or the lack of same under the Eighth Amendment uh, anonymously. And some of these stories we've been able to preserve on the repository. We also have quite a lot of research data in this, collection, in this collection, and we're adding more. So uh, some of it includes oral history interviews with medics uh, uh, active in Ireland over the last 40 years, uh, and um, uh, other um, activist or kind of uh, campaign groups. And then also we have oral, hist oral history interviews with groups such as Real Productive Justice, Gender and Disabilities, a disability rights organization based out of NUI Galway. And we also have uh, interviews with several women's rights activists over the years that were carried out by authors Linda Connolly and Mary Muldowney. A number of these interviews are audio and text files, and they date back to as far as the 1980s in some cases. So uh, we've published collections showcasing work from the stakeholder organizations that I mentioned. Uh, and a, a number of research data sets. So these collections include, but they're, they're not limited to, um, photographs, videos, and design assets from Marches for Choice that were organized by the abortion rights campaign in um, the years between 2013 and to the present. Design assets, press materials, and administrative documents from the same stakeholder organizations. So these include uh, reports submitted to UN committees, uh, various um, reports submitted to the Citizens' Assembly on the repeal of the Eighth Amendment, which was active in 2017, and several other in, uh, internal or strategy documents that were published as well. Um, these also... Um, sorry, excuse me a moment. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, the research data includes, as I was mentioning, oral history interviews with medics and campaigners um, and various other uh, people. Uh, and uh, some of the organizations that I mentioned before that have submitted research data include Real Productive Justice, uh, the Irish Qualitative Data Archive, which is a member of DRI and a founding member of DRI, and a number of individual researchers who volunteered, who got in touch with us and asked if we would be interested in their data sets, and we were, so we have deposited a number of material. Another thing that we have done as part of this project is set up a stakeholder advisory forum. So this forum consists of representatives of each of the organizations whose data is collected and ingested as part of this project. The aim of the forum is for those of us working on the project to get feedback from stakeholders about the, um, the project and the digital collections that we're creating. So the idea is, is that we want to hear from people who uh, represent both the stakeholder organizations and also individuals who um, work in the, in the area of ethics of research data preservation and um, the, the niceties and the precision of um, researching or preserving data that contains sensitive material. 
So we wanted to ensure that we are collecting and archiving this material in the best way possible, and we felt that people involved with the organizations or who were experts in the field were best placed to um, give us this feedback. So we held a stakeholder advisory forum meeting back in April, and we got a lot of useful feedback, especially on some of the ethical questions around archiving the uh, In Her Shoe stories, which uh, led to some uh, decisions about how, how available we were going to make that material. And uh, we're also going to be having another meeting of that forum uh, in the next few months, and our uh, forum members are listed on uh, the DRI website under Archive and Reproductive Health. Uh, so the project was recently a winner of a Digital Preservation Award for, um, in the category of Safeguarding the Digital Legacy. These are awards that are awarded by the Digital Preservation Coalition every two years, and so they recognize uh, the, the significant contributions to sustainable future for digital collections. So any work or project or endeavor that is increasing access or uh, enabling greater preservation of at-risk digital collections are recognized by the, oh, thank you, <laughs> recognized by the, um, the DPC in this award. Uh, so as you can see, uh, that is myself and uh, Lorraine Grimes, who is the other archivist on this project, uh, were in Glasgow for the iPres conference and we were very surprised to win, but very, very pleased. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and if you want to look at the award, it's on the DRI table out the front, beside, beside the bowl of sweets, which we've been using to lure people. <laughs> So that is a brief uh, summary of the overview of the Archiving Reproductive Health Project, but it is currently ongoing and it will be um, going on until the end of next year. Uh, the next milestone we have is a public collection day. So the idea behind this is that we do a call out to members of the public to present um, to, to kind of submit an application for uh, ephemera that they may have, that they want to have, uh, they'd like to see digitized. So that can be things like leaflets or it can be like material related to a local group or a canvassing organization. And uh, then we will, um, after going through a certain criteria, we will invite a certain amount of people to uh, a public collection day in uh, next March. And then that material will be digitized on site on the day and then the originals return to the people who brought them, and then the digitized material will form part of a, another collection in this uh, Archiving Reproductive Health project. So that's open to anyone who, ha who was um, in any way involved in both the um, campaign in 2018 or whose experience covers this whole area of reproductive health over the last uh, 30 or 40 years to bring material up. Uh, while we won't be able to digitize large amounts of material, we definitely will be able to do like small cross sections. So we're hoping to really enhance and broaden the range of the collection because the initial part has been limited by the organizations that wanted to work with us. So um, hopefully if we open it up to the public, we'll get a, a broader range of organizations that might not have, or uh, material that might not have come directly from organizations, but members of the public might be happy to bring along and add to our collection. So we're going to be expanding our collection with some interesting new types of material. I'm currently in talks with um, a podcast, uh, a podcast that was created last year about the uh, repeal referendum, which is very useful because it contains interviews with a number of key activists, some of whom are represented already in the collection, some of whom aren't. And it also gives a very useful kind of summary of the entire history. So uh, we are working to preserve those podcasts as, as audio files in the repository for the long term. And we are also publishing project documentation. So we already have our research protocol and our ethics protocol published. They're openly available for anyone to, to see. And we are going to be publishing a technical report and we're, um, an overall project report talking through our various findings and how we progressed and where we, where we uh, did well and where we struggled and you know, various different things like that. And then also um, early next year, we're working on a public document which will be a guide for small groups, don't have to be related to this field of research, they could be any kind of group who wish to learn a bit about the basics of archiving their both physical and digital material. So it's basically going to be like archiving guide for community groups. So that's one of the, um, the outcomes that we want to present as part of this project. Um, so that will be published early next year. And then the collections that I've just showed you or spoken about or will be added to as we go along. So each uh, collection under each organization will have more material added to it. Um, uh, and the, collect the material that's already in there expanded and the cataloging um, made richer and more informative. So as we go, it'll become more um, 
rich with time. As I was saying earlier about uh, DRI's open licensing policy, the vast majority of the collections relating to archive and reproductive health are licensed under Creative Commons attribution license, so they are freely available for anyone to download and use. Uh, some material is restricted to um, teachers and educators. Uh, that's, uh, the reasoning for that is outlined in our ethics protocol, but the vast majority of it is openly available to all the organizations have been happy to um, license them for reuse under those terms. So that's really an overall summary. And uh, if anyone wants to find out any more, there is a URL there, and that contains all the information about uh, all the collections we have so far, the background to the project, all our documentation, all our protocols, bibliographies, everything we're working on. So if you're interested, do feel free to visit that or get in touch. Thank you very much. Yeah, can everyone hear me now? Wonderful, thank you. Hiya. Um, so my name is Ashling Roach. I'm a program manager here with the Royal Irish Academy, and I pro pro project coordinate the Grange Gorman Histories project. So um, this afternoon, I just want to, in this presentation, introduce this project of research and shared discovery, and share some of the detail of the mission, the vision, the values of the project, um, some of our program deliveries to date, uh, the impact of that work and an introduction to some of the activities for the next phase of the project between 22 and 25. Um, so, just to... So, Grange Gorman Histories is a public history project. And a public history project is a history project that exists beyond the realms of traditional academia, uh, conscious saying that, of course, in the Royal Irish Academy. But it is a public history project of the Dublin City Council, Grange Gorman Development Agency, the Health Service Executive, local communities, the National Archives, Royal Irish Academy, 
and TU Dublin. So it's quite a considerable collaboration of uh, interests in this particular project. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Grange Gorman, Grange Gorman is on Dublin's north side. Uh, it is a 73 acre site between Stony Batter and Fibsborough, uh, just south of the canal and north of the Liffey. So it's quite close to the city centre uh, and an area with an extraordinary history. Um, the, the site over the past 250 years has been the location of a workhouse, a prison and a very large psychiatric facility, most recently known as St. Brendan's Hospital. But that site is currently being redeveloped as a health and education campus for the HSE, TU Dublin and the local community. So the project was formed back in 2019 and in June of 2020 we launched our foundation document, uh, which we did online of course because if you recall in June of 2020 we were at the height of rolling lockdowns and this uh, foundation document is available on our website and that shares amongst other things the mission, vision, values and the programme of the project. So the mission of the project is very simple. Uh, we want to uncover, catalogue and commemorate the history of Grange Gorman. And we have very deliberately chosen a title of Grange Gorman Histories because there are so many histories associated with this one particular area. And all of those histories require attention. All of those histories um, require uh, uncovering and cataloguing and commemoration. The vision of the project then um, is about the multifaceted the histories and the Grange Gorman area and the, the creation of an ambitious programme which uh, we have already started to deliver and have plans to deliver more over the next couple of years that will be a benefit locally, nationally and internationally. Given that the project involves examining histories that are challenging, histories of um, the treatment of people with mental illness, the treatment of people with intellectual disability, uh, histories of confinement, and incarceration. Um, these are all challenging histories and as a result a lot of consideration went into the values and how we would approach a programme to uncover, catalogue and commemorate those histories. So our intention is to be comprehensive in our histories approach, um, acknowledging the nature of the past and the nature of our past as a, as a, as a, as a society but in particular to help to destigmatise mental illness and our institutional attitudes to institutional confinement in this country and elsewhere. There are, without doubt, distressing elements to these histories and it is very important that every approach we take and uh, every piece that we programme acknowledges that distress. That distress can be directly impacting it can be as a result of peripheral impact and it can be as a result of association. So it's important that that is core to how we approach the project. You know, to do a project like this, you need to think about, well, why would you do it? And then ultimately it is to impact and to have a transformative effect to make, create a better society. Um, of course, accessibility is a key element. And finally, in stimulating active research, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, and opening minds to education to learn more about these very difficult topics and difficult histories. So the oversight and management of the project is uh, with the Grange Gorman Histories um, Expert Working Group. And this is the working group. There are representatives here from all of the founding partners. Uh, and this is a very dedicated group. And I can see our chair here is with us today, uh, Dr. Philip Cohn. And uh, this is a very dedicated, hardworking group of people who have put together an extraordinary program and who are very heavily involved in the whole delivery of the project. So I mentioned earlier that we launched our foundation back document back in June of 2020, and that document is on our website, grangegormanhistories.ie. And in that pro programme, we included the implementation plan, our programme of activities. That programme obviously was conceived in a pre-COVID world, uh, where we thought everything was going to be in person, and it was going to be a very person-based and person-centred approach. So we had to adapt, and we have put most of the programme to date online. So if you are brand new to Grange Gorman Histories, Almost every element of the project to date is available on our website, so you can catch up very quickly now. Uh, we most recently had an in-person event on Culture Night with the walking tours, and it was a real privilege, actually, to be part of that and to, to see people come along for that. But the implementation plan is broken down to three key pathways, people, places, and practices. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that plan in those contexts. So 
here are just a list really of some of the kind of projects and elements that we've been working on for the past couple of years. Um, and I wanted to highlight one or two, particularly Grange Gorman Lives, because this is a very neat little element of the project. So while we were in lockdown, of course, access to the archive from Grange Gorman in the National Archives, which is an extraordinary archive and an extraordinary record of social history in Ireland, um, not just Dublin, but Ireland. Of course, it was in the archives and we couldn't access it. So we needed to find sources that were available to us. And Ruth Hegarty came up with the great idea that we should link in with our own colleagues here in the Academy in the Dictionary of Irish Biography and source lives, autobiographies of people who were influenced or who, who were influenced or influenced the life in life in Grange Gorman. And as a result, we have a series of biographies of individuals who at some point in their lives may have transitioned through Grange Gorman or may have found themselves incarcerated in Grange Gorman, or were born in Grange Gorman and went on to live remarkable lives and make an impact on their society. So there's a really interesting catalogue of lives, uh, well worth a look, and some that will raise an eyebrow because you didn't realise there was a link uh, to Grange Gorman. Uh, our oral history project, this is our jewel in our crown. Um, we want to record recollections um, of life in Grange Gorman. Uh, so we are currently working with the former staff members from St. Brendan's Hospital to begin recording interviews with them uh, to collect their recollections uh, of what life was like in the hospital. So they, they, it's, a, it's a very interesting element of the histories and an interesting element of gathering histories. Our plan ultimately is that those recordings will live on the Digital Repository Ireland, also a project of the Academy, uh, where they will be accessible for future research. Um, the commissioning research and rela relating to life in Grange Gorman, so we have a, a series called Exploring Grange Gorman, which is a series of online essays where we have commissioned historians to do research on specific elements of histories of Grange Gorman. Uh, these histories are intended to be kind of introductory, uh, the key element being the bibliography at the bottom and the encouragement, that last value of stimulating active research to encourage people to go seek out those primary sources and learn more. In terms of the places of Grange Gorman, there's quite a lot of pieces here that are actually online. So the Festival of History piece from back in 2020, which has been viewed over 2,000 times, um, was a panel discussion uh, uh, relating back to the history of Grange Gorman's um, the site of the cholera hospital from 1832 and the history of epidemic on the site, relating that to the flu epidemic from 1919 and then on to, at that point, the uh, pandemic that we were all experiencing at that time. Um, it's a really interesting discussion. I highly recommend you have a look. We also have a wonderful, and this was a pure privilege for me personally, to meet uh, Ivor Brown, who was the last resident medical superintendent in Grange Gorman, who's now in his early 90s. Uh, and we interviewed Ivor, and that interview is also available on the website. And the Timepiece podcast, which is a really interesting history of the turret clock in the clock tower building, which turns out to be the oldest known flatbed turret clock mechanism in the world. And until it was discovered in the 1980s, at that point, it was thought that the oldest known flatbed uh, turret clock mechanism in the world was Big Ben in London. So we toppled that particular <laughs> historical fact. Um, the Hoardings Project, I want to highlight this one because this is a beautiful piece that um, Fidel Maslattery, our own graphic designer here, created a beautiful artwork that has been hand painted onto the construction hoardings in Grange Gorman. And it is a vision of uh, a reflection of the histories of Grange Gorman. So she has produced lovely images um, that are both dark and light. She has included lovely symbolic gestures, including the Greek symbol of psi, which of course is for psychology and psychiatry. Keys, which are of course emblematic of the histories of confinement on the site, but also emblematic of the fact that there were a lot of personal belongings left from individuals who sadly died in the institution. And there are front door keys were amongst their belongings. So these are keys that sadly were never used again. That's a, a, a deeply affecting thought, but certainly uh, emblematic of how an awful lot of people encountered Grange Gorman. Uh, and also just to highlight, next Monday, we will be launching another podcast. And this one is called Instituting Grange Gorman. And it's tra tracing the history of what is now known as the TU Dublin Lower House, 
but this building is a recently restored building that was actually the original Richmond Lunatic Asylum built on the site in 1812. So it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to trace that history. It is a difficult history because it is a history that began with great op optimism, but sadly is plagued by overcrowding and challenges, um, lack of resources, uh, and had the building eventually became completely derelict, but has been recently restored and is now a key site in the campus for TU Dublin, but more importantly, it's a real living history because so many of the architectural elements have been left exposed and are, are visually available so that it invites query about the history of the building, the history of the site, so that the history of the space remains with the new generation who use it. The practices in Grange Gorman, uh, again, there's a wide range of practices that are under examination and for future examination here. Uh, one element here I want to highlight is uh, the very first piece of this project back in 2019, <coughs> pardon me, was an ethics uh, of access and preservation policies seminar and it took place here in the Academy in May of that year. As a direct result of that piece, um, the HEC set up an internal historical mental health record steering group rolls readily off the tongue and that particular steering group has three members of our own working group involved and they are looking at reworking the national protocols in accessing historical mental health records so that the international best practices of applying the 100 year rule will apply to historical mental health records here. Obviously this project's intention was to ensure that the Grange Gorman archive was available on this uh, premise but of course uh, that protocol will now apply to all of the historical mental health records for all of the institutions in the country. Personally, I think this may be one of the biggest legacy pieces for this project. Um, it will have a huge impact on how we view um, mental illness historically, and we hope will impact how we view it currently and into the future. Resources for further study. This is um, a piece that we commissioned from historian uh, Dr. Grace O'Keefe. And Grace did an incredible job in researching all of the known uh, pro primary and secondary sources of record for Grange Gorman since 1770. And we published this piece on the website and it's available for anyone to have a look at or download. Only print if you need to, please. Uh, this particular listing could be helpful for anyone who's just casually curious or for a professional researcher who's looking for as much material as they can find. There are links so that anything that's readily available online can be accessed immediately. There are guidance to how to access the National Archives archive uh, of Grange Gorman. And also there she has included very helpfully um, a guidance on how to use the large databases because search terms like Richmond, for example, could bring anything up to 4,000 uh, results. So how to narrow down your search so that you can get the best possible results when looking up this material. This very much goes back to that value of stimulating active research and we really hope people will take time to have a look at it and engage with the, the sheer range of um, records available. A document like this is a living document and we are conscious that there may be some omissions or there may be uh, new material that could be added to this. So if anyone has identified a piece that should be included in that listing, please contact me and my contact details will be at the end of the, course, uh, the presentation and share it with us because we can add it to future iterations to ensure that the listing is as comprehensive as possible. Upcoming events, I've already mentioned the uh, podcast launch next Monday. Um, there are a number of our Exploring Grange Gorm Gorman series essays in uh, train at the moment on topics such as Grange Gorman and sport. Uh, the history of Grange Gorman transportation depot uh, during the 1830s to the 1880s, over 3,000 women and girls were transported to Van Steenen's land from Grange Gorman. So we've commissioned an essay to chart that history and uh, share that history, which is, again, another very difficult history. Um, we will also have supported TU Dublin Conservatoire um, in the commissioning of an original uh, play uh, depicting some of the experiences in Grange Gorman, and that's an original work that will be performed later this year. And of course, we're just finalising our 2022-2025 programme, which will be launched later in the year. So I want to say thank you very much. Uh, our website is grangegormanhistories.ie. Uh, there is a huge amount of material there, everything from panel discussions, podcasts, uh, resources, um, and a lot of background information on the project itself. So please uh, have a little look on the site. The contact details are grangegormanhistories at ggda.ie. Uh, so if you have any questions or anything you want to know more about the project, please email me. Thank you very much.
think we might start. No? Okay. Sure. Okay. Two minutes. that I'm the last person prior to your break. I, I hate to be the one to keep you from refreshments, so we will proceed on time. <laughs> um, my name is Shelley Dean, and I am not John Doyle. I think that may, may have become uh, obvious. 
I'm speaking about analyzing and researching Ireland North and South, uh, rewards and challenges. So what is ARINS? Analyzing and researching Ireland North and South has a very nice, neat acronym, and ARINS is the acronym. ARINS is a joint initiative inspired by the wonderful people here at the Royal Irish Academy, along with the Kyo Nocton Institute for Irish Studies, which is in the Kyo School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. The aim of ARINS is to deliver authoritative, independent, and non-partisan research and analysis on constitutional, institutional, and policy options for Ireland North and South. Why, you may ask, Aaron's, and why now? We're nearing a quarter of a century after the signing of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, an agreement that created new and innovative mechanisms for peace and a shared Northern Ireland. A lot has happened in 25 years. It has also been six years since the conscious uncoupling of our nearest neighbor from the European Union. A long and protracted separation, courtesy of the Brexit referendum. Since Britain's uncoupling from the EU, new custody arrangements over Northern Ireland create even greater challenges for relationships across and between these two islands and over the way we were. More questions arise over the way we might be. Critically, future decisions and constitutional conclusions over the status of Northern Ireland will reside with people, us. Any reconstitution of the two jurisdictions requires great thinking and a great deal of thinking. Aaron's meets the needs to convene the academics, the researchers and the practitioners best equipped to plan for the next quarter century and conveys the constitutional, institutional and policy puzzles we face to a wider public audience, all hungry for facts. How, you may well ask, does Aaron's do that? Homework, mostly. Aaron's academics, of which there are many and multiple, ask the questions, crunch the numbers, work the data, conduct the field work and the focus groups, convene the experts, facilitate the conversations, even listen to the unusual suspects, to reflect and reformulate their findings. To date, Aaron shares these findings in Irish Studies in International Affairs with over 70 articles and responses to date. In podcasts, we have 15 hosted by the wonderful Rory Montgomery, who helps to navigate everything from constitutional queries to cross-border cooperation in the arts. In addition, Aaron's blog posts guide readers through topical themes, exploring trends and tendencies, covering everything, and I mean everything, from census results, flags and symbols, films and representation, language legislation, policing, pensions, opinion poll surveys, to protocol pickles. There's quite a lot on the last protocol pickles. Aaron's has 18 blogs on the Aaron's Project website. So I've talked about the challenges that we're going to face, but I haven't mentioned the rewards just yet. Homework well done is its own reward, but it will also serve the next generation of decision makers and policy makers and the people of Ireland North and South. And in the meantime, it helps feed our curiosity. If you would like to know more, we are next door and we have access to our Twitter and our social media and our website and our Instagram and all of those fancy things where you can find everything you might need. And now I will not deny you your sustenance any longer. Thanks very much.
Good afternoon. Um, I presume you can all hear me again. I'm back for more, and hopefully you're, you're not going to be a tough crowd this afternoon. And I suppose, for those of you not here earlier, uh, my name is John Gibney, and, and I'm one of the assistant editors with one of the research projects in the Academy called Documents in Irish Foreign Policy. And what I want to do is, I mentioned it earlier on in the course of uh, discussing the treaty exhibition, but I want to give you a sense here now of what it is and what the nuts and bolts are, what it actually does. And in a nutshell, what the, what this, the project is, and the project is kind of distinctive in that it's a partnership between the, Arch the Academy here, the National Archives of Ireland, which is where our office actually is, and to you know, retain the collections that we tend to, that we publish, and also uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs. And what we do is we publish archival material relating to Ireland's foreign relations since 1919. Now, coming through into this room, you will have gone through the library, the academy, you will have come across, uh, you would have, if you glanced at the bookshelves, you would have seen many printed calendars of documents, the primary source material. So it's a long and, um, I would like to think, a distinguished uh, pastime to make, you know, primary source material and manuscripts more immediately accessible to the public. Um, it's by no means unprecedented for a country to publish these kind of documents on its foreign relations. Lots of countries do it. The United States has been doing it since pretty much before the US Civil War. And um, we're the Irish equivalent of that. The project's been in running since 1998 or 1997. And every two years, we produce one of these. We basically turn a pile of material like, like that into one of these fine, handsome publications right here. And this is the most recent one, volume 12, which is going for the princely sum of 30 euros, a bargain outside. Um, and given that this is a publicly funded project, accountability is a good thing and productivity is a good thing. So every two years we produce one of these from our little IRE up in the National Archives. It's kind of funny because, you know, when people say work for the Royal Irish Academy, people start getting, they start going all, you know, mushy about how it must be wonderful to work in this fantastic Georgian building. Says, no, we don't work in this fantastic building. We work overlooking a warehouse, listening to lots of seagulls all day. But that's a practical necessity because we need to be close to the material that we publish. I would want to talk you through here is some of that material, why we publish it, what's in it, what are the criteria for selecting that stuff. And if you were to, um, now the material that we publish has all been released to, to the National Archives under the 30 year rule, whereby government departments are supposed to release their files and the Department of Foreign Affairs is quite assiduous about doing this. Um, and what we're looking at is, I suppose, we're looking for stuff that, I suppose the clue is in the term policy. If you were to look at, um, if we were to be called, you know, documents in Irish foreign relations, well, that's pretty much everything. You know, you know, th that covers so much, it would be unfeasible to do it. Policy gives it a different angle, and the guiding principle for choosing material is how it sheds light on how decisions were made, how Irish foreign policy evolved. And it's not absolute. I mean, we, we try to include material as well that like reflects an Irish perspective on... Um, you know, war, you know, events of global importance. But I suppose the thing is that it's not so much diplomatic history, which is very much out of fashion these days, so much as history viewed through the lens of diplomacy, which is quite a different thing. The Irish Foreign Service traditionally, and for, most, for much of its existence, was fairly small, um, reflecting a small and relatively impoverished state. So its diplomats had to cover a lot of angles, which means a lot of material pops up in those files that we go through. Um, you know, it's not just receipts for Ferrer Roche and whatever, you know. It covers a huge and diverse range of material. Now, the kind of stuff that we publish, we also, alongside the, um, the document volumes, we also publish kind of ancillary projects, side projects. The treaty was one of them, you know. Another one would be this equally fine publication. In fact, quite possibly one of the finest books ever written and produced and designed, which is going for the slightly less princely sum of 20 euros outside, but which is an illustrated history of Irish foreign policy, which we did as a centenary project a couple of years ago. So alongside the main business of the project, we do do kind of, you know, initiatives that are intended to kind of publicize what we do. At the moment, uh, we're working on an exhibition um, and a project to commemorate 50 years of Ireland's entry into the, um, into the EEC. But the bread and butter are these green lads here, okay? And we're about to publish the 13th edition in the series, which covers the years from 1965 to 1969. Now, we don't really get a, get a chance to publish um, photographic material in the volumes, you know? Like, we found this, I thought it was a pretty groovy image of Sean Lamas in Milan in 1959, which made its way into the illustrated history. Um, and, you know, the illustrated history was a good way of incorporating visual material, you know? That's another one, three diplomats, all women at the United Nations. 
and the alignment of the three countries in alphabetical order is kind of quite striking. The, it dates from 1956, and the Irish um, representative is Sheila Murphy, who was a very long-serving uh, Irish diplomat. And the Irish diplomatic service, just you know, it was subject to the marriage bar that was in place until 1973. So the careers of female diplomats were often cut off, um, you know, early because they married or were curtailed in advance in the expectation that they were going to get married and leave the service anyway. So why bother promoting them? You know. Now, one thing that makes our project distinctive is that, unlike many of our international peers, we're not part of a foreign ministry. So no one in the Department of Foreign Affairs gets to see that before it goes to print. And we have discretion, all the material is publicly available. But if you've gone to the National Archives to go through this stuff, you're talking about vast collections of material. And it's quite possible somebody could say, get in a train from Galway, come up to Dublin, go to the National Archives, put in their five or six slips for the day, which is the maximum order they can put in, or whatever the number is these days, and they're gonna come back with a load of brochures from the 1950s or 60s, which are of no use to them. You know, material is sent back, but it takes a lot to navigate through it. So what we're trying to do is make it more accessible. And that brings me to the question of how we start and what we choose. I suppose um, what I want to do is kind of emphasize that, the, and these are, these are kind of facsimiles. These are the kind of representatives of some of the documents you will find in there, okay? And these are facsimiles that are going to go into the volume. You know, we do include some facsimiles just to give a sense of what's what. But we kind of start at the top because if you take the view that material is, was filtering upwards to be discussed by the government um, to enable decisions to be made, what we do is kind of work our way back down the chain of command, so to speak. So the first things we look at are the minutes of governments. We go, the volumes tend to cover the terms of governments. We run from election to election because it's the best way of keeping it neutral. You know, different historic milestones have different resonances for different people. And I think the fairest and most neutral way of, I suppose, demarcating the terms of reference and the terms of the periods that we look at is to go from a one election to the next. So the ones at the moment are kind of, you know, the, the, this volume ends in April 1920 with one election. The current volume forthcoming begins in April 19, 1965 with that election and continues until the general election um, of July 1969, just before the outbreak of the Troubles in Earnest, which will be covered in the next volume. What we do is, first thing we look at are the minutes of governments. Okay, That gives you a sense of what kind of things are being discussed at a cabinet table. What we then look at are the files of the Department of the Taoiseach. Um, you know, the files that would have been discussed, that would have informed those discussions, and then we work our way back down into the files of the Department of Foreign Affairs itself. So we kind of draw from the, de de the Department of the Taoiseach, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and also some private collections, like the, the, the collections of people like, say, Frank Aiken, for example, uh, being a key figure for, um, for the period we're still, we're still studying. But the bulk of it comes from the National Archives. After that, we would look at the papers of secretary generals, or secretaries as they were called then. So the head of the department, therefore the advisor to the incumbent minister for foreign affairs. Then we drop down to where you start getting into the real cream of the crop. The reports that were submitted to... Um, to the Department of Foreign Affairs from Irish embassies by ambassadors, and we'll come to that in a moment. Then you go down into what are called the general registry files, and ultimately you're kind of going down, 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 until you get to the files of embassies themselves, which very often contain some of the most co literally colourful material, but not the most consequential for our point of view, and stuff like that rarely makes the cut. Now what we're looking for here, and just to kind of go through what these two things are, and they're short documents, I mean, like some of the stuff we publish is massive, and ultimately we're going through the stuff looking for a, uh, a perspective on Irish affairs. And to give one example where the penny dropped for me working on this, in that volume, John F. Kennedy looms large, understandably. He also gets shot halfway through it, okay, and was succeeded by Lyndon Johnson. So we're looking at um, a document produced by the incumbent ambassador, Thomas Kiernan, in the aftermath of Kennedy's assassination. And he offers this kind of very, very informed, fantastic, fascinating kind of overview of the US political landscape in late 1963. And you're reading it there and there thinking, well, this is fascinating, it's great stuff, but where is the angle from an Irish perspective? Till you get to the last paragraph where his conclusion is, within this changing American political landscape, the door to the White House that was open under John F. Kennedy will be closed under Johnson, that while he will be friendly, he won't offer, uh, offer any favours. And then you think, right, that's a conclusion, and that enables you to include that particular thing. Um, other examples that come to come to light from the current from the, the current volume we're doing because what we do is we go through these files. Okay, this one here on the on the on the right has a couple of characteristics that mark it for inclusion. It's a letter from uh, Hugh McCann, who was the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, to the Secretary of the Government, a guy called Nicholas Nolan. It's about landing rights. 
now, I can see all of you jumping up in excitement at the thought of landing rights in Shannon Airport or Dublin. But it's important economically and for tourism and for development in the 1960s. And it touches, it was a, very, it was a bit of a bone of contention with the US government. Now, one thing you like about it is that it's annotated. Handwriting at the bottom, Jack Lynch. You know, you can see at the top, seen with the Taoiseach with the tick. Another one over here, okay, a letter from um, Frank Aiken, then the Minister for, uh, for, for External Affairs, as it was called. It was only called Foreign Affairs from 1971 onwards. The External Affairs was kind of a hangover from our membership of the Commonwealth earlier in the century. And that's writing to, um, to Jack Lynch as Taoiseach about the Biafran War, the Nigerian Biafran Civil War, which looms large in the current volume, you know, given the fact that in Nigeria at that time and in the separatist province of Biafra, there was a very substantial number of Irish missionaries who famously got involved in relief efforts, some which the Irish government kind of viewed with, a, you know, wariness. There was, there was suspicions that... Um, the Irish government didn't want to recognise the province, the Nigerian province of Biafra, not least because it kind of undermined an argument against partition in Ireland, you know. But that, you know, issue of the Biafran War, which marks, I suppose, an engagement with African countries as well, is a big theme in the volume we're working on. But both of those will go in as facsimiles to give you a sense of what some of these things actually look like. Um, in going through those files, we tend to, stuff tends to fall out. I mean, when we were working on this book here, we were going through files for the, uh, the Irish Embassy in Nigeria, and that popped out of a folder. We thought, we need a, a picture that illustrates an Irish diplomat in Africa, and thought, this is a perfect candidate. Um, and very often, these images can be pristine. This one came out of a file in the, from the Embassy in Washington, D.C., still wrapped in paper, in this filigree paper, and almost certainly, you could probably say, this had never been opened since somebody sent it in uh, the 1960s. Now, that's the Irish ambassador, William P. Fay, Lyndon Johnson, and the infamous Bowl of Shamrock. Now, the actual report for that event, uh, now it's all smiling, Faye was told going in, listen, there's no time for small talk here, Johnson's busy, you know, you're getting a photo up, it'll look nice, but that's about, that's, that's all you're getting this time around, you know? And it's funny how the, the, the focus on that ceremony, a few years later when he was doing it with Nixon, he would write back to Dublin in 1969 that, you know, President Nixon was much, much warmer than his predecessor. And his theory was that Nixon was warmer than his predecessor because he had one eye on Edward Kennedy as a possible future presidential candidate in 1972 and therefore wanted to make sure that whatever was left of an Irish vote was kept on side. Though this was obviously before an event like Chappaquiddick derailed those, um, the trajectory that many assumed Ted Kennedy would be on at that stage. So stuff like this pops up. And if you can use it, we will. But the meat and drink is this kind of stuff here, okay? This is another document that's going to be in the volume. Did you know that there was a message from Eamon de Valera on the moon? Well, you do now, because there is, okay? In Irish, no less, okay? May God grant that skill and courage, which, what's it saying? May God grant that the skill and courage which enable man to reach the moon may assist in the establishment of a peaceful and a happier world. Now, that was recommended by Frank Aiken as Tarnishta. And Frank Aiken was, um, you know, very concerned with international affairs, and particular with, particularly with the prospect of nuclear war, you know? Um, the first nuclear non-proliferation treaty, you know, signed from 1968 onwards, was very much done at Aiken's instigation. Um, and in fact, he was the, the first person to sign it, which was kind of a seen as a kind of a token of appreciation for his efforts, even though Ireland didn't have nuclear weapons and I presume doesn't have any now. Um, so in a way, that little message is going to reflect some of Aiken's preoccupation. But it was put in a microfilm that was sent up to the moon on the Apollo 11 mission and there it rests. So, you know, you could say that there is going to, you know, an Irish diplomatic engagement with the rest of the universe, but we'll see how that's going to work out in time to come. But you can't not include something like that, you know, the Apollo mission. Like, you know, it's, stuff like that is interesting. So you want to throw in stuff that reflects human issues, you know, the, the reality of some kind of thing, of, of events like... Um, you know, we've documents that kind of documents that reflect how the department actually worked internally, as well as what its representative saw. Um, that's Aiken signing the um, the treaty itself in Moscow in 1968. Another one here, small a small document that tells you a lot. Telegrams. We don't use them anymore. They're kind of artifacts. What it is, however, telling you, it touches on another key theme in the volume, which is Ireland's membership at EEC, because probably the single world leader who was mo of mo with whom Irish diplomats were most preoccupied in the 1960s, wasn't a US president or necessarily a British prime minister, but a French president in the former Charles de Gaulle. Because he, de Gaulle's insistence on keeping Britain out of the EEC was of great importance to a country like Ireland that adamantly wanted to get into the EEC. So you do have quite a lot of um, you know, reports of you know, conversations with de Gaulle trying to persuade him that, you know, we're not the same as the British, you know, well, come on, give us, cut us a break, let us in, you know. And naturally, so naturally, his resignation and the removal of what was seen as a stumbling block was of great importance. And that's reflected in little marginalia at the bottom where somebody has written, bless my European soul, 
at the bottom of that telegram, which would have been circulated around the Department of External Affairs. Now, what we do is we transfer them into these things here, okay? Um, that's a, that's basically a page, they're two pages from the forthcoming volume. So we go through these files, and what we do is we, and we look through quite possibly tens of thousands of documents. Eventually, we'll, get a, we'll create a database, you know, a spreadsheet where we put all this material on file and indicate what it's about, its metadata, its references, who was sent it, who got it, where was it sent from, where was it sent to. And when we get to about 2,000, we begin to cut it down and cut it down and cut it down. There's three people working on the project full time. Um, there's also an, ed an academic advisory board. So we have a couple of meetings then. We have a two year production schedule. First year is research, second year is production and editing. And we cut down those documents quite drastically to a manageable number. Now, some of those, now it, it is the case that, you know, when we go to you know, really edit the material, because we make a selection of documents, they then get typed up. We then begin to read them out to each other to make sh against the original documents to make sure that everything is precise and is exact because you only really get one shot at this. Um, and the process, we cut down stuff even further. You know, you'll often see a thing in the documents, matter omitted. But this is not hiding some kind of state secrets, it just means that kind of boring, tedious stuff, or extraneous material has been removed, and you might get to the meat of a document. Like, to give you one example, there's a document about arranging ministerial meetings to European capitals, you know? A lot of it is a bit boring, it's kind of like, have you written to so-and-so, why not, when are you gonna write to him, blah, 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 blah. But then the sections of it that are quite different that indicate why this might be important. That perhaps at the end of the 60s, it might be a good idea to arrange these visits to European capitals to keep the prospect of Ireland's membership at EEC on the collective, on collective European radars. You know, that apart from the minutiae of actually organising these visits, they were being done with a very deliberate purpose, and you would put that in because it shows a certain particular approach. Um, we also begin to kind of cut it down as much as possible because it has to fit within two covers. You know, and even that's, I mean, that's, you could handily assault someone with this if you wanted, okay? Um, but it's, you know, you can only publish X, X amount. So we, we, we try to be ruthless. Like, um, and we annotate it as well. Like, you're trying to reconstruct the world in which these people live. So biographies, references to other international events or issues. I mean, uh, I think if you look in the footnotes, you'll come across the Roadrunner. And, um, you know, my own, my own, one of my own favorite footnotes was digging into uh, the permanent representative of the Vatican to the United Nations, who uh, later drew on his experience to write a novel and called, uh, called Requiem for a Spy, in which the permanent representative of the Vatican to, um, uh, to the United Nations is kidnapped by the KGB and replaced by a Soviet agent, you know, who then falls in love with an Israeli secret agent at the UN and a romance and so and so. It's not the kind of thing you'd expect from a senior Catholic cleric, you know, but it's worth pointing out that this drew on his experiences, which are germane to the subject of the volume. And we're also trying to cut stuff down further and further and further. One theme that pops up in the current volume is the outbreak of the Troubles. So one, and which registered quite widely in Irish America. Irish constants were recording, you know, protest outside. Despite the fact that we're covering the 60s, we only have one reference to a beatnik. No hippies, but one beatnik who was protesting outside an Irish consulate to demand justice for Joe Donnelly, who had been interned. There were three documents indicating protest outside the U US consulates. So which one do you pick? We said, let's kick that to touch and figure it out and see how the themes fit into the volume. We have to take one, but we won't know which one as the process begins. It's like, there is a certain creativity in trying to figure out what to include because you're trying to be as representative as possible. Um, other examples from the United States, we put in, um, you know, William Fay tended to write long memos as ambassador. That's grand. Um, but there were two examples where we had to choose one one rather than two. We want to include a, a perspective on world events. So you do get things like, say, the Six Day War, the Prague Spring, um, you know, the upheaval in France in May 1968 reflected in the contents of the volume. And you will also get, say, um, the assassination of, of Bobby Kennedy and the Vietnam War. And there's a, I mean, there's a fascinating document that made the cut about the impact of Bobby Kennedy's assassination. There's an equally fascinating document about going to the funeral. But we thought, oh, that's, that's just really a descriptive narrative. It doesn't really add much. The, he went to the funeral. It was a funeral, you know, and they say, I don't say that in a flippant way, you know. But for our purposes, that was the one that went. Did you include, if you have two reports by an ambassador that touch on the Vietnam War, because you can't not include the Vietnam War for the 60s. Do you choose the one that um, illustrates the impact and shock of the Tet Offensive of 1968 upon the United States? Or do you include the generic one about the status quo in the Vietnam War at any one time? The latter fell by the wayside. The first one that illustrated the seismic shock went in. So you're trying to provide that perspective 
on global events as much as possible, all the while keeping the selection as tight as possible, annotating it to make it explicable to people and to reconstruct the world in which these diplomats operated. Because, you know, while some would argue you should only include Irish material, that's not good enough because these, the whole point of having a Department of Foreign Affairs or External Affairs was to operate in a world where there was more than just Ireland. So you have to reflect that and think of this material as a window into the world. And I always think of it as, um, you know, it's not diplomatic history so much as Irish history through the lens of diplomacy. Now, the decade of centenaries has thrown up a particular interest in primary source material, okay? The, with the military archives in particular doing incredible work in making uh, the raw material from which history is constructed available to the wider public. But there's nobody publishing archival material for Irish history for the second half of the 20th century except us. We're currently up to um, the period 1965 to 1969. Um, that volume will be emerging in November. We are literally at the stage of signing off on the proofs and checking the index. And we're already beginning the next one, volume 14, which will cover uh, the Fianna Fáil government that was in power from July 1969 until March 1973, which uncovers some of the most brutal and significant years of the Troubles. And as time goes on, the sheer volume of material that we're going to have to go through will increase. As Ireland joined the EEC, as the Troubles became a, 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 pix, a fixture on the, Irish, um, on the Irish landscape, so to speak, as more, as simply as more embassies were produced to produce more paperwork. But the core purpose of the project is fairly simple. Our job is to take this material, make it ex as accessible as is possible in the form of those green volumes. They will go online on an open access basis eventually, so I would encourage you to explore it as best you can. Um, and I suppose all I can say after that is, having given you some taste of what we do, what we're trying to do is make this stuff easier to access. People are interested in it. All you have to do is go into an archive, go into the library here, pick it up off a shelf, have a flick through, see what's there, because you will be surprised at what's in there. And um, if you get any book tokens for Christmas, we'll have a new volume on the shelves. And it will make, a, combined with a box of Ferrero Rocher, it is the perfect gift for the diplomat in your life. So I would encourage you to think along those lines. Um, on that note, I'll make way for the next speaker. And thank you for listening. I'm the Assistant Librarian here in the Royal Irish Academy and today I'd like to talk to you about two of our projects to document and preserve our selections of uh, antiquarian watercolours. The library itself is an important research centre principally for the scholarship of Irish history, language, society, politics, natural history, archaeology and the history of Irish science. We have lots of multidisciplinary collections of archival and published materials, manuscripts, books, maps and drawings to support the work of the academy and the research community that it serves. Uh, we also include our own research projects such as these, these ones here I'm going to talk to you about today and we also do outreach and communications activities on the national uh, initiatives and institutional partnerships which we'll be uh, talking about later as well with some of the, the collaborations we've done in the past with some of our collections and online publishing uh, in the facility of, of transferring knowledge. So just overview today of what we're going to look at. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction into some of the library's collections of antiquarian drawings, uh, some of the benefits that we've seen from digital collaboration, um, some of the partners that we work with, and as well how to access the digital collections that we have available um, of our drawings and the metadata that it uh, contains. So the antiquarian drawings here at the Academy, um, 
there's over 8,600 approximately uh, drawings and sketches, and we continue to add to our collections um, over, over the course of our, our collection develop, development policies. And the drawings cover a period between the late 18th century and early 20th centuries. Uh, the drawings mainly, they're watercolors mainly, and sketches in ink and pencil uh, range from just the depiction of Irish landscapes to places and objects of archaeological and architectural interest. So some of these artists would be included is George Victor de Neuer, um, who was uh, popular with the Ordnance Survey. You would have heard my this morning with Barbara talking about um, the Ordnance Survey collections. Um, we have a large collection from Jonathan um, Thomas Johnson Westrop, uh, as well as Sir Richard Colt Hoare, and also George Petrie. But I'm going to talk to you today more about Gabriel Beranger's um, watercolors uh, particularly. So we've seen now that um, we've been collaborating with our partners for, for a number of years, and we've seen the benefits of being able to take these drawings and put them um, online for everyone to access. So this is a, in, including um, expanding our reach out to areas where they might not necessarily know that we have these collections and they would extend out even further to uh, larger cultural institutions uh, and online platforms such as Europeana and Google Arts and Culture. Um, by digitally um, putting these objects online as well, uh, helps to preserve them so we don't need to access them from our collections quite so often. Um, they, they are helping to conserve them as well as to ensure that they're preserved for much longer term use um, through permanent identifiers and that, that they will never disappear basically in, in, into the, the void that is the, <laughs> the, um, the cyberspace. Um, also, benefits of collaborating um, are helping to create opportunities for connecting with other collections. So this is through platforms such as um, IIIF, which I will talk about a little bit later on. Um, this opens up research, to possibility, or research possibilities to uh, broader audiences without having to come in and look at the physical items themselves. You can look at the different versions online and make your comparisons there. Um, and also we find that this helps to improve accessibility of special collections where uh, the education and experience usages of, of different uh, user groups can be uh, helped along the way. So the projects that I'm going to talk today about our partners for uh, collaboration on these Beranger watercolors is the Watercolor World and the Digital Repository of Ireland. Um, we wanted to digitally document and preserve these selections uh, from parts of our large collections here of watercolors. And to this end, we've put in two postcard-sized albums that have contained uh, 47 watercolor images by Gabriel Beranger of his expeditions around Dublin and some of the surrounding counties. And those are on display uh, at present in the, in the library, so you can actually see the albums for themselves. So who was Gabriel Beranger? Um, he was born in the Netherlands uh, and he came to Ireland about 1750. He spent most of his life in Dublin where he established a print shop and an artist's warehouse. He then remained in Ireland until his death in 1817. And then in approximately 1780 to 1800, he uh, did these watercolors and they were copies from his original paintings which are now since lost. Um, from many of his expeditions around uh, Ireland in the 1770s. He compiled uh, manuscript journals of his uh, expeditions uh, by describing the places that he went, uh, the people he met, and sometimes noting the condition of the uh, monuments that he had visited. The manuscript notes do not appear to survive, but Sir William Wilde, who is the father of Oscar, uh, a member here at the Academy, had access to them and quoted extensively uh, from them in a memoir of Beranger that he published in 1870. Wilde's work on Beranger was completed and reissued by his wife Speranza, and that memoir um, re helped to reestablish Beranger's reputation, and Wilde is actually <clears throat> excuse me, quoted as saying that there were few who could draw ancient buildings as well. And that um, memoir is also uh, in the Academy collections, uh, on display in the reading room, and it is a, a signed copy that was given to us by uh, Lady Wilde herself. So these um, 
drawings that Beranger did contain a valuable record of Ireland's past and its historic buildings, uh, especially now since many have now de deteriorated or have completely disappeared. So the first album is um, Gabriel Beranger's Rambles Through the County of Dublin and Some Others in Ireland. Uh, there's a couple of examples there of, uh, in, in uh, Dublin of the canal and uh, one of the structures he found in uh, Tomolig. Uh, it is a small postcard-sized album with 23 watercolours that the uh, Academy received in March of 1920. And these illustrations are of scenery and ancient monuments. Uh, there's general views and details of principally castles, churches, and abbeys. Now, this album, because it, only, it was meant to have 24, there was the one actually missing, and it seems to have been missing before it had arrived um, here in the Academy. But... Thankfully, we have a listing of it um, in a catalogue here that provides us that detail that there was a drawing uh, number 24 and it was uh, a, another view of Dundrum Castle. And these are all copies on his expeditions here in this album around Dublin, Meath and Mayo. The second album is uh, another rambles through the county of Dublin and some neighbouring ones, so slight difference in the title there. Um, again, it was acquired simultaneously with the other album. Uh, this one has the full complement of 24 watercolours, providing a similar scenery of ancient monuments, uh, their general views and details, which he includes in some of his drawings as well. So you might not just get the drawing itself, but you would also see some of his explanatory notes about wh what you're seeing there. And it's the companion album. And these were during, uh, done during his expeditions again in Dublin, but this time covering Roscommon, Wicklow and Meath. Uh, the next album that we have, it's not currently um, digitized yet. Um, we do have it catalogued, and this is our next project that's going to be upcoming. Uh, he is the most, Beranger's watercolors here in the Academy are the most extensive collection of watercolors amongst all the artists that we have here, totaling nearly 150 with another album or with another uh, set of drawings that we acquired just recently that have come back from conservation work. And we are currently underway now in putting together the 96 images uh, of drawings of castles, monasteries, and others from various areas in um, the Irish counties as well. So our first collaboration is, um, was done with the Watercolor World and they are just one of the projects that we do to digitally document our collection of antiquarian watercolors. Uh, Watercolor World was launched in 2019 and is a free database of high resolution images uh, containing more than 80,000 images. Their online global treasury is uh, documenting the world known before photography with pre-1900 uh, watercolors from both public and private collections such as the British Library, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Royal Society of Antiquaries here in Ireland. Uh, they aim to secure history with the visual experience of the past and providing vital information for the modern world to explore a cultural record of the global environment and how it has changed over the centuries. Access to the Academy's Branche images uh, you can get by accessing their website at www.watercolorworld.org and we get to search them in a couple of different ways. Uh, first, they have a keyword which you could put in the Academy, uh, Royal Irish Academy, or secondly, they have a, a map feature which you can zone in on particular locations worldwide by covering over the map of Ireland. So I'll give you a quick look at how their, their functions work here. So this is on their website. And what you see here is you've got the two tabs at the top with the keyword search and with the location search. So in this case, we type in the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, the current collections that we have with them are purely just Beranger drawings. So you get a sample of the drawings underneath of what comes up that the Academy holds. Uh, and then you can filter in and look even further into by clicking into the images and getting all the information that way. Or you can do by location. You can type in, you see a world map there um, that you can then zone in on, and the numbers in the little uh, circles represent the number of uh, watercolors pre-1900 that can be traced to that particular location. So some of the images that we had earlier, which I'll, you'll see, 
um, float in here into these, into these numbers. So if you look at Dublin, you see like 343 inside the circle, which means there's within the, within the, the township of Dublin, there would be 343 related images, not just from the academy, but from everything that's there on the Watercolour World website. So if we wanted to hone in then on location with Dublin, um, you just go in and you just pick Dublin and there's 73 images there, just specifically in that particular zone. As you go further out, they, they, they move out towards the different um, other areas uh, outside of Dublin and the county itself. So then when you select on, on one of the images there, you, we do a search for Temple Oak. Um, we get two images of Temple Oak House saying there's, there's the red dot for Temple Oak, there's two, there's two items that are available for this particular location. You get one of Temple Oak House from one particular perspective, and then you get a second one from another perspective, and they're both from the Baranger collection. And then when you go and you actually zoom in on the image itself, um, you get uh, more detailed. So you can go in and you can zoom in and zoom out with some of the menu options on the side there. You can make it into a full screen so you can get closer and zooming in closer into the detail that is there in the image. You also get um, a little bit of a description on the bottom there of, of what the scene actually has. So you'd, in this case, you get the view of the mansion house um, of Sir Charles uh, Donville of, of Temple Oak. And then when you drill in a little bit further, you get back into all the actual descriptive um, metadata or information about this particular picture that's available in our catalog that has been then uploaded into the Watercolor World site. So you get the name of the artist, of which when you see something that may be underlined, um, you would then click into that and you'd see all the Gabriel Branger drawings that are in this particular website. Uh, likewise, if you click on Royal Irish Academy, you get to see what other Academy collections are there. Um, and then there's a link specifically just for the image. And then you get more for information about the collection as a whole underneath it, and you get the little map there. So if you wanted to look specifically at Ireland again, you can just click on the link there. Or if you're looking specifically for watercolor versus maybe a different, you're looking for pen and ink drawings, you might get a different descriptor there. So you can, anything that basically has an underline, you can click in and, and you can find more information about those. Um, it also gives you a helpful, if you like this picture, <laughs> you might like to see some of these others. So it gives you a little bit of a selection there too, just to say if you're interested in Beranger or if you're interested in the Royal Irish Academy collections, you can view all the different results that come up then and there. Now, the second uh, collection, or the, the second collaboration that we've done is also here with uh, the Academy's uh, Digital Repository of Ireland. And we want to use them to more as a preservation uh, tool. Uh, they are Ireland's national trustworthy uh, digital repository for the humanities, cultural heritage, and social sciences. And they've been certified with their seal since 2018. Um, they provide a long, term solution, uh, they're reliable and, and sustained access in order to retrieve these images in the future. And all this data is openly available as well with a long-term policy uh, in place to ensure that researchers and heritage institutions um, are av they're, um, available in the future for future research purposes. And they support the best practice in digital archiving, preservation, open access research and uh, fair data sharing. Uh, and they have a rich range as well as the watercolor world where they focus in specifically with, with antiquarian drawings. Um, the DRI has uh, a lot more collaborative partners and a lot more variance in their different subject matter. So it might be possible to link um, what you have in maybe a Branger drawing with maybe something related historically to Dublin or to maps or something, something similar. So you can kind of hone in on a lot of different subjects that you can then kind of marry up together. So when you go to their website at uh, www.dri.com, uh, this is their front homepage and it just gives you a quick um, descriptor, but what you want is the search box there. You put in Branger and you get a link to all the images that are there, 
in the repository with a quite like a thumbnail description on top. You also have some filtering options and that we can specifically go to if you know you were looking for an image, let's say back the same ones from Tomolig or if you wanted to look at somewhere else, uh, maybe you're interested in seeing some watercolors from Bray, you'd go in and you can hone in on some of the, the filters there. You can look at the different subjects and the times as well. Um, they have a lot of other object tools too, so you can download the images, um, you get the full descriptions uh, with the metadata. The key importance with the DRI is that they have a, a permanent uh, DOI or digital object identifier, which helps to preserve these images so that if you move around the web and, and you end up coming back, these, these links won't disappear in the future, which is which is key because websites undergo changes and sometimes you see what they call link rot, they just disappear off the web entirely. So that's one of the key purposes for um, putting our collections up on the digital repository in order to preserve them in the longer term for future research possibilities. And one of those is this new, uh, well, it's been around for a little while, but it, this new uh, feature called uh, the International Image Interoperability Interoperability Framework, or IIIF. And what this does is it's a set of open standards for delivering high quality uh, digital objects online. And it's uh, developed for an international community to implement uh, these APIs or what they, these applications that you can go in and they have a, a backing of a, a large uh, consortium of leading cultural institutions. Many of the images and audiovisual resources that are fundamental to research uh, exist in silos. With access restricted to locally built applications, IIIF then will give you the, the freedom to work across these barriers to get a, a richer access to the world's image and audiovisual files. With a standard method to get these images put together uh, into the different environments that you might be using on the web where they can be viewed consistently and interacted with in a lot of different ways, such as being able to do um, to zoom in on them. You can do comparisons between images across different institutions, look at the different structures that are available, or even be able to annotate within them um, across institutions. So if you're looking at Beranger and what he has here, maybe there's some collections that are similar, you might be able to then tie the two up together um, that way through using this particular framework. And finally, uh, we just want to say that um, we are proud to be able to preserve these uh, documentary watercolors uh, for generations to follow and we continue to add uh, to our collections as well as to put these collections up digitally uh, into both the watercolor world and the digital repository of Ireland. Uh, so thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy watching or seeing the exhibition outside with some of the actual drawings we have of Beranger and and the books that have been published about uh, Beranger specifically by Peter Harbison who's done a lot of work on his drawings and his books are available to view outside as well. So thank you very much. Something happened there that has contributed in some way to urban life. A blacksmith's forge to shoe the horses, the mill to feed the people, the brewery to quench the thirst, the schoolhouse to educate, the theatre to entertain, the castles, walls and towers to protect, the markets to trade, the churches to preach and the jails to punish and so on. The Irish Historic Towns Atlas has documented over 50,000 of these urban sites in Ireland, all, with the, all within the bindings of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas fascicles. My name is Jennifer Moore, and I am an editorial and research assistant with the Irish Historic Towns Atlas with Sarah Geerty, Frank Cullen, and Angela Byrne on the Suburb series. We work with an honorary editorial board of Howard Clark, Raymond Gillespie, Michael Potterton, Ruth McManus, Jonathan Wright, with... Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, with Angrid Sims, who was here earlier on as our consultant editor, and Rachel Murphy as our digital chair. 
You may have been at Sarah Geerty's uh, presentation a little earlier today, where she gave the cartographer's perspective of the IHTA. But for this presentation, I'm going to highlight the text or the topographical information gazetteer, or the TI as we call it in the office, which is compiled for each of the Irish atlases. I hope to underline how incredibly rich and versatile the IHTA is as a source of Irish urban history. I'll illustrate the process of creating the atlases and demonstrate some of the micro histories and some of the macro histories that can be generated from this topographical information. To date, 30, uh, 30 atlases of 27 towns have been published since the project's inception in 1981 when the Royal Irish Academy uh, agreed to host the IHTA. The Irish Atlas has became, became part of a wider European movement to record the cartographic and urban histories of towns, many of which were destroyed during the bombings of World War II. The Irish project was born in the wake of the Wood Quay protests in Ireland during the 1970s, uh, when there was an enhanced recognition to preserve and discover uh, urban history as a way of understanding our heritage and culture. Initially, 40 towns were chosen to become part of this all-island project, 10 from each province, with varying origins ranging from the so-called monastic, Viking, Anglo-Norman, etc., up to the 19th century towns. Authors with expertise in the selected towns were and still are approached to take on a town uh, and are supported in the office and occasionally by researchers. We work with Ordnance Survey Ireland and Land and Property Services Northern Ireland to provide mapping services that are reproduced in the publications along with various repositories in Ireland and abroad that contain sources pertaining to uh, the various towns and cities in Ireland. Sources for each atlas can vary in terms of their detail and their date ranges, but are, they are usually vast. They include everything from early cartographic records to annals, deeds, leases, charters, crown records, and government reports, directories, newspapers, visitor accounts, illustrations and photographs, journal articles, and town histories. And an increasing number of sources are now becoming available online, particularly with the, uh, with the virtual treasury up and running. These are all gleaned by the author with the focus of extracting the topographical history of, our, of the built heritage of, of every ur urban settlement in question. Town sources can vary also. For example, some towns that have ex experienced military warfare will have more maps of the defences, while other towns have preserved their corporation minute books, which are extremely rich sources, while others, their corporation books are simply missing for various reasons. The author then assesses uh, the existing sources for their town and will extract the topographical features and descriptions. This is then funneled into the 22 thematic sections or this DNA of the town that we consider um, and uh, for, uh, of the various functions for every town. For example, the population figures gathered from sources such as census returns, religious surveys and early visitor, account, visitor accounts with town estimates are compiled in section 8 population. Sources such as maps, deeds, newspapers, directories that have road, street, alley or lane names will be alphabetically ordered in section 10, streets. And then sources that identify sites such as mills, forges, watchmakers, etc. will be put chronologically into section 15, manufacturing, for example. The draft then comes into the office where it is reviewed and edited and reviewed and edited and reviewed and edited and reviewed and edited and then it's eventually published along with the thematic facsimile maps and views uh, of the town. So that's just a sample from Dublin part two. So the, the text content. Um, this section of the atlas comprises of a topographical essay describing the evolution of the urban settlement or when a space becomes a place the topographical information gazetteer, and the sources used in research. As I mentioned earlier, there are over 50,000 topographical entries or histories in the 30 atlas, pu atlas publications. These are site histories that can be examined in this micro or macro history of a building, street, or in a thematic, national, or international manner. First, to look at some micro history examples. Each entry follows the same structure. We are concerned with the modern name, in this case it's Home Rule Street, the location and the history of that site. So, for example, in streets, I'm going to break this down. Um, we have Home Rule Street in um, Dungarvan. So this is the, the, the lead entry here, the modern name. And we're looking at, we use GeoHive, which is the Jordan Survey Online uh, Mapping Service. So we can see the modern name of uh, Home Real Street is here, and it's located to the east of Strand uh, Strandside's side, 
Strand side east, uh, side, sorry, southeast, that sounds complicated. Um, but this is our thoroughfare, so it's giving you um, a verbal uh, description of where it is. Then we're concerned with the history of the street, so we see that it's unnamed in 1775, which is Scale, which is uh, the earliest reference that we have for it. It's also unnamed on Coote, until we see in the Boat Estate map in, uh, in 1832, it's called Kula Tallinn. We record um, the, the name changes, so in this case we see on the valuation map it's called Victoria Lane, and we go, we follow the history of the street right the way through to its modern street, which is Home Rule Street in circa 2019, and we'll also record the nameplates, and you probably can't see that there, but that's the nameplate for the town, and that's either get generated from walking the streets or from, uh, from Google Street View in this case. So street names can be useful in describing the function of the street or what it represented there. For example, Mill Street, there was a mill on the street, Schoolhouse Lane, Castle Street, Fish Amble Street, where the fish market would have been. And the case of Kula Tallinn, meaning a bend or corner or a nook, um, it's describing the shape of the street. Streets can also be named in honour of a landowner or developer, like Dawson Street or Gardner Street in Dublin, a monarch or a patriot, we've got Georgia Streets, O'Connell Streets, and in the case of Dungarvan, it was called Queen Victoria Street in, in, in 1851. Many Irish street names changed, particularly in the early 20th century. However, this example uh, in Dungarvan clearly illustrates the town corporation loyalties, honouring Gladstone's promise of home rule for Ireland ahead of his first bill in 1886. That's probably the quickest name change that I've come across so far in researching. Um, if you're a researcher looking at older sources, and in this case we'll look at some cross-references, um, this is uh, the uh, 1756 map, map Roque's exact survey of Dublin. If, you, if you're not familiar with Dublin, you might come across the Sackville Street and wonder where it was. Well, if you go into section 10 streets, you'll see that Sackville Street will direct you to O'Connell Street Upper. And if you go to O'Connell Street Upper, you'll get the full history of the thoroughfare. Sometimes uh, the historic sites are no longer extant, but we are we're able to use the historical mapping to give their precise location on a modern map. In this case, it's an area view of where the Dungarvan railway station was once located. Located, and again, this is using GeoHive. Railways have a great deal of infrastructure, which can alter the topographical landscape of a town. And if you wanted to find out more about the railway before it was the famous Greenway down there now, you'll find details of the railway bridge and how it was depicted by Stopford in 1880, and the history of the railway line itself. So another approach to a microhistory is to look at a particular building. And why not start here? Um, we know that the Royal Irish Academy has been in existence since 1785, but not always in this house. So what was this building before the Academy moved here in the 1850s? Well, if we go into residence in Dublin, we can find that it was estimated to be built in circa 1760 and was called Northland House. And it later became the Bishop of Derry's house in, in, in 1809. Like most Georgian townhouses, it had a stable and a coach house to the back, probably where we are right now. And we can trace the function of the building because it changed um, from residence to 21 entertainment, memorials and societies when it was a Freemasons Hall by 1828 and later the Irish Reform Club in the 1840s before the academy transferred to this house. And this house was seen as a desirable uh, place to move to because it was freestanding and it was thought to be less susceptible to fire, so it would protect the growing collection of the antiquaries and the manuscripts. So then you might ask, where was the academy before it came to Dawson Street? With a quick th search through 20 education, the, the academy is found on Grafton Street, opposite the Trinity Province House. Um, and it was granted the royal, you can see that it was granted the royal warrant in 1785 ahead of the charter in 1786 with the library being added in 1834. We can see again, this is a, quite a, an interesting history, it was located uh, in the former navigation house. And if you wanted to find out what that was, you can go to section 17 transport and you can see that it was originally built in 1763 and it was associated with the Grand Canal Company. Each atlas has a detailed bibliography, which you probably can't read this now, but um, if you want to find out more about a particular site or a further urban history of that particular town, you'll find multiple uh, publications there that will relate to it. In terms of macro histories, there are numerous ways in which the topographical information can be used to demonstrate various trends. In the first example from Dublin Part 3, the distribution of mills, metal founders and brewers uh, distillers and tanners are displayed on an 1843 base map. 
Access to water, as you can see, was important for the tanning and brewing sites, and they were often located um, on the outskirts of the town or the city. In this example from Belfast, uh, the vast number of known religious buildings that existed between 1842 and 1902 were also mapped from the topographical information in a city that serviced the fastest growing population in the later 19th century. Another example of a macro history um, is Limerick over uh, approximately 1,000 years. Various town walls, religious, administrative, defensive, and manufacturing sites are depicted on a modern base that also show, also show the development of the street system and land reclamation. The topographical expression of thematic sites can also help in understanding broader national events that took place. For example, could you correlate the increased access to literature in, uh, to the social and political movements of the later 18th century Ireland? We can see from the vast number of printing houses in Dublin added to the increased literacy with more schools for various classes of the population and, way, and different ways of circulation material could be seen a way, a, as one of the mobilizing factors of insurrection. Technological movements can also be tracked through the TI with the advent of the railway, mapping, communication and movement of people, goods and ideas. And this can be reflected in the changing industries appearing in towns over time. The impact of the railway can also be found topographically with the development of seaside towns and the promotion of healthy va values and movement of people into cities while also movement, people, uh, of movement of people into the suburbs. They also affected industry in both positive and negative ways, cheaper commodities, for example, from the vast factories imported from the larger cities, marked the end of many cottage industries that could no longer compete in the industrial age. And to conclude, the collaborative methodology uh, that has evolved allows atlases to be comparable nationally and internationally using both texts and maps. It is also regularly tested in academic publications and our annual seminars. And as illustrated in this talk, the information contained within the IHDA may be used in various ways to assist in various research th themes. We have a wide range of users who delve into the different aspects of the atlas, not just geographers and historians, but also archaeologists, architects, planners, librarians and archivists, digital mapping, and indeed anybody who has an interest in, an interest in the sense of place. The sources used and the references uh, will provide a platform for anybody wishing to delve further into urban studies. And I should say that this information is available through our 30 atlases, but also 28 of our atlases is, are available freely online, that you can probably about 40,000 sites that you're, you're available to download onto your phone right now. Thank you. give you an introduction to the Dictionary of Irish Biography this afternoon and we're also going to talk about a forthcoming volume that we're publishing with the RAA entitled Irish Sporting Lives. So the Dictionary um, was initially undertaken as a preparatory kind of research project in the 1980s and it proceeded to writing at kind of great volume and intensity in the 1990s and it was published originally in 2009 in both hard copy and online and in this sense we talk about the dib we we refer to the volumes, but most of us, even to this day, use the online. So it sort of uh, has two, two presences, so to speak. When published in 2009, it covered those dying up to 2002. And since then, we've undertaken two uh, uh, updates each year, adding new entries, um, often what we call missing persons or just people who've died more recently. And the missing persons might be people who have been unearthed by new research, research, new publications, or who a greater awareness and understanding has developed in the historical or public consciousness. Um, two public, uh, sorry, two supplementary hard copy volumes have been published to date, collecting the new material that tends to be published first on the website. And now, uh, in the last few years, we've taken the website open access, and it's available everywhere at dib.ie. 
There you can look at almost 11,000 lives um, from the full expanse of Irish history and the, the experience and lives of Irish overseas as well. Um, only in recent weeks we added 43 new entries and we now attach images of people uh, where possible, which I think adds a little something uh, to, to the dictionary. So Irish Sporting Lives will be published next month and it's going to collect uh, about 60 sporting lives taken from the DIB. When we first started this project 2014 initially, there's about 500, 530 people who have a sporting facet to their career in the dictionary. And when we settled on our selection, we, we, we worked hard to update and revise those lives that required a sort of light dusting or deep research to sort of take them up to date. We also excuse me, commissioned a handful of new entries for the volume, which I think really highlights the sort of growth of both sports history and the ability of us to interrogate the past through digitized resources, uh, primarily newspaper resources. But it really has changed the, the nature of biographical research substantially in the last decade uh, and a little longer. Um, the volume has a, has a fine introduction composed by uh, Professor Paul Rouse. And some of the interesting themes that come up uh, in reading the, the entries and looking at them in the round are emigration, gender, the railways, and it's been a real uh, joy to work on. Um, I'm just going to show you the cover here now, so just so you can recognise it in bookshops and encourage everyone you know to, uh, to maybe pick up a copy. And now I'm going to pass you over to Terry and we're just going to talk through ten, 10 lives that we found interesting. Okay, so what are the criteria for getting into our Irish Sporting Lives volume? Well, it helps to be successful, be it in terms of uh, winning trophies, breaking records, fame or notoriety is also good. Um, and here, of course, we should say that sporting celebrity is not the same thing as sporting greatness. Critical acclaim, well, I suppose by that we mean sporting greatness independence or separate from sporting success or sporting celebrity. So someone who was unjustly neglected perhaps didn't win much because they're on a weak team. Historically interesting, perhaps someone who achieved a historic first, such as the first person to win a gold medal for Ireland in the Olympics. Innovators are people who change their sport by developing a new strategy or technique. And finally, I should say, and I should also say, that we, uh, not everyone in the volume engages physically in sport at an elite level, so therefore we have sports coaches, sports founders, promoters, trainers, and the like. Now, in... Um, in making our selection, we wanted to achieve a, a varied and interesting mix. So we tried to go for chronological spread, both across the volume, but also within individual sports. Gender balance, for the purposes of getting a better gender balance, we commissioned five new entries on women, and we benefited from relatively recent published research done on the history of women's sport. Um, so we also go for a spread of sports um, and a spread of geographic representation, but by that we mean just uh, what part of Ireland our uh, subjects hail from. We have individuals who may not necessarily have had an outstanding sports career, but they had an interesting career. Uh, Shea Elliott would be an example of that. His career sheds a lot of light on the nature of professional cycling. And we also went for a spread of a uh, mix between team sports and individual sports. So as Tarlow said, we're gonna go through some of our lives just to give you a flavor of what's in our volume. So um, meet uh, Dan Donnelly, who is sketched here a little incongruously in gentleman's attire. He's a champion prize fighter of the 1810s. Uh, during, and during this period, um, the rules of that sport permitted not just bare knuckle brawling, but also butting, eye gouging, and hair pulling. Uh, he is Ireland's first proper sports celebrity. Huge crowds came out to see him fight in the Curra, where there's now a monument to him. Um, the fact that his victories were over English opponents added greatly to his popularity in Ireland. He's considered to be a very good but rather flawed fighter, not least because of his fondness for alcohol, which does in fact contribute to his early death. So he's an example of the pitfalls also of sporting celebrity. Um, thanks, Terry. This is an image of Joey Dunlop taken by a fan who is a friend of the, uh, the author of the entry in the early 1990s at the Isle of Man TT races. And by chance I grew up there, so I've always had an interest in Dunlop, if a little bit more than the sport. Dunlop hailed from Ballymoney County, Andrum, and was a superb self-taught mechanic who grew up in a cohort of friends who just loved racing bikes. And they were known as, known as the Armoy Armada. He started in local road racing and graduated to his first race in the Isle of Man in 1976, and he went on to win 26 TT titles, a record to this day. 
At his last appearance in 2000, he was aged 48, and he claimed three TT titles that week, something very, very rarely done. He did it three times, and he tops the all-time list to this day. Now, his nephew, Michael, in, Ju in June, won his 23rd title and is in third place. So it's, it's something of a family affair, road racing with the Dunlops. Um, Dunlop particularly excelled at what, what we call en engine management, getting the most out of your engine, and also developed an absolutely encyclopedic knowledge of the 38-mile course that c constitutes the TT race. Um, he very tragically died in 2000 in Tallinn, Estonia, um, racing there. And under, during his many trips to Eastern Europe where he would bring charity supplies, on one of them he took a detour to visit Imola in Italy to visit the shrine to uh, Ayrton Senna, which I think speaks to something about the tragedy and the respect that road racers and motor racers have for each other. Okay. Uh, this photo of Mabel Cahill gives you a sense of the unwieldy attire that 19th century women tennis players were obliged to perform in. Um, after emigrating to New York City, she gets the benefit of the higher standard of tennis that then prevailed in Ireland, and she goes on to dominate tennis in America between 1890 and 1893. She's not a popular champion in America, being much criticized for her masculine style of play, which we should take to mean she was very energetic about the court. Um, retiring from tennis, she moves to England, uh, falls into poverty, and eventually dies obscurely in a workhouse. So she is an example, I suppose, of the difficulties many people encounter upon retiring from elite sport. This is an image of Michael Cusick that's taken from a cropped photo of the TCD second 15 rugby team that was taken in the late 1870s. I think it's fair to say, as Terry said, it captures something of Cusick's pugnacity. Um, and he would not look out of place on a present day front row uh, team. Um, Cusick's is an incredibly fascinating figure. He taught at Blackrock and Clongos colleges and then established his own academy in Dublin, captaining the rugby team. And he played rugby occasionally into the 1880s. But as a sportsman, he really enjoyed playing cricket, played hurling and football, and excelled at the high jump and weight throwing events. And it was engaging with athletic events that led him to sort of really, really perceive perniciously the social elitism and the widespread gambling that was latent in Victorian sports culture in Dublin and Ireland. And he really embraced the Gaelic revival. He was a native Irish speaker from the Burren, and he was present at the famous meeting at Hayes Hotel in Thurles in November 1884, founding the GAA. And he's an absolutely fascinating figure. Uh, this is Molly Gill in her Komogi uniform. Um, as you can see, it's fairly constrictive, though an improvement on what Mabel Cahill was wearing earlier. Uh, Molly is a fervent advocate of women's right to play sports. She's also easily the best Komogi player of the first generation of Komogi players. She plays on into her mid-40s, which is long enough for her to win two All-Ireland medals with Dublin. These are the first All-Ireland Komogi championships held in the early 1930s. She's also president of the Camogie Association from 1919 to the late 1930s. As such, she presides over a period of expansion in her sport, while also striving to preserve her association's independence from the male-dominated GAA. Gender politics does, however, play a role in her eventual ousting as president of the Camogie Association. This is an image of Pat Taff um, on Arkell in the Rothcon Rothconnell Handicap hurdle in Nace in 1962, and even establishing that took a couple of days' work because one of the great joys of this volume was locating images and finding out if the image actually contained who it was said to uh, contain. Taff hailed from Athcool, and his father had been a successful uh, Grand National winning trainer, and his brother Toss was also a prominent jockey. Uh, Taff really came into his prime in the 1960s as the jockey, just as he came across the, fame, the yet to be famous Arkell, who was coming to the fore, and, they, and Taff soon began to train the horse. He was the only jockey to ride him over fences, and together they won 22 of their 26 steeplechases, including three consecutive Cheltenham Gold Cups, before Arkell retired in the end of 1966. Taff himself retired in 1970 as the leading jump jockey of his generation, and perhaps an even greater accolade. He went on to become a very successful trainer in his own right, and he's one of about three or four lives from equine and horse culture we have in the volume, um, which is one of the joys of putting it together. Uh, Bill McCracken's successful career as a fullback for Newcastle United highlights some of the growing pains associated with the early days of professional sport. Um, thus, his transfer to Newcastle United becomes the subject of an FA investigation amid claims of secret payments. Likewise, he goes nearly a decade without playing for Ireland due to a dispute over money. Uh, he achieves notoriety for his clever exploitation of the offside 
law, eventually almost single-handedly forcing the authorities to change the offside law. Uh, his tactics are widely considered to be unsporting, and opposing fans regularly pelt him with coin, fruit, and other missiles. For his part, he revels in this controversy and is, a, is an instance of how sport thrives off having villains as well as heroes. And this photo here gives you a good sense of his swagger and self-confidence. Um, this is an image of Elizabeth LeBlond taken from um, her book, Two True Tales of Mountain Adventures. And it's really interesting to see what she's wearing to climb there. She was really a true aristocrat, presented at court in her teens. She had never laced her own boots or shoes before she was in her mid-twenties, having been basically dressed by her maid every day. She first visited Chamonix in the French Alps for health reasons around 1881, and that was the beginning of her interest in mountaineering and winter sports. She went on to tobog toboggan, ice skate, um, but it was in, as a climber over the next two, two decades in the Alps and also in Norway that she really made an impact, um, undertaking many first ascents, new climbs and new routes, and she became really one of the most successful climbers of men or women of her day. LeBlanc was a pioneer of mountain photography, which, uh, I'm sorry, and also of filmmaking in the mountains, and one of the very earliest women filmmakers. And she published many travelogues, not just about her climbing, but also her travels in Europe and Africa, and a lot of journalism too. Um, here you can see her wearing climbing attire, but very interestingly, she would only leave the village dressed in conventional skirt, and when, when out of sight of the village or the local climbing settlement, would change into this, what she called rational dress, which I think was Terry stressed with two of the other women in the volume, dress and gender are, much, are really part of uh, the, their lives and absolutely fascinating to read about now. Uh, an accomplished equestrian in her, her own right, Nanny Power O'Donoghue is notable mainly for popularising horse riding among women, specifically among socially aspiring middle class women such as herself. Um, she writes two very influential best-selling books in the 1880s which give advice to women horse riders. Uh, much of her advice is ahead of its time, with the important exception of her firmly held belief that women should always ride side saddle and never astride a horse. In this, she was upholding a long-held convention that crumbles only in the early 20th century. Nonetheless, her contradictory attitudes, her partial feminism, is important for showing how women could pursue this particular sporting pastime without forfeiting either their femininity or social respectability. This is an image of uh, Terry or Teresa Mullen, um, taken from when she won the gold medal in the Bowls event at the 19, 1988 Seoul Olympics. Uh, sorry, Seoul Paralympics, excuse me. And this was the first time that she competed outdoors and also outside of Britain and Ireland. And she traveled to Seoul at the, uh, against the advice of her medical team and her f support and her family, because she was not just uh, paraplegic at that point, but also enduring a very serious bout of cancer. Every day she left her uh, sickbed to compete and returned immediately to rest. Um, it's quite an amazing story in and of, in and of itself. To me, this is a really important entry to be in the book for a number of reasons, but when we came to track down images, which was a true joy, you would not believe how many organizations we contacted who did not have an image of Terry Mullen, Irish, British Isles, international uh, specialist organizations. Eventually, um, I, I went back to the newspaper archives, The Wonder of Digitization, and I found an article mentioning her sister, an Eileen Barron of Rohini. I then found mention of Eileen in a death notice, uh, during COVID, and that allowed me to find likely numbers in an old hard copy phone book. Do you remember those? A few barons in Rohini, I rang for months and months and months, and eventually her sister picked up the phone and we tracked down an image. And I'm really proud of that coming into the volume uh, and also the range of lives that we're representing uh, in the collection we've put together. Okay, so what are some of the recurring themes we see in our sports volume? Well, class and sport is one. Uh, particularly in the 19th century, there's a sense of sport being a, a luxury good. There's a sense that certain sports are appropriate for certain classes and certain genders. And linked with the class basis of sport, we see the persistence of the amateur ideal well into the 20th century. Nationalism can have, sport can thrive off nationalism, but we also see nationalism can have a very disruptive effect on sports sometimes. The role of the media is obviously very important. Uh, the print media is crucial in the 19th century. And then from the 60s and 70s onwards, television gives sports stars a whole new level of celebrity. Emigration, well, like everyone else in Irish society, many, many of our sports men and women frequently have to go abroad to pursue their dream. Gender in sport is a huge topic in this volume. 
Uh, we repeatedly see obstacles being put in the way of women who want to pursue sport. Elite sports women frequently find themselves having to act as advocates for the right of women to play sport. And then there's retirement. Uh, people retire from sport relatively early in life and can live for many decades afterwards. Some continue in their sport in a coaching or organizational capacity. Uh, some forge whole new careers very successfully, but many struggle with and ultimately succumb to depression, poverty, and alcoholism. So on that cheery note, our presentation is at an end. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Well, the answer is that the big Latin dictionaries everyone knows about are at least mainly lexicons of the classical language, that of the Roman Empire and antiquity. Not everyone realizes that when the formal structures of that empire fell apart in the early 5th century, its official language, Latin, continued with undiminished vitality as the everyday spoken tongue of the people across most of its territory. Far from going into a decline, Latin went on developing naturally and in different ways in different places, eventually becoming the separate languages that we know as Spanish, French, Italian, and so on. But people didn't stop reading and writing during the millennium and a half that this transition took. Indeed, the written Latin output of the period completely dwarfs the amount of material that had been composed during imperial times. Yet, standard Latin dictionaries deal only with the earlier classical period, while standard dictionaries of Spanish, French, etc. deal only with the modern tongues. Only in recent decades has an attempt been made to reckon systematically with the huge amount of documentation from the medieval period that lies in between, namely by means of the European scheme that I'm talking about, whose mosaic-like makeup reflects the geographical diversification of the language itself. As the map shows, there are about 16 projects involved. Years or even decades of work have already gone into most of them, and a few are now complete. Some, like those being compiled in Spain, track the seamless development of their local vernaculars from something very like classical Latin down to something approaching the modern Romance tongues of their various areas, Castilian, Catalan, whatever. Others, like our own DMLCS project, deal with a Latin that may never have been the everyday tongue of the regions they cover, but which nevertheless was a key medium by which the local medieval civilization enshrined itself for written transmission to posterity. In respect of the territory covered by the DMLCS project specifically, um, our non-classical lexicon of Celtic Latinity has so far been published for letters A to H, and drafts have been completed, or nearly so, for all of the remaining letters except the small letter O and the huge letter S. We have said that we will finish by 2025, which will place us in about the middle of the pack in terms of progress made by the various ventures in the European scheme. In the meantime, every few years, the editorial teams of the scheme meet for a colloquium, and this usually proves useful because we have so much in common. Indeed, we have a lot in common with dictionary projects generally, even when their subject matter isn't Latin at all, but a different language entirely. And this because of the similarities methodologically. In particular, it's helpful to be able to compare notes with one another when something new comes up in terms of technique, so as to avoid inefficiently reinventing the wheel. If you're wondering in what context such new things can come up after all these years, the answer these days is, digitization. All of the medieval Latin projects, as well as others, are now engaged in various forms of digitization, though we were the first to do so, just putting that out there. The point is that issuing a dictionary, any dictionary in digital form, potentially makes it enormously much more informative to the user than is the very same dictionary containing the same information when presented on paper. In our own project, we're presenting it both ways, by the way. I don't think book versions will ever go out of use, but digitization can supplement them wonderfully. And here's how. Let's take a more or less randomly selected set of consecutive entries from our DMLCS dictionary. As with all dictionaries, the reason these particular entries are consecutive is, of course, the fact that they are arranged alphabetically. But if that is the reason for their sequencing, it follows that their definitions will come from all over the semantic range. As one can see, even just this set of a few consecutive Latin words beginning with the letter A manages to embody meanings as diverse as adjoining together, combining or integrating, or to hook or catch, and words for the tide, for intercession, and for supportive. Now, let's say we're interested in a particular one of these, namely a tide. If we want to find out what other Latin words mean, a tide, a hard copy version of the dictionary won't help us. The words will be scattered around the alphabet, and we'd have to leaf through the whole dictionary to find them. 
but with the digital version we can search on the definitions just as readily as on the Latin headwords. And searching on the English word tide in our dictionary duly produces this result. And as you can see, the Latin headwords now begin with various letters of the alphabet because the organizing principle of the set has switched to the definition, not the alphabetical sequence. We've actually published this particular result on tides as a separate spin-off interpretative article, the information having originally been requested of us by a retired sea captain, not a Latinist at all. And this shows how digitally searching on definitions can be useful for people interested in a particular topic, concept or entity. Something else that we can see varying between the entries that are united by referring to tides is, of course, the different sources from which the examples are drawn. In our usage, now highlighted in red as you see, three-letter abbreviations refer to classes of texts where these are anonymous, so SCH means scholastic and THL means theological, and four-letter ones name identifiable authors. So we can see that writers in our corpus who refer to tides included the geographer Digwill, that's D-I-C-L, the Breton monk Billy, and others, including, perhaps most interestingly, the mysterious 7th century Irishman Virgilius Maro Grammaticus. As one can see here, he coined the Latin word deundare to refer to the ebb of the tide. But what other new words did he generate? Again, it would take us ages trawling through the paper dictionary to find out. But with a digital version, we can search on Virgilius's reference code, namely VGLG, and here is part of the result. As can be seen, the headwords are spread widely through the alphabet, and the definitions range equally widely in semantic terms. This author made up a great many words, so this is just a selection. But even from this one screenful, he can be seen to have coined an adjective meaning concise and an adverb for long ago, together with new nouns for things as disparate as famous people, an exposition, a meal, and the making of riddles or puzzles, as well as generating a verb meaning to arm with a spear. And Virgilius's tied word is merely one of these. By searching on the VGLG code in this way and using all the data from the result, our project has in fact been able to publish a fairly thorough scholarly article on precisely the word coinings of Virgilius Marogrammaticus, as well as various separate analyses of the uses of other named authors by means of searching on the specific codes we had allocated to them. This shows how digitally searching on authors can be useful for people interested in literary history. Let's go back to another set of consecutive words from the DMLCS dictionary. As before, these are consecutive because of being arranged according to how they're spelt, and they mean all sorts of different things. But this time, let's concentrate on something else that varies about them, namely the geographical areas from which the examples in the text are derived. This information is embodied in the codes we use to key the references. Thus, A refers to the former Roman Britain, C to works by Irish monks on the continent, E to Scotland, and D to Brittany. Here we see a new word for a sister being used by a Breton monk. But how many other coinings in Celtic Latinity were generated by, specifically, Bretons? Again, having a digital version of the dictionary means we can search on the geographical codes, and so here is part of what we get if we use the D code to look for Brittany. Again, the Latin headwords, though of course still in alphabetical order, are no longer directly sequential. And again, the meanings, well, they can be all kinds of things. By using a similar search to identify words coined in Wales, and to compare them with Latin words invented by the Irish, I have in fact been able to publish an assessment of the nature of the language in those two countries in the early Middle Ages. It was striking how different it appears to have been, and this prompted a surprising, but I hope convincingly documented, conclusion about the longevity of Latin in Celtic Britain after the Roman withdrawal. It may have lasted up to Norman times, 
a point of great interest to national and social historians in Wales. This shows how digitally searching on geographical provenance can be useful for people interested in comparative philology. But back to Brittany. You'll see that one of the words coined there means white-fronted geese. The context shows that the term is being used precisely here in what we can classify as a specifically zoological sense. Well, you can guess where we're going next. A lot of revealing light can be cast upon the particular interests or concerns of any society by looking to see what technical terms it has felt necessary to coin. Embedded in the entries of our dictionary are 14 distinct labels to flag such specialist vocabulary. The zoological label that you see here is just one of them. The others, including botanical, musical, medical, philosophical, and so on, and the results of this are potentially of great value to scholars of any of the disciplines concerned. This shows how digitally searching on technical labels can be useful for people interested in particular areas of specialization, the very theme that informed the Munich colloquium of editors at which that display of dictionaries was uh, put forward. As an example, taking the zoological label specifically, and searching for that across all areas of our DMLCS dictionary gives this result. Again, the entries come from across the alphabet as far as, as far as we've compiled it. And as far as the meanings are concerned, they range across the whole animal and bird kingdom from slow worms to sparrow hawks and from periwinkles to stoats. And the search even reveals a contrastive cross-reference between different kinds of geese. So, natural historians, please take note. As I said before, the searching opportunities I've shown are in principle applicable to any systematic dictionary of any language because hardworking lexicographers will already have packed all the information into it in much the same way that we have. The value that systematic digitization has added to our own dictionary and can do to others is the ability to retrieve it all again for any number of purposes in a systematic, comprehensive and coherent way. Thank you very much. And just to say Best to get going while, while some people are still in the room. <laughs> it's been a long day for a lot of us. Uh, thank you very much for um, hanging around to hear what I have to say. Tama Harve Sasta, Veliv, Rish, Vima Kantni Sluchanu, Erin Gestierne, Martin O'Kain, Agus Anoberta Gentogin, Lerwent Blienta, Er. Erin Varsho, I guess, and Maid Kershamach. So, what I would like to, to use my time to do is to introduce and discuss a linguistic resource produced by the Academy for uh, Lexicography uh, by the Folklore Starul Nagailiga team. But a word first about the project, if you'll indulge me. Um, the current team is just the latest iteration of something which has been going on since around 1880 in the Academy, that is the pursuit of a, an authoritative comprehensive dictionary for the Irish language. Um, the first output I brought along as a prop, which was um, a part of the letter D, uh, prepared by Carl Marstrander and published in 1913, um, known as Marstrander's D <laughs> by those of us in the trade. and. Uh, I'll return in a nod to Marstrander in a while. But uh, the current iteration, as I say, is part of an intergenerational effort at this point to secure for Irish uh, an authoritative, comprehensive dictionary on historical principles. We are working currently on the modern period. And I suppose in, in many 
the, the same respect as Anthony just described, the, the digital platform for lexicography has been a game changer for Irish in as much as it has been for any other language. So to Martin O'Kine, which Ma Martin O'Kine's dictionary has been a byproduct of our broader lexicographical effort, um, which we from time to time like to publish uh, in order to, to, to serve a need out there to have these um, lexicographical resources um, brought on stream before the culmination of our work in the publication of the final historical dictionary. So uh, um, Martin O'Kine was a Gaeltacht writer, uh, born 1906, died 1970, a writer of essays, novels and short stories. He was a pioneering teacher in various contexts as disparate as primary school in Galway, the Curra internment camp where he taught Irish and latterly as professor of Irish in Trinity College Dublin where he was employed at the time of his death. He was a proponent of social justice and a campaigner for civil rights, particularly for Ireland's Gaeltacht population. Uh, but it is for his preeminence as a writer of prose that he is perhaps well, most, well, most widely renowned. And his 1948 novel, Creine Kille, um, has been translated recently into um, English in two versions, but 10 other languages as well as English. So there's a worldwide impact with O'Kine, um, which is sometimes occluded in the Anglosphere uh, due to the fact that his novel and work wasn't fulsomely, let's say, available in, in English. But he is getting renewed recognition because of translation. Um, it's rather clever to commission two translations at once because it showed, um, it, it sidestepped the idea that had been current for a long time that it was impossible to translate Crane Achille into English. So in order to avoid the controversial step of producing a canonical translation, two very different ones were produced, which I thought was a very um, clever way around and also very useful for provoking de debate about O'Kine again. Um, and just since you're in here, Alan Titley, MRIA, was the translator of one of them, so I better mention him. Um, so this idea of O'Kine being inaccessible and inaccessibility, this was a tag which attached itself to O'Kine and his work um, right down through the sort of later part of the last century. Um, a lot of readers who were comfortable with other contemporary Geltacht authors, they have admitted to struggles in their reading of O'Kine. Due, I suppose, to the unapologetically high register of O'Kine's prose, which sets him apart from most of his contemporaries, he was a writer with a breathtaking vocabulary, comfort comfortably drawing on the language of folklore and older, older folkloristic sources, as well as the modern tongue around him and indeed utilitarian modern terminology as well. But all the time rooted in the cadences, rhythms and vocabulary of his local area of uh, Galway. Born just out, outside Anspidzil, um, there's a, a new statue which was unveiled on the 50th anniversary of his death, just this summer actually, COVID delayed. So you will be able to see if you're driving west from Galway City on the right, O'Kine is in, in over the back of that, that hill and Crook on Glass is his townland. Much of the vocabulary which appears in his works is peculiar to that dialect and indeed to that sub-dialect of Galway Irish. And it is no longer in this, the first half of the 21st century, commonly taught in schools and universities, nor is it to be heard except among a particular generation and class of speaker within that area itself. The rural Geltacht life depicted so richly by O'Kine's speech has also all but disappeared with sweeping socioeconomic changes so well documented which took hold and swept through rural Ireland, Geltacht and outside the Geltacht of course in the latter half of the 20th century. But access to O'Kine has in recent years been aided by new and by different media. Uh, the DIB have a splendid entry on him, for example. And I've, co I've mentioned the two translations of his Crane Achille. In addition to those, some of his short stories have appeared in very attractive volumes, which have the English on the left and the, the Irish on the left and the English on the page, allowing 
people to sort of compare and as a crutch, I suppose, to help you through the, the Irish version on your left. So there are being attempts made largely through translation to give access to O'Kine, but translations are adaptations and translations are imitations. They are not the real thing. So the question remains, how to give readers a key to unlock O'Kine, to unlock the treasure chest of his work in its original idiom? Is there a way to facilitate study of O'Kine's manipulation of language to gain an insight into his own understanding of the semantic value of his written dialect? <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> and uh, O'Kine left behind among his manuscripts a dictionary, a dictionary of his own dialect, a dictionary of his own dialect commissioned by the Irish government in their efforts to collect common speech in order to inform the production of an Irish English dictionary. So O'Kine, in that effort, compiled over 1.1 million words of handwritten text, such as we see here. In a, th th that's one of the more legible um, examples which I've used for the presentation. Um, but they, they, he, he wrote this in a range of formats across a range of different notebooks, um, types of paper, um, sometimes in portraits, sometimes in landscape. So there was quite a, a large manuscript body of material which was in the Angoum offices, the Angoum archive in the National Archives because it, it had remained there since it was drawn upon for the publication of the 1977 Folklore Gaelic Beirla, or FGB, as we know it, by Neil O'Donnell. But this text, over 1.1 million words, as I said, we find O'Kine ruminating at leisure on meanings, nuances of meanings, of words and phrases in his own dialect. We find paragraph-long examples of usage alongside other examples which are short, pithy sentences, but all of which are customised and crafted by Martin O'Kine in order to exemplify the dialect and the literary linguistic tradition in which he was steeped since birth um, and, of course, which he put to such brilliant use in his prose. Um, we found it, as I say, in the National Archives. We, discussed, we also went to O'Kine's own papers, which are in the Library of Trinity College Dublin, and we found further notebooks and pieces of this dictionary, which we were able to put together like a jigsaw and come up with his entire work of lexicography in manuscript form. He worked on it during a 10-year period, 1937 to 1946-ish, from what we can tell. And during that time, four of those years, he spent in the Curragh as an internee for membership of the IRA. And another, a separate year, he spent as a prisoner in Arbor Hill. So if we discount those years, or discount perhaps the amount that he may have been able to achieve in those years, his achievement is remarkable in the terms of his output. Um, so the papers as we found them were analysed, edited by the Folklore Stadul Nagaliga team, FNG team here in the Royal Irish Academy. And the decision we took early on because of the scope and size of the material to publish in a customised online format, which would be familiar to contemporary dictionary users. And so the, 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 the lemma or the headword would be followed by O'Kine's description of it, followed by his definition, followed by his um, examples. And this was not his approach uniformly across his own work. So we, in many respects, produced a template into which O'Kine would fit. This is what we come up with in, in metrics. Um, 750 lexemes or headwords within which are hidden over a thousand sense units, uh, where a word means more than one thing, essentially. But on the second row there, you can see where we really found the treasure, the gold of all this, lex lexicographically speaking, and that is in the 16,000 odd examples of use. So in, in rudimentary terms, in order to give examples, in order to exemplify 750 words, he gives 16,000 examples, which shows you the, the, the the scope of what he undertook to do. And um, what we have published last year, and back to Marstrander, we published the letter D, because that's how we do things in the Royal Arts Academy. <laughs> we like to nod to our forebears. 
Um, so we published Okines D largely because Okines D constitutes half of what Okine put out. The letter D forms half of his entire dictionary output. So the second half, all the other letters in their more fragmented style, is coming soon. But what we have out there, free to browse and search and peruse at leisure, is 500,000 words of Okine's un hitherto unpublished text. So each headword, I'll bring you on. So you saw that was damnu, damnium that I just showed you, the headword to, to damn or condemn. Um, and that is what it looks like now that we've finished with it in a way. We've, we've um, as I say, followed the, the sort of rules of web presentation in terms of font size and um, links, hyperlinks. We have a, a, a list of words, a headword list on the right where people can browse. So if you go online yourself, you can have a browse and a look around it. That is the default version. And a reader can stick with that if they like, but for those more versed in the dialect and in pre-standard spelling, um, a click of a mouse will take you to another version with the exact same layout, but with O'Kine's spelling. So not the spelling, not normalized, the spelling not standardized, um, if, you, if you can undertake to, to read it in that form. Furthermore, again, leveraging the full potential of digital presentation, um, if you would like to see it without our idea of how it should be structured, you can press a button again and go and see the head word exactly using the layout or the visualization that O'Kine had in his manuscript. Um, so it's all there, to, free of charge, to read and peruse and analyze as you please. It's the perfect vehicle, we think, for the publication of his huge and unwieldy work. Again, as Anthony just pointed out, the potential of a digital edition to cross-reference to allow searches of the entire text as well as searches based on alphabetically ordered lists of headwords is fully harnessed. So where Domini, shown here, appears within the body of a text exemplifying a different headword, it is shown in that context. So readers of Okine have been provided with what is an invaluable resource for gaining an understanding into his manipulation of his language. He, has, he was given the epithet Ri Anokul, the king of words or, or word king um, by the people of Connemara, uh, who, among whom he, he grew up, of course, and who is still rightly renowned. But in this dictionary, we find that, I think we find that king in his proper kingdom. He's, he's working on words. He's exemplifying engaging in deep dives into semantics, into contexts, into phrases, um, and I think almost joyfully, creatively uh, coming up with examples in order to, to exemplify usage. But we are given insights too into his creativity, because as he crafted examples of usage, we find characters, scenes, speeches, and settings which can be found again a little down the road in his short stories and in his novels. Bearing in mind that Crane Achille, his great novel, is driven almost entirely by speech rather than a tra traditional narrative style. And you can see immediately the value of a dictionary of speech which he himself created two or three years before Crane Achille appeared. Just at the beginning of the COVID lockdown in March 2020, um, I had cause to contemplate the idea of hermits and hermitage in the Irish tradition, and I had a look at the term G. Ravach and its predecessors going back to the earliest extent of the Irish written tradition in an attempt to, to be relevant <laughs> to, <laughs> to lockdown when we were all feeling lonely and sequestered. And um, in O'Kine, O'Kine has it under D, of course, as a, an entry, and um, it's very useful to show how he also created a thesaurus under many of his headwords, where we see here that under G. Um, the, the, the word, the official word for hermit, he has, goes to great lengths to show that it means something else in his dialect. Um, I translated it then for the blog post that I published, and I've reproduced my translations here. And um, they have the imprimatur of quite uh, respected Connemara. <laughs> 
uh, Irish speaker, so I'm happy enough to, to show them off. Um, but first of all, his, his Irish uh, glosses are Goror, Gil Trua, Dorodan Donna, Free Jorin, Fehitech, Sheikla, Dinian, Behiach, the Antoka, and Nuas, Eg Avgar, Eg Fuacht, Eg Chinus Noelle, Dinne, Behiach, no Rodgan in Tiger, Kropach, Dilachta, no Dinner, Dinner of a Faka, Eravarier Gear. So for one simple lexeme, he goes to great lengths to, I suppose, show us the, the, the different alternative terms for it. Um, my translation, someone who can only sit by the fire, a pitiful type, a puny, unfortunate person, a little article, someone wasted away, a tiny creature, a person or animal stricken by ill fortune, by cold, by illness or other, a person, animal or thing without substance, a shrunken thing, an orphan, or a person in a bad way. It's a lovely example to show, of course, how in a particular dialect, the official meaning of a word can be shifted or changed into something um, much more reflective of the lived experience of the people. So that's obviously before he goes on to give fulsome examples of Jihravach in context. So we hope that the provision of this resource proves to be of use in propelling the study of Okine into the future. Um, as people engage more with scholarship on digital terms, we hope that Okine, Foklori Khine, as well as our growing suite of research tools for Irish lexicography and literature uh, will be of huge importance and of huge benefit to the general public, to scholars, to students, and to academia. Uh, the publication of the Okine resource goes to the heart of what Folklore and Staru Nagelega wants to be about, that is, providing access to authoritative accounts of the meaning and usage of Irish words from the modern period, 1600 to the present day. Where this goal is in harmony with the provision of in infrastructure which allows scholars to gain new insights into the works of a Geltacht author such as Martin O'Kine, we are doubly proud. The other tools here, uh, which you may have come across my colleagues outside talking about and demonstrating, are the, the growing historical corpus of Irish, which we're working on constantly. Uh, 19 million words available to search from the period 1600 to 1926, available online since 2017. Since 2016, our searchable database of the Gaelic Journal, Irish Lorna Gaelica, uh, a monthly publication over the period 1882 to 1909. So much of revival thought is in there. And we have allowed all of the digital search facilities which I've described to take place on that journal. And thirdly, a dictionary of, of dialect words in the uh, UCD dialect archive, which, which we produced as an IRC funded resource in 2014. So I suppose, Back to good old Marstrander. Um, this, this is one end of the effort, 1913, and here we are, 2022, still, I suppose, engaged in the effort. And in the meantime, we get to produce, I think, um, useful, relevant resources. And of course, the beautiful displays you've seen of the 100 words, all of course emanates from the same lexicographical effort which has been ongoing here, and I think which has um, done so much for the reputation of the Academy for generations. Thank you. That's everything. Go to Mahito. Hi, um, good to see you. My name's Claire Lanigan and I am a digital archivist with the Digital Repository of Ireland and I'm going to talk about the DRI and about the project that I work on which is called Archiving Reproductive Health. 
So first, a bit about the DRI. Um, it's a national digital repository for Ireland's humanities, social science and cultural heritage data. And what this means is uh, dig either born digital or digitised versions of arts and humanities and social science material, which could be anything from museum collections to paper digitized paper archives, to research data generated by sociologists, to many other things, um, are, pr are preserved in a system of federated storage and uh, specially built software. And it's viewable through the website dri.ie, but it's also stored for long-term preservation and access. So it can be viewed by anybody by looking on the website, but it's also anybody who deposits data can be assured that it would be preserved for the long term. Um, we go operate on a member system, so organizations join as members and then they deposit their collections. Most of our members are cultural heritage organizations or universities, but we've also expanded into a lot of smaller organizations, community groups, local history groups, uh, uh, local authorities, and some, and some volunteer groups as well. So we have a, quite a broad range of members and we are always kind of interested in meeting with more. So uh, the Digital Repository of Ireland is publicly funded and it's uh, operated across three institutions here at the Royal Irish Academy, Trinity College Dublin and Maynooth University. So we have staff across all three institutions working on archiving and technical and policy um, aspects of digital preservation. We have a, um, a, a, qual a core trust seal ver verification. This is a a type of verification that's awarded to digital repositories that can maintain material for the long term. So it's quite a, it's quite a, a reassuring and um, it's an estimation that the material in the DRI would be preserved for the long term. Uh, material in DRI is committed to uh, open access and fair data. So the principle behind open access is similar to open science. It's kind of part of the same umbrella term, open research. And the idea is that uh, research, especially research which is publicly funded, is also publicly available and accessible without paywalls. So our material abides by a uh, EU principle or international principle called fair data, which means findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So this means that the formats we use are interoperable and open source and the licenses for reuse are generally open licenses like Creative Commons or similar. So uh, the vast majority of the collections in the repository are free to access. Uh, some are slightly restricted just to educational use, but for the most part any person who is browsing can see everything in our collections. Um, every, every data set or object in the repository has a data site digital object identifier and this is a unique URL which is used to identify the object and to, so it's like a link that will always take you back to the original object and is persistent so you can use it as a citation. The metadata, which is like the descriptive data about each collection and each object, is always visible even if the collection itself is restricted. And again, it is universally published with a Creative Commons attribution or CC BY uh, license. <coughs> Excuse me. The project that I work on is called Archiving Reproductive Health. It's funded by Welcome um, and it's working to provide long-term preservation and access to a large number of uh, at-risk di at digital archives which were generated by grassroots women's reproductive health movements before and during the campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment in Ireland. I'm sure most people are familiar with the context, but just briefly, um, in 2018, the Irish public voted in a national referendum to repeal the Eighth Amendment of the Irish Constitution, which enabled the government to pass legislation enabling elective abortion care for the first time in the nation's history. So uh, when we got the funding, it was underneath Welcome's umbrella of um, archiving health data. So they were interested in both the story of the campaign and then also the story of... Um, women's reproductive health as a whole in Ireland up to that point. So we um, focused in on both data sets from researchers that looked at the health aspect and then um, data sets from campaign groups that looked at the activist um, angle. So at the start of the campaign, at the start of the project, actually there was two projects initially. There was one uh, funded also by Welcome that was operated by UCD called Archiving the Eighth. And Archiving the Eighth basically catalogued and sorted out and identified what material was out there in relation to that recent referendum and reached out to a number of, uh, a very broad range of organizations and individuals to see if any of them or all or some of them would be interested in working with either um, Archiving the Eighth or our project for long-term preservation. 
So after some time, uh, a number of organizations um, were willing, uh, sort of a, a, not a huge amount of organizations, but the ones that were willing to, to deposit data with the project and kind of work with us were very keen to do so. So we worked together as stakeholder organizations. So some of these you can see um, displayed on the screen here. There was Together for Yes, the national campaign for a yes vote in the referendum. There's a TFMR, Terminations for Medical Reasons, the Abortion Rights Campaign, the Coalition to Repeal the Eighth, and also the uh, administrators of the In Her Shoes Facebook page, which was a page dedicated to people who could anonymously tell stories of their medical experiences underneath the Eighth Amendment over many years. So basically, these organizations donated their digital, most of which was born digital material. So because a lot of them were quite recent, it wasn't really a case of having to digitize physical objects. The material was already in a digital form. And <clears throat> we worked then, we have been working with the organizations to deposit this material and publish it in the repository, on, again under open licenses, and attribute it to the individual organizations. So the organizations still retain the ownership and the rights and the attribution over what they have created, but the um, material is now available, like, as in a lot of stuff that has been generated in the last few years is kind of published here and there everywhere online without any particular kind of care for whether it's being published under any kind of proper attribution. So this way there is a kind of formalized way by which material such as reports or visual, um, visual uh, addendums to campaign events like marches can actually be cited as research objects and cited by use of digital object identifiers attributed to their creators and then licensed for reuse under a open license like Creative Commons. So we had a large number of material from um, these stakeholder organizations, and we also gathered a good deal of research data. Most of this is oral history interviews with medics and activists who have been active in Ireland over the last 40 or so years. Um, so uh, to date, we have published a number of collections which showcase work from the stakeholder organizations and also some research data sets. So the collections include, but are not limited to, a number of photographs, videos, and design assets from Marches for Choice, which were annual marches that still operate, but were at their height in the years between 2013 and 2018. These were organized by the Abortion Rights Campaign. A large number of design assets and press materials from um, the other stakeholder organizations, particularly Together for Yes, and also a large number of administrative documents, especially um, reports written and issued by our stakeholder organizations. For example, you can see there a bit of a cover to, of uh, terminations for medical reasons written submission to the Citizens' Assembly, which was operational in 2016 and 2017, and was a national assembly of citizens who were convened to consider the question of the Eighth Amendment and whether it should be put to a referendum. We also have a large number of documentation that was um, submitted to UN committees over the years by uh, both the abortion rights campaign and other organizations as well. Um, some of the research data collections that we have, as I was saying, we had oral history interviews with medics, campaigners, and various women's and health rights activists in Ireland. Uh, some of the organizations which have provided uh, research data sets, as well as some individual researchers, are Real Productive Justice Project, Gender and Disabilities, which is a disability rights um, entity based in uh, National University of Ireland, Galway. Uh, the Irish Qualitative Data Archive, which is a founder member of DRI, based in Maynooth, but collects qualitative data from sociological projects around the country. And then a number of individual researchers. And then, as, as I was saying, we have a selection of stories from the Facebook page In Her Shoes, most of which are restricted access due to various reasons to do with um, uh, data protection, even though they're they were publicly visible on Facebook. We had an obligation as a nationally funded repository with um, ethical protocols to provide a certain amount of restriction on those stories because they were originally anonymous, so we weren't able to get explicit consent from the per people who had published them for archiving them and DRI in a public way. But a certain percentage of them had already been published in a book, and the people who had submitted their stories for the book had agreed for that to be archived. So those stories are visible on DRI and can be read. They're read as text files. Archiving the actual social media platform is something that we have not been able to do. It's quite tricky because most social media platforms um, don't tend to make their basic platform software available for long-term archiving, even though sometimes you can get API or you can get sometimes it's open source platforms. 
<clears throat> the structure of it is changes so often that anything you could archive at one point could be completely obsolete by a later point. So we decided to just take the text so that at least the essence of the stories would be preserved, even if we couldn't get the, the way they were rendered or any of the commentary underneath, which was what we originally had hoped to do. But for now, that is, we, we thought it was better to archive what we could and then uh, continue on from there. One important part of the um, project has been setting up a stakeholder advisory forum. So the idea behind this was to kind of get an idea of the best way to approach and, and archive these collections. So we, we convened a forum made up of representatives from the stakeholder organizations that I just mentioned, as well as experts in the fields of research ethics, reproductive justice, and sociological data. So when we first met with, the, with our forum, we put a number of questions to the forum asking what would be the most appropriate way, for example, to archive the In Her Shoes stories, and they gave us a number of useful um, recommendations. So we found that a very productive way of working because it helps us to have a direct relationship with the organizations that are entrusting us with very important material, and it helps to keep uh, channels of the communication open, and then we also get the expertise from both people who've worked directly with this material and then those who already have expertise in this uh, relatively complex field. Um, the most recent uh, achievement of the project has been the winning of a Digital Preservation Award. So this is, a award, award, this is a prize awarded by the Digital Preservation Coalition, uh, which is based in Glasgow but operates all around Europe. And the uh, category that we won it under was called Safeguarding the Digital Legacy. So obviously the case we made in our application was that what we were preserving was a digital legacy that had been created in digital form and if it was not preserved in some way could actually very easily be lost. And of course, it was quite an important story in Ireland's recent history. So that was one of the kind of bases by which we applied for the prize. So the picture you'll see there as well as the prize is myself and Lorraine Grimes, who is the other archivist on the project. There's also four other team members. And we were in Glasgow at a conference when we won. We weren't expecting to, so we were very pleased, as you can see. <laughs> so that is kind of a broad overview on the top level uh, of the collections and of the project as it's operating so far. It's going to continue operating until the end of next year. Uh, the, we have a number of milestones coming up. So one of the ones that we're especially looking forward to is a public collection day next March. So what this means is we put a call out to the public in general to uh, get in touch if they have um, material in their own possession, such as ephemera or ca canvassing material or anything to do with, or even medical documents, something that is relevant to the theme of the project uh, that they would like to include in it. And then we'll go through a number of criteria depending on you know, um, how relevant or whether we don't, don't have it already, whether it's something we do, we want to add to the collection. And then we make a selection and then uh, the, the selected people are invited to this public day where they can come to a particular location and then the material is digitized um, in-house on the spot. We've already got a digitization company on board for that. So we're hoping to spread that net quite widely um, and get an even wider range of material because um, um, there may have been cases where organizations weren't interested in depositing material with, with our project, but individuals who, in their own personal capacity might be able to bring some material along that hasn't been represented so far. So we're very uh, keen to see what will happen as a, as a result of that uh, particular project or that particular aspect of the project. We're also going to be expanding the collections, as I was saying, so we're going to be adding to what's there already and then adding new types of data. So I'm currently in uh, meetings with, <coughs> excuse me, the producers of a podcast, which was published or was released last year, and they have agreed to deposit their podcast for long-term preservation in DRI, so as audio files. So that would be good because we have had, we do have audio files in DRI, usually um, the recordings of oral history interviews, but this will be the first time that we've uh, archived a podcast, so we're looking forward to what that's going to be like. Uh, we're going to be publishing quite a lot of project documentation. So we've already published our research ethics and our ethics protocol and our research protocol. And we've also published a bibliography. So that, all that stuff is freely available um, up on, our, on the DRI. But we are going to be publishing a technical report that's going through some of the technical challenges and also a project report, just talking about it as a whole. And then we're going to, that public facing document is a guide for archiving, so archiving for activist groups. So this was originally going to be drafted for 
organizations who are engaging with, directly with this project, but we aim for it to be a kind of an easy, uh, simple guide for any small volunteer community organization who has material that's not yet archived or cataloged and would like to get some help with, or to get some guidance on how to go about that, uh, be it digital or physical. So we are working on that and that's going to be one of the outputs of the project to be kind of a publicly available, freely available a uh, downloadable document which will contain lots of helpful and useful practical advice for non-specialist community groups who would like to preserve more of their material in a way that would work for them. So once we have all these various different aspects together, the project will um, be complete and then even after the project has ended, the material stays in the Digital Repository of Ireland for the long term to be preserved and looked after just like all the rest of the DRI's collections. So it is uh, basically we are going to, we could never hope to tell the full story of this uh, period in Irish history, but we hope that with the work that we're doing and the collections that we're ingesting that we will get to tell, archivally tell at least part of that story for future generations. Um, if anybody is interested, this is the URL which brings you directly to all the links that will bring you to all the collections and everything that we have and um, you can get in touch at any time and we'll answer any questions. Uh, I think that's everything about the project, uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>
So good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Thank you for staying with us for the last lecture of the afternoon. Uh, my name is Mary Kelly Quinn. I'm from University College Dublin. And I'm going to speak about a topic that's very different from, I think, a lot of the previous uh, talks. So I'm going to talk about Ireland's rivers and their biodiversity and highlight a few concerns that I have. So I'm going to start off by reminding us of the importance of fresh waters. And I'll say a few words about what the 21st century brings to our fresh waters. Then I'll give you a brief overview of Ireland's wonderful freshwater resources, their amazing freshwater life, and I'm going to focus on rivers and look, about, look at how Ireland's rivers are faring. The information that I'm presenting comes from three publication sources. The first is a book on Ireland's rivers, which I co-edited with Julian Reynolds in 2020, and that is the collective knowledge of 38 contributors, freshwater ecologists across Ireland. And I'm very grateful that the Royal Irish Academy provided some wonderful old historic images which we have incorporated into that book. The second source is a publication that I co-authored with Catherine Bradley and Hugh Feely, and it was on freshwater biodiversity in Ireland's uh, rivers and lakes, and that it is now a time to take stock of what we know, what we don't know, and what we should be concerned about. The third source of information is a series of EPA reports on water quality, and I'll acknowledge those as I move forward. Okay, so fresh water, why is it so important? Well, it has been described as the lifeblood of human civilization. It's carried in the capillaries, which are the streams, and the veins, which are the rivers, of the Earth's circulatory system. And just like our own circulatory system, we have to try and maintain the health of that circulatory system for our own benefit, if nothing else. So in fact, even though fresh waters cover only 1% of the Earth's surface, they provide a disproportionately high level of goods and services, which we call ecosystem services. So that's everything from clean water for drinking purposes, domestic use, industrial use, and so on, right through to cultural services, recreational value. And what's important is all of those goods and benefits are underpinned by the biodiversity of freshwater systems. Sorry, this thing is on a timer. Is it possible to take it off the timer? No? Okay. Um, so globally, freshwater support at least 10% of all known species. And at the same time, freshwater is among the most threatened ecosystems on our planet. They've been heavily polluted, Rivers, for example, have been drained, straightened, placed in straitjackets, and buried. And consequently, freshwaters have experienced a lot of biodiversity loss. In fact, at a higher rate, at least what has been published is that that loss is at a higher rate than on land or at sea. And because it's largely out of sight and therefore out of mind, it has been described as an invisible tragedy hidden beneath the water surfaces. So it's against that background that I move on to have a quick look at Ireland's uh, freshwater resources. So we are wonderful freshwater resources. We have 84,000 kilometers of rivers, but 75% of that river network is what we call small streams or headwaters. So these are streams no more than two meters in width, yet they're extremely important, not only in the capture of water, but as for their biodiversity. And they're also extremely vulnerable to pollution and have an effect on water quality for their downstream. We have 12,200 lakes. They cover about 2% of the land surface of the area, so that's twice the European average. And the majority of those are also small. So about 8,000 of them are less than one hectare in area. 
and the majority of them are actually quite shallow. So an important message I think we have to get out there is that fresh waters and rivers in this case I want to dwell on are living systems with a rich biodiversity above water and underneath the surface. So above water, we have these iconic species. Kingfisher, one of three uh, species which are dependent on rivers. Otters, and then a range of insects, the damselflies and, dam and dragonflies, beautiful insects. Underneath the surface, we're all familiar with fish. Uh, trout and salmon are particularly important as hallmarks of good water quality. But there are smaller creatures known as macroinvertebrates. And in Ireland, we have about 2,500. I say we have about because, in fact, we don't have a complete checklist of all the species, freshwater species that occur in our rivers. And we don't have a complete knowledge of their distribution. So here we're talking about everything from mites to mayflies, from the beautiful to the absolute amazing. These are two special invertebrates, and I don't have time to show you many, but I just want to give you a glimpse into this wonderful diversity of species that we have. And the first is the freshwater crayfish, and it, together with, um, together with the pearl mussel, are threatened species across their distributional range. The pearl mussel is particularly sensitive and will only occur and reproduce in the most pristine of surface waters. And this is a species that can live for 120 years. And in Ireland, many of the pearl mussel populations are dominated by senior citizens. They are no longer producing uh, the juveniles. But there are smaller creatures that are just as fascinating. And I've been studying fresh waters for over 30 years. And I, every time I look at a sample on a river bank from a clean river, I'm absolutely amazed at the variety and the beauty and the abundance of these creatures. And what I've shown you here on the slide are probably the most abundant of those, the mayflies, the stoneflies, and the caddisflies, and these are the juvenile insects. They will emerge from water for a small period of time, but they spend most of their life under water. And these are very important indicators of water quality that I will mention in just a moment. But there are other creatures. The non-debiting midges are the most species rich of all of these invertebrates, 542 species. So nearly 20% of all the invertebrate species that occur in rivers are these midge larvae. And then you have the other creatures that I've just shown you on the slide there. And that's only a small snapshot of the variety that occurs in fresh waters. And these have a functional role in maintaining good water quality. So microinvertebrates, as I just mentioned, can be indicators of water quality. So in effect, they are acting like the canary in the river. And I'll show you two images here. On the left-hand side is a sample taken from a clean river, and you can see a variety of insects there. There's mayflies, particularly the flattened mayfly. There are stoneflies. There are caddisflies. And on the right is a sample taken from a polluted river, and you see the absence of those pollution-sensitive species. And that absence, in effect, represents species loss, biodiversity loss. So the EPA used these indicators to assign ecological water quality. And this is a map taken from one of their recent reports. And the ecological quality is rated from high down to bad. So this is according to the Water Framework Directive. And there's just two striking things that I want to draw your attention to. The first is how little blue lines or how few blue lines are on that map. In other words, how few high status unpolluted river systems we have. And the second then is all the yellows and the brown they represent impacted waters. The green represent just good status, so reasonably good. So when you put all of that information together, in effect, 
43% of the river sites that are monitored by the EPA are in unsatisfactory condition and failing to meet the requirements of the Water Framework Directive and impacting on the goods and the services that we depend on from river systems. A lot of this is due to nutrient pollution and there is evidence of increasing nutrient pollution even today in many of these rivers. Another problem is sediment. And this is coming from erosion of banks or runoff from arable fields. And it's described as a master stressor because it can have immediate and prolonged negative effects on freshwater biodiversity. The good news is that it can be easily mitigated and it definitely represents the low hanging fruit in terms of water quality protection. So the significant pressures on Ireland's rivers and indeed lakes come from a number of sources. The top guns are agriculture, urban wastewater or inadequate wastewater treatment, and then what is called hydromorphology, which represents physical damage to habitats, say from drainage, straightening rivers, etc. Now, I think it is shocking to realize that today, raw sewage is being discharged into, I think, 34, from 34 villages and towns across the country. This is unacceptable in a developed country and generally goes unnoticed. Agriculture is mainly responsible for diffuse pollution and it is much more difficult to tackle. It's easy enough to tackle with political will and a little bit of money to address the wastewater treatment problems. But diffuse pollution from agriculture is having a negative effect. It is eliminating biodiversity in some areas. All of those pollution sensitive invertebrates that I mentioned are not found in areas with intensive agriculture. And the other issue that we're seeing in areas with intensive agriculture is that the variety that you get across the landscape is much reduced in these areas. So the invertebrate communities in these areas are becoming much more similar, despite the region covering a geological diversity of landscapes. And this is one of the graphs that comes from that paper uh, in biology and environment that I mentioned earlier on. But I think what is even more shocking and which a lot of people don't realize is the loss of our best water quality, our best river sites. These are the near pristine sites. And in the 1980s, the EPA monitored over 500 of these sites. And in the period, in their monitoring period, 2016 to 2018, those were reduced to just 22. Over the last two years, the numbers have crept up to something like, I think, about 38. But that's far from what was present in the 1980s. And this represents loss of our natural heritage Equally important, what it is, is loss of natural pools of species or reservoirs of species that could repopulate areas where pollution pressure has been removed. So we may see very slow recovery of river systems when, as I said, pollution pressures have been removed. So there's no doubt that invertebrates, uh, freshwater invertebrates in this country are under pressure. And I have a table here that I'm also taking from that publication, the um, biology and environment publication that I just mentioned a few minutes ago. And what it does here, it summarizes a conservation assess status assessment that has been carried out by various authors on five groups of freshwater invertebrates. And so this is following the IUCN classification from le those of least concern, the LC, but what I want you to look at are the, those figures from the VU, which is the vulnerable, up to the uh, endangered or extinct. 
and across all of these five groups, almost 30% are vulnerable or in worse condition. Furthermore, most of these assessments were carried out over 10 years ago and on data which was much older than that. I have no doubt that the situation is a lot worse today, but we don't have the data at present to make that assessment. So in effect, we are not aware of what we are losing. So to sum up, I think the time is now for action. Water quality is going in the wrong direction, despite considerable effort. We have the science. We know where the problems are. It's just a matter of finding the best solutions to those problems. The Lo Local Authority Waters Program, the Law Pro, are doing a fantastic job working with communities to identify the problems and find locally adapted solutions or relevant local solutions to, to address pollution problems. But it's slow, and I wonder whether it is going to be fast enough to stem the decline in water quality, which will have implications for all of us. So I think the first step is generation of awareness, and awareness is increasing, and this is why I picked this uh, topic today. But the bigger challenge is to bridge the gap between awareness and action. And I think this is where we need to get the message to our policymakers and those in, in practice, so that we can accelerate the efforts to stem the decline in water quality. But in effect, we all have a role, so we all need to do our, our bit. We need to think about how our behaviors and how our daily life can interfere with water. So we need to avoid piping foul water into rivers, minimize the use of pesticides and herbicides, you know, have septic tanks if you're on that sort of system checked uh, regularly, cleaned regularly, protect riverbank vegetation that will minimize diffuse pollution entering rivers. It will also uh, uh, reduce the level of sediment pollution. And finally, join citizen science. Join communities that are beginning to recognize these problems, try and and find out where the problems are coming from and what needs to be, to be done. And there's quite a lot of citizen science activities uh, around the country. So thank you for your attention. I'm just going to leave you with a quotation um, from the uh, Living Planet report. And I think it, it sums up my conclusion here is that Really, the time for action is now, but it does require governments, businesses, and citizens to rethink how we produce, consume, measure success, and value the natural environment, in particular, freshwater environments. Thank you. The, the pleasant task of thanking everybody after what has been a fabulously stimulating day. And um, I'm, I'm not going to keep you very long, but I couldn't uh, just thank everybody without sort of going back over a little bit over the day and saying some of the things, some of the salient things that struck me listening to so many talented and expert researchers. And uh, I, I just I suppose the first thing I wanted to say was I, I thought I knew the research projects pretty well. You know, I've been, been around for a while 
and uh, I've been familiar with some of the work that they've done, but I find uh, far more today than I realised uh, really there were things that I hadn't known and so on. I suppose the first thing, the first thing I'd mention, I'm sure everybody was struck by it, was the simple scale of all of these projects when you, when you put them together, when, when you look at what each of them does and what each of them undertakes. Um, the same applies to the library and to publications. And each of the uh, participants today is, is, is dealing with very large amounts of material and making that uh, available to us in forms that we can understand um, and somehow distilling out of vast uh, quantities of resources and sources, uh, very varied ones, um, and, and putting that out, publishing it, making, making it something that all kinds of readers, uh, all kinds of um, people, audiences um, can, can, can work with. I'm just going to hit a few figures because I, I was struck today. Um, I was struck by um, the, the, the DIBs, the Dictionary of Irish Biographies, 11,000 lives. The uh, sheer volume and variety of sources used by the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, um, documents in Irish foreign policy, John mentioned 10,000 documents perhaps to be winnowed through for each volume. Uh, Fuckler, I, I think Fuckler, uh, Starul Nigel probably wins the prize with 19 million words in the corpus. I think that's extraordinary. And uh, then, of course, there's uh, the library with 8,600 antiquarian uh, prints, illustrations, um, visual elements, and this Grange Gorman histories, multiplicity, again, of histories and of other sources of uh, documenting place, documenting lives, and so on. Uh, and all of this is dealt with in, in depth. Um, as the, there are technical and intellectual challenges, and I was, again, struck by how um, the affordances of new technology have been exploited to the full, not only in the ingesting, if you like, of material and ideas and the development, but also in reaching out to, to make uh, people aware of what's going on and what's being researched. And, um, uh, for example, uh, how lexicography has changed was something that came across uh, very strongly from Anthony and Charlie's presentations. And then how that actually allows uh, different forms of research. And I think that came across very strongly all through the day, in fact, how, how collaborations within the academy, between the different uh, elements within the academy, but also collaborations with other institutions, and also all of the time working with other people, finding ways to um, give people access. And that, that, I think that emphasis on access uh, was something that perhaps the Senator this morning would have been very pleased to hear about because, uh, as you remember, uh, he said one of the challenges was really uh, this one of communicating research. And I think that the uh, presentations today and the demonstrations today have shown how, how very well that can work and the emphasis that has been uh, by, by all of you on um, stimulating research elsewhere um, and, 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 and letting other people in to this privileged circle of research is, is tremendously important, all the spin-off volumes, the spin-off activities. So I'd like to, to say thank you to, to all of the participants today, the researchers, the library publications, the invited speakers. Thank you very much for, for being here, for, for doing this for us. Um, but I'd also, um, and for their time and generosity, which uh, they deploy, in fact, all the time, all year, um, but which has come together today. And I'd also particularly uh, like to thank uh, all of the people behind this as well, because not everybody was on the platform today, not everybody was demonstrating. And so I think it would be very appropriate now for, for all of the people who spoke today to, um, to, to acknowledge the tremendous work done by some people that I'm going to name, uh, Fidel Maslashri in publications for the outstanding design, which helps to bring together, in fact, all of the themes today in this very impactful um, design that is the leitmotif for today's 
um, materials. I'd like to thank Helena King as well uh, for editing the many materials that were available to us today. Um, Karen Muldarney and Ellie Cullen um, for, for spreading the word in communications. Um, David Martin in IT uh, for all of that support and uh, Hugh Shields indeed for making sure that all of the spaces were functional and everything worked very well. And uh, finally, uh, I think everybody here will want to thank Valeria, uh, because without Valeria pulling all of that together, I think it would have been nothing like as successful as it has been. Thank you very much, Valeria, and thanks to everybody.